um, I want to, of course, remind everybody that because of the um, coronavirus, um, we have um, been meeting through remote connectivity um, technology, and really we have been afforded great opportunity to do so through the order that the governor issued at the very beginning of um, our closure so that we could comply fully with the uh, expectations under the open meeting law. Today was just, we've only had a couple of challenges. We've been really fortunate to be able to meet regularly um, and comfortably through um, a remote means. So we appreciate the opportunity and thank everyone for today. Today, just a little bit more patience. Um, and I'm calling to order now public meeting it is public meeting 311, and it is July 2nd. Our start time is now uh, 1040, and we'll go to our first uh, matter, which would be the approval of minutes. Commissioner Stebbins, you've shifted on, the, um, on my screen. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and my colleagues. Uh, in your packet, you have the meeting minutes from the June 11th meeting, which all of us can recall was rather lengthy. It was a good discussion with our licensees about guidelines. Uh, so my compliments to Shar for her great work pulling these together. She shared them with all of you because obviously there were a lot of discussion points we wanted to make sure that we accurately reflected everybody's uh, key points that they wanted to make. So those are in front of you in this packet. I would move their approval subject to any uh, corrections for uh, typographical errors or any other non-material matters. Um, Madam Chair, before we move on to seconding it, I did have a proposed edit. Which which time frame, Commissioner? Uh, it's page eight, the entry at two thirty one p.m. Um, I don't think that's entirely accurate in terms of what the conversation was. The context of the conversation at that time was looking at option A, which was based on the percentage of occupancy, and the discussion whether or not employees would be part of that percentage. And then we hypothetically talked at a 50% capacity, but there was no consensus about 50%. It was a consensus that any percentage under option A would include employees. Um, so my proposed edit would be the commission reached a consensus that a percentage occupancy level requirement would also include employees, that that's what the entry should read at that point. And that was at that the stage of that meeting, and 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 I think that it is verified in our later work where we we indicate we hadn't had a, a consensus on um, overall um, uh, occupancy level. Right. So thank you. I think you. that it reflects that, the consensus in that time frame. At that meeting. Does that make sense to um, you know? And to be fair to Shara, it was a very fluid conversation at the time and probably difficult to follow. Yeah. Um, I think it's- I, I went back twice to have to look at the time period again to sort of figure out how to say it concisely. Right, so thank you. Uh, did we hear that edit okay? Do we want, um, Shara, did you get the edit? Yep. Okay, excellent. Thank I you. think that's helpful. Anything further? Again, yep. it was a very, very uh, dense conversation. Mm -hmm. Want to make sure it's as accurate as you remember it to be? I, I also had an edit. Um, okay. Kathy. I, um, on the entry, I don't know the page number, but it's the entry of uh, 11.22 a.m. Okay. A couple of pages up. That's um, on page five. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, in the second paragraph where it says that I raised uh, a concern regarding the temperature checks um, at the gaming establishments, uh, it is correct that I my preference was for enforcement, to, for, for a focus on, on at the beginning um, to mitigate uh, the requirements later. So I would delete the not at the end, at the beginning of the last sentence, um, because it is actually doing so would yes. mitigate other measures. Um, That's at, right. Uh, later on. I, I also, uh, I, I'm, I'm in, I re re recall, and I am currently still, um, uh, in agreement that uh, of the requirement of face masks, 
uh, I think it was really just about other measures once uh, I was making the point that um, uh, being stricter at the beginning would, would alleviate the, the, the necessary for being strict later on, but, um, but I wasn't necessarily singling out uh, the requirement of face masks. So, um, Would you like to state it and, um, without the face mask being referenced precisely? Yes, so my proposed edit is that the last sentence in that second paragraph read, doing so would mitigate the need for other measures. I, I feel that that reflects what I believe Commissioner Zuniga did communicate to us at the time. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. Thank you. Again, um, fluid discussion. Any other edits? Commissioner Kimmerer, okay, all yes. set. All right, do I have a motion? Oh, I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? Again, thank you to Shara. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, I just seconded, uh, I'm I'm okay, I, I'm sorry, you're polling, no, now I. Okay, there's a lot going on, yes. <laughs> Now the vote, um, an aye from Commissioner Cameron, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. Our votes, yes, 5-0. Thank you with those edits. Moving on now then to our, our agenda. Item number three, our administrative update from um, Interim Executive Director Wells. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. As I expect everyone is aware, the uh, earliest opening date for the Phase uh, 3 opening of Massachusetts has been deemed by the Governor to be Monday, July 6th. We are still awaiting a, a public and final determination on that. As the Governor has stated previously on many occasions, that determination is going to be data-driven based on health metrics. So we at the commission are uh, ready to go to take on our regulatory responsibilities once the governor uh, and then the licensees deemed it's appropriate to reopen. So we are ready to go, we stand by. Um, uh, I am gonna turn it over for item 3A uh, to Dr. Lightbound, to just to give you a little bit of a, a briefing and some information on simulcasting uh, and ADW for your information just for uh, interest as far as the uh, racing side of the house goes because we have a lot of interesting things going on with racing right now. Before we move on to 3A, uh, in terms of being ready to go, uh, there may be some questions from my fellow oh, good, good commissioners yes. on that. When yes. you say ready to go, were there any formal actions or sign-offs that, that are still that you need to take um, Interim Executive Director Wells? We, well, the, the fact that the commission passed the, uh, or uh, voted on the guidelines uh, last week, tremendously helpful. So we uh, now have a framework for the licensees and for the commission. And if we, as we've talked about uh, in public meetings as well, we also have our own internal guidelines for the safety of our own employees. So actually we're finalizing a document for employees so they can look through it all themselves uh, and we'll hopefully be getting that out today to our employees, just so people understand what the protocols are, the procedures are, so people understand what's gonna be happening once uh, there is a limited amount of our staff that will be on site at the casinos. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions. I, I'm gonna yeah. just jump in because I, I do wanna take the time, Karen. You know, yep. if in fact July 6th allows for an opening um, and, and, and our licensees decide to proceed, one of the items that I've mentioned in the past, and I think it's even noted in today's minutes, is to make sure that our, our employees who will be at the property are, are really trained, you know, in terms of how to wear their masks, how to, and for Colin, I just want to be assured that if, if Monday is a, a go for our employees that they're all set. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm hearing you say, it's, we're a little bit in limbo, let's be right. clear. So, right. And I know that tomorrow is a holiday, so I just, um, I am um, reinforcing a, really a comment I made in the past is that it's really important to have that cross-training. Right. 
At another point that um, we should be aware of is that we have also been notified the licensees uh, training that they are giving their employees to, uh, for their safety protocols. Our employees have been taking that as well. Oh, so that's, that's been exactly an ongoing thing here. Okay, yes, thank you exactly. And this, this applies to both our gaming agents and our, um, our racing employees that they're all ready to go on the six. And I, uh, we also have our, uh, the state police, the gaming enforcement unit, and the local police that are part of that unit. They have been working all along, but they're obviously with an opening, there will be more activity. So everybody is, is in the loop as far as what these protocols are. Thank you for verifying that. Any yeah. other questions? Commissioner Zunica? Yeah, Karen, I, uh, I just remember, um, you know, on, uh, a couple of conversations from the prior meetings that the licensees themselves would, would need uh, uh, you know, a couple of weeks in some cases to um, to open based on a number of things, um, you know, including in the included in the guidelines. Um, so, assuming that the governor were to um, to give a go ahead on the phase three, uh, do we know that um, all or any of the licensees would be in a position to then uh, open up, or they still need? There, some there may be some space? time that there may be some time that they need and that's why there's sort of the governor's piece and then the, the licensees have to make their own decisions about opening safely with the protocols in place so that uh, it's not rushed and there aren't mistakes made. So the licensees will also be making their own determination. So it may not be everything opens up that first day. They will be making their own determinations. We've had some preliminary discussions where those dates are. I don't really want uh, to speak for them in case they, they make some changes. I don't want to make an announcement on their behalf, uh, but that may it may be somewhat of a, a staggered approach uh, as far as opening the casinos. The licensees have to make some business decisions and also safety for their own employees and what makes sense and onboarding uh, because I think we've all been through a lot. You know, we've been in a lockdown since middle of March and reopening these is a big deal. Uh, and it's what we've done in Massachusetts has been amazing. And you look at what's going on in the other parts of the country, and we've done a good job as far as reducing the numbers. And I think everyone uh, is thinking about that, that we want to do this the right way, and the licensees are also thinking that way as well. Further questions for Karen on this point? I know we can circle back to this important discussion too, if you think of something as we go through today's agenda. Absolutely. Any any further questions for Karen just on that right now? And all right, then what? Then we'll go ahead with the, okay. the next item. But again, we may think of something as the meeting proceeds. Okay, thank you. So you uh, well, so turn over to, to Dr. Lightbaum. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, everybody. So um, the um, I'll give you a little bit of background on um, the account wager and a little bit of the history. Um, in 1978, um, Interstate Horse Racing Act um, authorized interstate simulcasting, which meant that you could be at a racetrack um, in Massachusetts and bet on races in New York. Um, in 2000, it was amended um, to include um, a, a advanced uh, deposit wagering, basically uh, telephone and other electronic forms of wagering um, in states where that type of betting would be legal. So that was in 2000, and in uh, 2001, Massachusetts actually passed the laws and regulations so that it was uh, legal in Massachusetts then. Um, <clears throat> Suffolk um, partnered with uh, TVG to offer it, and um, that was online. And then the other licensees at the time, um, Raynham, Foxborough, and Wonderland, um, introduced uh, telephone betting. So um, they all had... Uh, different versions of account wagering, um, advanced deposit wagering. Um, now, um, Raynham still has the um, phone betting. Uh, it's called Dial to Bet. Um, obviously, we've moved on from uh, Foxborough to Plain Ridge, and Plain Ridge had their own um, in-house uh, account wagering. And then when um, Penn came in, um, now they uh, use um, the Hollywood Races um, platform for their account wagering. And that's um, online. Um, Suffolk has partnered with um, several different groups, um, TVG, which now includes um, FanDuel to give them a wider um, audience base. Um, they also uh, contract with Twin Spires, Naira Bets, um, and Express Bet. 
Um, so, you know, we've had um, online wagering in Massachusetts for uh, quite a while, since 2001. And um, it's been, you know, regulated really without any um, hitches um, since then. Um, the things like geofencing, defining the boundaries um, or geolocation where you can actually determine where a better is placing their bets um, allows for um, different takeouts um, depending on where the person is so that it may be uh, more advantageous um, to uh, somebody um, who's actually betting in the um, building, so to say, at one of our tracks versus um, maybe in their house. So it's very, um, it can be very specific as to that sort of thing. Um, we do have obviously um, regulations that cover that. Um, it comes under 205 CMR um, 6, starting with 620 general account wagering. Um, that's under our paramutual rules, um, and it specifies um, how how the money can be deposited and goes through a number of different um, steps that regulate it. Um, I'll turn it over to um, Chad now, and our financial analyst, and he can describe a little bit about um, the reconciling that he does to um, regulate the uh, money that comes in. And uh, before I do that, um, just to step back a minute, um, with the shutdown due to the COVID, uh, we were fortunate with this account wagering um, that this was able to um, continue. Um, we had to stop simulcasting because that involved people actually going into our buildings in Massachusetts. And, um, you know, so we couldn't do that. And also we had to delay um, our live racing. But with the um, online um, wagering, we were fortunate enough that that could continue to um, proceed. So we have had some revenue coming in from that. And uh, now I'll turn it over to Chad. Thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, Madam morning. Chair and Commission and everyone on the call. Um, so as Alex mentioned, although the racetracks and simulcasting sites have been closed uh, to the patrons, wagering on racing has continued uh, through our ABW providers. Um, I am still working with the licensees and our internal colleagues um, to provide reconciliation and, and billing. So I am happy to report that the, the process has been very smooth. So thank you very much to our licensees and the colleagues that I, I work with. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go into some of the numbers here to date. And um, so when we do look at them, um, starting pre-pandemic, I guess would be the word. Um, January and February, uh, we did a combined handle of 32 million, and that was versus 30 million um, last year. So there was actually an increase in the first two months. And then, um, so basically uh, March was uh, where we did see um, a small downtick in the handle. Uh, that was down 2 million, and so that was 16. So all in all, uh, for the first quarter, um, it was basically flat. Um, uh, we did 25, um, and then when we look at May, um, that's where we saw an increase, and we went from 25 million, um, which was about 10 million more than what we did in 2019. Um, and then in terms of the actual commission that we received from that, um, so, so far year to date, we um, have uh, billed out uh, for commissions on the wagers, 343000 and that is versus um, 341000 um, over the same period last year. So um, really only only $2,000 less than where we were on track from last year. Um, so <clears throat> the attribution for that is basically, um, even though live racing and simulcasting at the tracks um, were halted in the middle of March, um, we saw um, the ADW wagering increase by over 50%. Um, and so in total, uh, so far year to date, the handle is at 91 million um, versus last year, 
um, where it was um, at right around 90, 90 million. So um, I think where we saw the big difference again is, is with the ADW wagering. And so the six providers actually provided 75 million or about 80% um, of, of the total handle so far a year, uh, this year, whereas last year it was split 50-50 between live racing, simulcast, and the ADW providers. Um, and then in terms of uh, the uh, cap and promo funds right now, the, uh, the Plain Ridge Cap Fund is at 550,000. Uh, the Suffolk Capital Improvement Fund is at 3 million. The Plain Ridge Promotional Fund is at 140,000. And the Suffolk Promotional Fund is at 150,000. Um, and then just kind of a quick note also on, on sports betting. Um, so the same trend is actually happening um, there also. Um, it's about 20% um, of the wagers that are coming from the brick and mortar sports book uh, versus online and mobile ADW providers similar to racing that provide 80% of um, the sporting events. And as Alex mentioned, FanDuel did team up with uh, TBG. So we, we have started to see a little um, uptick in TBG's numbers because of um, the FanDuel. Um, and uh, that's that's all I have. Thank you. That's really um, helpful, and I like that you made the uh, connection to the sports betting world. Of course, in Massachusetts, we don't have legalized sports betting, but the trend is showing that where there are options to be online during this pandemic, they um, even with reduced sports opportunities, the online um, is active. Um, and of course some of the sports books have now returned in the last uh, month or so at other jurisdictions, but the mobile, the mobile option is active. I, I have a question um, for, uh, for uh, Alex or Chad. Uh, th thank you for that update. Uh, a question and perhaps a comment after that. Um, so, um, is there a way to know, and um, just in general, not, not, not anywhere precisely, whether some of this activity um, of ADW is from new accounts, people who decided, who were usually going to the track, and then decided to get an account, a new account, an ADW account, in order to replace their activity at the track and now from home? Or is it existing accounts that, um, that now have a higher level of activity because people are uh, at home. Yeah, so um, I think um, to, for the most part, I, I, I do think that it's um, increased accounts uh, that were set up. Um, one of them uh, coming over from uh, some of the, the, the um, people that were signed into FanDuel are now able to race through TVGs. Um, portal. So I, I think that's part of it. Um, and I would also assume that, um, uh, you know, those, those folks that do like to, to wager, um, and they did some of it on the track, although they still may have had an account. Um, there was only one way to do that, and that's uh, through the account. Mr. Tuttle, I see that you came on board. Was that purposeful to, um, to make a comment? I just wanted to make sure you didn't want to add in or... Uh, no, it was uh, only um, in, in uh, potential of being called upon, uh, Madam okay, Chair. Okay, thank so. you. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah, thank you. I, you know, I, let me follow up on that because um, uh, I, I think what's, what's, what's really alluded to here is um, the notion that we effectively had, when it came only to horse racing, an online, um, you know, since, you know, uh, option really uh, for a few years now. Um, I also would like to point out that it's a cashless wagering, effectively, something that is now being or should be considered in light of all of this current context as maybe being uh, necessary to consider for, for casinos and other forms of gaming. 
Um, it can be done in the same, in a very similar way in which the account is pre-funded. Nobody uses credit. Um, and uh, just like the ADWs. And, uh, and it minimizes for the high touch nature that now becomes a concern, ironically, uh, in, this, in this pandemic. So um, I know it's not something that uh, casinos are currently allowed to do, um, you know, um, in, in certainly in Massachusetts and in, very, in, in the majority of other states. But I wonder if this would be um, a trend that, that, uh, or a model that could be replicated for other forms of gaming. Thank you, Commissioner. That's a really important observation. One of the reasons why I had asked uh, Alex for this update is I don't believe that uh, um, it's widely known that there's mobile betting going on in Massachusetts from our, the comfort of our couch on our cell phones. And I like that, Alex, you pointed out that there's phone betting, but mobile online betting is occurring and has been occurring since 2001 for horse racing. And horse racing was uniquely situated under the law. So, uh, it's, and, and, it's, and it's been able to be done in, the, in a careful way with respect to geofencing and knowing your client. And then of course, um, uh, Chad is pointing out just during this snapshot, uh, um, during the pandemic, helpful statistics in terms of where, uh, whether the play was impacted, uh, where there, was, there weren't brick and mortar opportunities. So I right. really, I, I truly appreciate that update and look forward to hearing more details. Commissioners, any other comments for Alex and Chad on this update? Just a high level update, but one that we really needed to be informed and, and to keep uh, track of at this time. All right, thanks. Moving ahead. Uh, as for uh, item 3B, Madam Chair, uh, I wanted to give the commissioners just an update on uh, some regulatory action with respect to the casinos. The commission has carved out uh, special authority for the executive director uh, to be able to grant instances of uh, variations on the internal controls at the request of the licensees if uh, deemed appropriate. That authority is uh, at 205 CMR 138. So we did receive some requests uh, and I wanted to update you on determinations uh, by uh, the team and approved by me. The, um, if there's a denial of any request, the licensee does have the ability to appeal that denial to the commission should the licensee wish to do so. And I'm gonna have, uh, <coughs> Assistant Director Van chime in on, on a few of these just because he has the gaming expertise. And there is some interest in some of this, how the, you know, how the casinos work. Uh, the first one has to do with pit bosses. Um, and I'll let uh, Assistant Director Van in a minute just give you an explanation what the pit boss role is. But bottom line is that there was a request that instead of uh, having a maximum supervision load of 24 tables, that that be increased to 30 tables so that a pit boss uh, can in fact, during this time period, supervise 30 tables. Uh, given that um, the present facts and circumstances and what's going on, particularly where the tables now are going to have fewer people at the tables and that there is uh, supervisor responsibility uh, by the floor person as well uh, as the dealer, uh, that, uh, pro that uh, request is deemed appropriate and did not impact the uh, controls over the casino. So I'll just turn it over to Mr. Ban to just give you a little bit of uh, flavor of what the pit boss does and how that uh, works at the casino. There, Bruce, Bruce, you need to just, um, Bruce, you just need to unmute. Um, Can you? I forgot I had to unmute myself. Uh, okay. The pit boss is the uh, uh, head supervisor in the pit in charge of all the four people. Uh, we felt that uh, uh, by letting him supervise more tables. It didn't lessen the supervision over the table games as the four people are the direct supervisors over the tables. And uh, uh, the pit boss itself makes the decisions that uh, uh, the four people themselves uh, couldn't make. And that uh, by doing this, we, we didn't lessen that, that supervisory role at all. Do you want to take questions in between, Karen? How yes, would you I like think that? I think that makes sense. Yeah. Any questions on that? 
Okay, hearing none. Uh, the next issue with, with respect to surveillance and security staffing, uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino had requested a variance uh, with respect to minimum staffing numbers. Uh, that was uh, it's, uh, approved in part and denied in part. I won't go into too much detail on that for obvious reasons. But the, um, the bottom line is that we can only uh, approve a change if it doesn't lessen the applicable administrative or physical control of the property. So there are administrative uh, rules with respect to that, and we made a determination on that. So um, I don't know if there's any questions on that uh, with respect to the staffing, but in casinos, there are minimum requirements for security and surveillance uh, personnel to make sure that everything is handled properly at the casinos and the casinos submit internal controls as to their minimum staffing. Is there any, uh, are there any questions from the commissioners on that? And I would just add that we had the benefit of um, a, a, some briefing from you on that. So exactly. Um, <clears throat> Exactly. Uh, the third issue uh, may be of interest uh, to the public is respect to progressive jackpots and some variances they uh, have requested based on the pandemic conditions and the closing and then reopening of the casino. So I'm going to have uh, Mr. Ban just start out with just a, an explanation of a progressive jackpot and what it means and, and, how, it's, uh, and how it's funded and the special rules and the, yeah. um, the variances that were requested. Yeah. Progressive jackpots are, are slot machines that the uh, jackpot on the slot machine grows uh, higher and higher as play accumulates. Uh, it's funded initially by putting uh, the casino puts what's called a seed amount on there, and that's usually to make the jackpot a little more enticing for the patron. They'll put like $2,000 to start, uh, and then uh, the jackpot will grow by whatever percentage that machine is set at, 3 to 5% as it goes. Uh, we don't allow that, that machine to leave the floor for more than 10 days if they're redesigning a, 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 a slot zone or uh, you know, for some reason they have to take it off the floor for, for work. Uh, we had two requests in, in here. The uh, uh, seat amount money is actually the casino's money and the percentage is the patron's money essentially. That's why we don't allow the machine to leave for a, a length of time. We got two requests. The uh, uh, one of the casinos asked uh, because if you're you're going to remove the the jackpot, you have to post that for for uh, ten days, saying we're going to remove the jackpot to a machine that's similar and uh, has similar characteristics to the machine that it was on to let the patrons and public know that that's going to be transferred. Uh, one of the casinos asked to forego that 10 day posting and to transfer those jackpots to similar uh, uh, machines. The other two asked to forego the uh, uh, removal for 10 days thing and be able to remove those jackpots for up to 60 days before they transfer those jackpots. And that's essentially what they're doing. Any questions? <laughs> Commissioner Zuniga? Yes, thank you. I was just unmuting. So um, how is the notice under normal circumstances when, when they're operating 24-7? How is that notice of the move given for the public to know that, you know, the game, they, let's say that they, the progressive they like to play might not be there when they come back? It's a signage on the machine itself. There's a sign posted saying that this jackpot's going to be transferred uh, to another machine, and it will give a date usually. And is there is there a way to now, or what what do they propose to do in terms of signage? And I understand that there's been a long period, of course, of inactivity. Yes. The, play, the player who's looking for the jackpot, perhaps uh, the, the the progressive, um, that might not be there. How will that be now communicated? Uh, I, I believe there's going to be some signage in the casino. Uh, there are, are numerous uh, progressives in each casino that it would almost be impossible to post it on all, all the machines in there. Uh, that would be a lot of machines to, to post it on. So I, I assume they would put some signage around the casino saying those machines that aren't currently active on the floor will be uh, you know, activated at a later date. 
Okay. Bruce, um, can you just remind me the, the reasons that a licensee might uh, pull a machine out of service that is offering a progressive slot? Uh, you sometimes for uh, uh, some software update or uh, work on the machine itself or the slot zone itself is uh, being reconfigured. Uh, you know, that whole slot zone, carpet re replacement. Uh, it could be numerous uh, things like that. Okay. Thank you. So that those uh, those were the requests that uh, were granted, and uh, with the exception of uh, the uh, denied in part on the security and surveillance piece. So as more of these may or may not come in, I will keep the commission updated on what's going on, just so you have a sense of uh, what's going on in the casinos, and, and also so the public knows that if there's any any significant issues going on at the casinos, that they can um, they can be made aware of that through this venue. So, uh, any any other questions on that? No, I just wanted to confirm um, that Encore um, just didn't happen to ask for that further relief. If correct. they had wanted it, it would have been extended to them. Correct. Please. That is correct. Um, just just a comment that I think uh, you know the regulations as envisioned are working well. Um, you know if the you know, they need to include variances for unforeseen events, and clearly we have one of us, one of these uh, events um, before us, and that the licensees, if they um, are not satisfied with uh, with your initial determination, can always come back and, and make their case in front of the five of us, and we can have a, a discussion about that. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that it's, that it's working and that you're also applying uh, what, it, what, what looks to me as very reasonable um, you know, uh, waiver uh, extensions as, um, um, as, as you see necessary. Right, it was not essential that they report this to us because of the fact that it can be appealed, but given um, that where we are and given the public interest, we thought it was, was helpful for everyone to understand fully the process and, and the substance. So thank you uh, to everyone. And I know that Todd was really instrumental in comprising the uh, thorough report. So thank you, Todd. Yes, he absolutely was. Thank you. Okay, so that's it for item 3B, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, so is that the end of the meeting, Karen? I, I thought so. <laughs> 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 I put aside my agenda. Here we are. Um, moving on then to item number four. Now we're going to be looking at the racing division and um, the uh, review of the, the standards. Thank you very much, Alex. Oh, thank you. I, first of all, I wanted to thank um, Steve O'Toole and Chris uh, McElwain from um, Plain Ridge and Penn, Chip Tuttle from Suffolk, uh, Sue Rodriguez and uh, George Carney for Raynham, and then Bob McHugh, Alice Tisbert, and Frank Antonacci from um, the Harness Horsemen's Association for um, working on these um, plans um, so that we can um, plan on having a safe and sustainable um, reopening and opening of um, our um, facilities. Um, it was a, uh, a big project and um, there were multiple changes. Um, I think we have um, pretty good plans in place right now. Um, Starting with the Plain Ridge one, I did get a request this morning um, to add one change, and um, we all agree, um, Plain Ridge, myself, and the Harness Horsemen, that it does make sense. So um, if I can read it to the um, commissioners, and <clears throat> um, perhaps we can um, add that to the document if the commissioners agree to it. Um, it's on page four of the Plain Ridge plan um, near uh, near the bottom, and um, it talks about no winter circle ceremony shall take place. Um, and then it talks about horses would go right back to the um, paddock. Uh, we'd like to add in that um, we can, the photographer can take a wind picture. The, um, that procedure would be able to be done with physical distancing. We would only allow the um, driver who is driving the horse um, to be in the picture. Uh, the initial concerns when tracks were um, reopening was that uh, you didn't want a, a big group of owners and grooms and trainers in the winter circle picture together and also they usually travel from the um, barn area up to the winter circle on a golf cart and you didn't want a bunch of people um, climbing on a golf cart together um, 
with the way we're figuring on doing it, we can um, give the photographer, he can get back to work and the um, horseman can get, still get a wind picture with their horses. And we think we can do it in a safe way. So um, the wording I'd like to add is that um, the photographer will attempt to take a wind picture without the driver getting off the sulky <clears throat> there. And I think that would um, be in, in, in accordance with the uh, COVID protocols. Are there any questions on that issue? Alex, you, um, it's obviously not being taken in the, in the winter circle. Can you just help give me a better idea as to where the picture gets taken? They, they still probably will swing by the winter circle. They have to come by there anyway, and that may be um, the best place for them to stop and, and do it. Um, so, you know, we'll let them figure that out, but I, I probably will be done right there anyway. Okay, thank you. I, I see this is, uh, this is a reasonable request to add. I see no issue with this at all. The way um, the agreement was put together with uh, following the, uh, the protocols as just outlined. So just to clarify, um, I want to make sure that we're speaking about the same thing. Are we all, uh, Commissioner Cameron, were you just commenting on the that change particularly? Yes, that one change that Alex outlined, it would like our... Um, Thank you. Uh, With respect to the winning circle, yes. Yes, yeah, correct. Okay, excellent. Uh, Can I just add one thing, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, so this came up uh, early, just early this morning, just before the meeting. Um, I really don't have a problem with the driver uh, coming off the seat of the bike. There still be plenty of social distancing and sometimes of course is get a little rambunctious and you know walk backwards or sideways or I think when you were in the winter circle one time it came pretty close to you at that point in time but um, mm -hmm. it would be helpful if the driver could get off at different times so I uh, they can stay on but I wouldn't I, well, this came up so late this morning as I was thinking about it after I spoke to Alex I don't have a problem with the drivers getting off if she doesn't Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't think it's the, um, you know, where, where they, whether they remain in the, in, the, in the cart or not. It's about congregation of many people that, that is at, at issue here. And, um, you know, just, just writing, writing it to that effect um, would be just fine by me. Um, yeah, the intent is to not have any right. owners or trainers or anybody come down and, and join yes. us. Yes. <laughs> We can um, amend that then to um, have it say the photographer will attempt to take a wind picture with the driver only. Does that seem uh, um, reasonable or does that give an adequate flexibility, Steve? Uh, or should, is it too precise? I just want to make sure. No, that's, ex that's exactly right. And, uh, okay. not, not to restrict the driver to the seat is, is fine. And, okay. and with the driver only, that means no one else uh, and, goes and in. Everyone's comfortable. Just yes. Commissioner Zuniga said, you know, yeah. people are going out there and congratulating each other and shaking hands because they want to race, right? There will be another, another time in the future where that can resume. So everybody can hold in all that celebration. No, but I, but I think also it's it's good to acknowledge uh, the moment uh, for for the driver oh, and the and the owners. So the original right. restriction of simply no um, none of that acknowledgement was also perhaps a no exactly. This strikes the right balance, and I understand other people would want to typically go in and celebrate, but there'll be time for that in the future. I like the idea of having the photographer be there too. To uh, and just wanted to make sure there wasn't anyone else that we would want to provide for to be in the winning circle. We're, we're all comfortable with it strictly. Okay. Um, Alex, uh -huh. how would you like to proceed in terms of, or Karen, uh, how would you like to proceed in terms of going through the, the changes of the document? Um, so the, um, as far as the app approval process, I mean, I think that maybe uh, just pulling up the, sc the correct so screen. Right the now. document has, as um, as uh, Alex pointed out, it's yes. been revised since the last time we saw it to reflect input from many, um, and we received redline version. So we've had the benefit of seeing the changes. 
right. I just want to, before we proceed with uh, just, you know, uh, any kind of a vote, I oh, want to make sure that if there are any changes that the commissioners saw in the red lines that they wish to discuss, anything that caught their attention, today we've had an additional change. Okay, what I'm suggest, what I would suggest, maybe I'll go through uh, just by heading, and and we go through heading, and just just to make it a little easier for uh, the commissioners to see if they have any notes on that that they would like to address before voting on the the document in the entirety. Uh, the first uh, subject is general guidelines, so that starts on page one and goes into page two. Are there any questions or concerns uh, for Director Lightbaum on those areas? or any, any issues. Okay, uh, the next issue is, uh, the next subheading is the access to racing areas. Uh, so that has started on page two and goes into page three. Are there any questions about that or any areas where we could clarify for the commissioners so they're comfortable? Okay, uh, the next area is the ship-ins and the barn area. Uh, that starts on page three and goes on to page four. There's a number of issues, there's a number of uh, requirements there. I'll just give the commissioners a minute to just check that to make sure that they don't have any concerns. Um, Karen, this is Eileen. I didn't have any concerns, but I did communicate with Alex. I had a question about um, how some other jurisdictions might have been controlling or making um, recommendations about horses coming in or people coming in across state lines. And she clarified something for me that. I know, Alex, that this is a good time to um, just summarize what you explained to me. Sure. Um, some tracks are um, restricting horses to horses that are actually stabled on their own grounds. They had a date by which those horses needed to be in, and um, they may have extended it to some of the training facilities that were nearby them. Um, some of them restricted it to just horses that were in their state. Um, so there's different, um, you know, controls that way on it. Um, for Plain Ridge, it is, um, this year especially with the COVID, it will be a totally ship-in facility. So um, we will be getting um, horses from, you know, the New England states and um, also New York and New Jersey. Those are um, frequent ones. We may get some eventually from a little further away. Um, with the um, governor's um, uh, I'm not sure how to describe it, whether it was a recommendation on um, having people who came from other states quarantined for 14 days. With um, that being lifted, um, that um, clears up some of the questions that we had, um, knowing that um, a lot of our participants would be coming from out of state. So that was um, nice that that coincided with um, this plan. Okay. And um, Plain Ridge may, um, and, and Steve O'Toole may um, expand on this if he wants, but um, they may um, write races um, and put um, like a preference for Massachusetts uh, horses in, in some of the races um, to um, encourage and to allow space for those horses um, at Plain Ridge. So that's a, another way they can um, kind of have some uh, restrictions on uh, who's coming in. But again, um, we welcome the people that are coming in from the other states because we definitely need it for our horse population. Excellent. Do any commissioners have any questions or comments on that? Uh, I do. Uh, Dr. Lightbaum, you just mentioned, um, you know, you were talking about horses coming in from other states. Um, and I, I did hear you say we welcome them, but I, I didn't quite understand the, the restricted uh, racing meaning. So they'll try to have um, Massachusetts horses so that there's, you're ensuring enough distancing. Is that what we're hearing? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Well, we're, um, we will, part of the um, uh, policy is that we're going to expand from just having horses in that paddock barn. Yes. Um, they'll be stabled out in the general um, stable area as well to um, promote distancing. And so that, and that'll be, you know, key with people coming from different states and everything. Okay. Thank you. Just to follow up on, on that, on that question, but the, the, the notion of uh, writing the races, the cards uh, in a way that, uh, that benefit um, Massachusetts um, um, uh, horses, is not necessarily uh, 
to mitigate the notion of a lot of travel, but really to get some of the benefits to go to Massachusetts uh, people, right? Right, correct. Because they may not have um, had the opportunity um, due to the COVID to go to these other states, which they might have done in the past. Right. Now, just, just out of curiosity, um, what is the typical, um, I don't know, Ration. Uh, back and forth or uh, the, of, of, of people coming from out of state, um, you know, on a regular season, and what do we now expect maybe to to happen with with the with the the reality of less travel all around? Uh, maybe this is a question for Steve, and I, I don't, um, uh, you know, I, I know there's a there's a prediction of the future element to my question, but maybe hard to to, to answer, but. Um, what 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 do we see in terms of um, degree of travel um, that may be different this year, Steve? <clears throat> well, I'd like to comment on two issues that came up. First, um, you know, riding races for Massachusetts trained or owned horses. Um, specifically, uh, uh, we're giving Massachusetts owned horses and trained horses preference, not so much riding the races exclusively for them, but just give them preference. Um, and we've done this a lot in the past, to your point, to, to keep, uh, to generate uh, revenue from Massachusetts people. Um, one thing that we see here is that uh, as we fell behind in the pandemic and uh, New York and New Jersey were ahead of us at their spikes and then we followed them and we're behind, um, those states reopened and those horses are now out there uh, racing and in very top condition, whereas the local horses and the Massachusetts horses, as Alex pointed out, have not been able to travel to the other states um, because of the quarantine issues that are now being lifted. And so they're behind a little bit. So these horses that are gonna be qualifying next week are really just having their first, uh, you know, real test in seven months. And a lot of the races that are uh, written are for, are, have, reflect on past earnings. So these horses that ended up in November on their past earnings are still showing those past earnings. And now we have diminished purses in the states that have reopened. And these horses have many starts under their belt. So they've earned less money. So the conditioning, so the condition system would be offset to a, a high disadvantage to the horses that have been sitting idle here. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, so we're very aware of that, and we're and you know we will uh, take care of that, you know, kind of in our own way, the way that we have in the past. But um, one thing that my race secretary and I have discussed at length is maybe a step one or phase one of the opening where we don't take any horses from those jurisdictions where they have two or three or four or five starts, and they've been they're now in a lower category because the purses are not the same that they that they were before the pandemic all across the country. So we're very aware of that fact. Um, that's number one. On the travel issue, we have always been a high capacity uh, ship-in facility where um, 60 to 70% of the horses ship into the facility to race. Now that doesn't mean that they all come from out of state, but they do come from uh, farms across Massachusetts. And we have a high uh, volume of uh, main uh, people that come down because that's where the other racetracks are in New England. Um, I think we will see a little bit more travel, to be perfectly honest, I think we will see a little bit more travel as the season progresses from Maine because uh, there will after July 10th, there will be no racing uh, in the near future in Maine. Um, uh, Scarborough Downs will be closing on the 10th. And so uh, Bangor probably won't open uh, for quite some time after that. And so we will have people that kind of stayed or stayed in Maine to race at, at, at Scarborough and Bangor. And also a number of the fairs have also canceled out uh, their racing dates. So we will see an influx, a little bit more travel from the state of Maine, but not sure how much we'll see from New York or New Jersey. So sorry for the lengthy, lengthy answer, but- um, that's, that, that's kind of no, that's that's very uh, insightful, and I think um, you made me think of another um, another element of these. Uh, what, what, in general, are we going to see in terms of average purses? There's a decrease now in terms of racing days for obvious reasons. Um, 
uh, and you know, in the first agreement of the past, how, how, um, what are we um, likely to see that might actually contribute or, or, or diminish the possibility of attracting um, horses from other states? So our, our purse count is not in bad shape. We, we ended last year with almost a million dollars uh, to carry over for a number of reasons. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons was the, uh, the diminished uh, uh, handle, if you will, slot handle here at Plain Ridge, which affects a higher degree of the Racehorse Development Fund uh, at the 9% takeout. And, um, and also, um, we were gonna be doing a few more days this year. So we carried over uh, 800 and some odd thousand dollars. So we had a nice jump start. Uh, and then January and February were very good months. So, um, uh, and the lag in, in, in the payments coming back from the Racehorse Development Fund, uh, which I think are now uh, exhausted. So we probably won't see anything coming in until like August or so. Uh, so that will, you know, there'll be, a, there'll be a couple months spread there. But I, we're, in a, we're in a place where we can offer the same purses, which is, is different than other states, uh, to, at least to start. And then we see, you know, what the capacity issues are with slot revenues and things like that. Um, but we're hoping to keep, we'd like to keep it the same. Um, that's being an optimistic. I think, I think throughout the course of the season, we might have to adjust. But as I'm looking at it right now, if the numbers come in from uh, the, 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 the other gaming and all, the, uh, and all the avenues where the purse account gains its revenues, uh, I think we might be able to sustain a nice purse account here for the people that have been racing here right along and limit the interaction from you know, other trainers that want to take advantage. We don't, not, we're not saying we don't want them here, but we don't want them here at the expense of our regular uh, trainers, drivers, and owners. Yeah, and I think you articulated the reason very well. Um, I can relate, I haven't been into the gym in, since, since, since before March, but that's a separate story. Uh, being, <laughs> being, in, uh, being in shape is, is important for all of these outcomes, of course. Question for Mr. O'Toole. Um, Follow-up question. Um, you mentioned, uh, or Commissioner Zuniga mentioned, race days. Do you have a plan moving forward for race days? And um, uh, my second question was, you talked about um, ship-ins. So for example, our uh, horses are not able to go to Maine to participate, but eventually the Maine um, uh, horses and their staff will be available to come down when you think it's appropriate. Is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, just to follow up on the race days, though, what what is the plan moving forward? So we'll, we we plan on picking up our uh, our schedule exactly where it is. Uh, okay. For the for the days going forward. Okay. And see see where we at. See where we're at. See where our purse count is at. And you know, I know that I know the horsemen have asked to for us to make up some of the days that were lost. Um, our schedule is pretty tight uh, as far as that is as far as that goes. But you know, we don't want to add days and and then uh, have our purses go down because we're adding days and races. So you know, it looks like there's going to be a healthy supply of horses, which I, I a month ago I didn't think so, but it looks like there's going to be a healthy supply of horses that want to race here with us. So we'll 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 work with the horsemen and find out you know, what, what the proper um, balance is for race days going forward. But right now, the race days that we're scheduled to race, those are the days that, uh, that we intend on going forward with. Great, thank you. And last uh, follow-up to that is, um, um, you mentioned qualifiers. So uh, if the governor's instruction comes out that the sixth is the day, you are prepared next week for qualifiers following up the following week with actually starting um, the race days. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve and, and uh, Director Lightbound, I'm looking at the, the guidelines for the ship-ins in the barn area. You talk about spacing of stalls to promote uh, social distancing requirements shall be done whenever practical. Um, it was my understanding that you had more than enough space in the barn so that that wouldn't be a problem. Is that correct or? That's, that's correct. Um, as we're preparing out there, and I've had these discussions with Alex, uh, as we're preparing out there, it's almost too much space. Um, 
stalls are 10 feet apart. Uh, we're actually skipping a stall in between horses, so that makes it 20 feet apart. Uh, one of the things that we're trying, we're actually trying to get a little bit closer uh, because um, I was out there the other day. I, I, I have two guys working out there, and I know they were in the barn area, and I couldn't find them. So I want to, you know, we want to, we want to try and be able to, you know, uh, limit the amount of um, exercise or, 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 or work responsibilities on Alex's staff as far as the testing is going, on my staff as far as monitoring what's going on out there, because um, we've made it now a very large area. So um, we're looking at just bringing it down a little bit, but you know, it's going to be it's going to be about 20 feet, you know, uh, social distancing, um, and so. That's a that 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 really expands the operation out there, and you know our staff is uh, static from, or actually down a few people from uh, before before this all happened. So uh, we're trying to strike that balance as well um, to keep it controllable, uh, manageable, but yet uh, serve all the purposes that we need to serve as far as the social distancing and making sure that people are doing what they need to do. Okay. Uh, I, I, um, uh, excuse me, I uh, just want to follow up on your point, Commissioner Stebbins, it's a good one. Alex, I think probably to be consistent with the other edits that were made, probably as practical well, can be taken out, because I do think we have to accomplish social distancing. Sure, we can do that. Yep. I think that that might, yeah, that will make it all consistent. Thanks, okay. Commissioner Stebbins, for that. And now you had another question, I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, I appreciate Mr. O'Toole's input. And uh, Yeah, that's great. It's uh, it's a it's a good solution. I know that he'll be mindful of it. I know Director Lightbound and her team will be mindful of it. But that change is welcome. It's definitely not going to be perfect. I can tell you that. Just uh, in you know, in the time that I've been back and walking around and envisioning how things are going to be working, it's definitely going to be different. It's definitely not going to be perfect. So, you know, we're definitely going to need uh, everyone to be you know vigilant and. Uh, and bear with us until we can get you know everything straightened out to work in a smooth manner. Okay, thanks, Mr. Till. Um, just uh, another quick question to follow up on that. Again, remind us uh, how you're sharing kind of these new directions and instructions with everybody ahead of the qualifying days, as well as leading up to the race days. I think is that coming? Is that change coming in down the road, or did you already go by that? Alex. Sorry, I think there were new edits made on the communication plan. Here, I'll pull up the doc. Yeah, Sorry, go, go right I'm looking ahead. for it right now, Madam Chair. So, because um, Commissioner Stebbins, right. that was missing. So, you, you know, it's an important, Commissioner Stebbins has made clear it's a really important part of the equation here for our the sustainable success of the reopening. I is think, it page one? Yeah, I think it's under general, general guidelines. guidelines. Yeah, second, not, paragraph. The second paragraph, maybe. Yes, that, maybe that's we right. Can through that, because I think, Commissioner Stebbins, you might want to see if there's any details you want to add. No, in, in fact, I like, I like the, uh, um, the PPC text caster system you plan to use. Again, this is uh, a great deal of new guidelines and requirements on, you know, um, trainers and everybody else who's allowed in the barn area. Um, so it's good to see that they're being educated again before they even show up on property. So. Do you want that to be highlighted outside of general guidelines, Commissioner Stebbins, or are you okay where it's placed? Uh, I'm okay with where it's placed. Again, um, I know Mr. O'Toole and, and Alex will make sure that there's uh, strong, healthy education to uh, folks coming in to race that uh, you know, they're mindful of all these new guidelines. Excellent. Yes, and I um, want to point out too that the Harness Horsemen's Association has been um, really good about notifying um, all their um, members as well. So they're going to be getting the information from numerous sites. Great. We thank them for their help. Thanks, Alex. Um, one thing just to add is I, I had a request um, about five minutes before the meeting today um, to, to clarify um, on page four under barn area, 
about thoroughly cleaning those stalls before they leave. And um, with the timing, there just wasn't enough time for us all to circle back. So um, it, it's not something I think that we need to change right now. I think it's something that um, uh, Steve, I, and the horsemen can, um, you know, uh, go through uh, later on and just um, add the details for the horsemen so that they're comfortable as to what exactly has been being asked for. <clears throat> I, I did want to acknowledge that that had been asked for. Is it so that they want to make sure they understand their full responsibilities? Exactly. That, yes. Okay. I, I'm fine with that, General. And then you, you, you help on those details. Commissioners, you feel the same way moving forward? Yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent. Do you want to now? I think we left. Were we moving on to race paddock? Uh, That's correct. So, page four, we have the race paddock at the bottom of the page. Are there any questions for Dr. Lightbaum on that area? Okay, hearing none. Uh, on the page five, we also have a small section on the racing office. Any changes, questions, anything on that? Okay, the next paragraph, uh, the next subheading is the MGC. We also have the MGC offices and licensing couple of uh, provisions there. And at the bottom of page five, we have racing officials and employees in the main gaming slash racetrack building. That begins at the end of page five and goes through the end of the document. So that's the last section. Are there any questions, concerns, or any further information required by the commissioners on that section? Um, I have a question on page six after the bullet listings end mm -hmm. uh, paragraph opens the indoor areas including simulcasting area but the gaming establishment shall be subject to minimum requirements et cetera. So are there any anything more specific we need to do numbers anything like that that need to be talked about today commissioner could you just help me out i'm just catching up i'm sorry sure um, page six yeah there's a there's a bullet there's a list of bullet entries yes um, and just after that is a paragraph that starts the indoor okay. areas comma. Mm -hmm. So those are the um, minimum requirements that we adopted. Correct. Um, right. Have we already talked about that or was that, I know there was some conversation about an area that maybe we needed to get more specific on. You mean in terms of like the spectator space or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, or the simulcasting area. There was some conversation. I know someone briefed me on, on uh, numbers being able to maintain six feet. I mean, is this Karen, is this, or Dr. Lebron, is this the point of the document or is that somewhere else that we'll be talking about that? Um, that's taken care of um, right before that, um, where it says at such time that spectators for outdoor viewing are permitted by the executive order. Uh, and then it gives some different bullet points and it talks, the second bullet point is the occupancy level for the outdoor apron area, um, shall not exceed 200 people. Okay, yeah. maybe I must have an outdated version on what yeah. I pulled up. That's the number yeah. I don't have in front of me. You don't, I didn't, because I think that that's just a little bit of a challenge, Alex, because I, I have yeah. a red line version in front of me on my screen, and I do see that that was an additional um, edit that you may not have seen, Commissioner Brown. It came in late last night. Okay. So, um, and, and so again, this is, this is uh, when spectators are going to be permitted. So right. Got I'm it. wondering if we should um, be tabling that. I just wonder. Um, so we I haven't had any conversation about numbers, and I just don't know if now in this morning is the number to be actually dedicating ourselves and committing ourselves to a hard number on that till we know and have learned from what's going on in the other openings. That that would be my preference. So I um, or else maybe we could edit this, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, to in a place that we could get comfortable with, just so that we wouldn't have to revisit this. Mm -hmm. uh, should um, spectating be allowed sooner than you know later? So right now, uh, uh, Commissioner O'Brien does not have the red line version in front of her, Alex. Um, okay. Isn't an email, uh, Eileen, that I I've brought up? I, uh, I'm not yeah, sure I've what time. It pulled was, up the packet that was forwarded to me. The last version that was forwarded to me. So it was actually in an email that um that uh, Alex sent. I'm not sure I don't have the time in front of me, but it's yeah. separate with the red line. But it does say at such time that spectators for outdoor viewing um, are permitted by executive order issued by the governor as part of the Commonwealth's phased reopening plan. 
the following limitation shall apply. Uh, do, my fellow commissioners, do you all have that language in front of you? Because it's important for you to have the, the final version. Those changes did come in late, and so I, I'm, uh, I've had the advantage of reading the red line version along the way. And then, uh, so then the additional change um, that I'm seeing in blue might be the newest version. And it says, first bullet says what it's, we have here, spectators may now gather in groups of more than six people. And then the next one does address occupancy, the occupancy level in the outdoor apron area adjacent to the main building shall not exceed 200 people or any lesser count necessary to ensure that proper social distancing protocol can be achieved. I believe that there was some work done by staff and I don't have the details as to how that that number was achieved. And maybe if we have some insight on that, we could move forward or at least maybe the, the rest of the the rest of the red line that I'm seeing must have been incorporated into fully into what we have in front of us. So it was yeah, just, I, I do think it merits just airing that discussion publicly because it is a number that and a percentage that's being thrown in um, that I do think bears discussing today. I think that's right because I don't believe that that 200 was raised publicly, although it may have been, um, correct us. I don't, no, I think we deferred it the last time. That's right. So what I do think, if I'm, if I write, if we could just take one step at a time, the simulcasting space, which is indoors, is included in the guidance from our minimum standards adopted for gaming. Is that correct? That the simulcast space, um, yeah, I thought I thought it was the, um, discussed last time as you know the six feet between tables. People cannot go around and will not be encouraged to take their drinks with them. All of that kind of thing. That's right, and that that's all part of it. I'm, I'm losing my screen here. Uh, secondly, um, my apologies. Of course, I minimized something, and I'm I'm missing everybody right now. So bear with me. Okay, so the simulcast space I think we addressed in our minimum standards. Now on the, in the event spectators are permitted. Mm -hmm. um, I think Loretta, Todd, perhaps you could, um, uh, Karen and Alex, maybe you could explain the 200. Yeah, we had gotten um, capacity numbers from Plain Ridge and then um, and um, actual numbers and, and um, Steve can address this as well. Normally their numbers are much less than 200, but that's um, kind of the, you know, capacity or whatever. So um, uh, Loretta and Todd worked on, you know, that type of language so that we would have it covered for that. For um, that. And I um, fo we forwarded the email that I had sent um, yesterday with the red line version to Eileen. So okay, she great, thank you. She can. It looks like everything else was added into the version in front of us now, just the, that one bullet, right. so that's good. So the um, further elaboration on the, on the number 200, that came from some kind of a square footage estimation. What was the process? That as, uh, if I may, Madam Chair, um, as Dr. Lightbound mentioned, that number came from uh, Plain Ridge Park directly in an effort to, um, and, and my understanding is their initial calculation is that the number should have been higher, but that we, it was brought down to 200. Um, in an effort to ensure that we didn't have to revisit that number, we included that additional language that it, any lesser count that's necessary to ensure proper social distancing uh, can be achieved. We included that to make sure that if, if it is some lesser number and 200 is in fact too high, that we're not stuck with that number, which, um, I mean, to be to be frank, I'm not sure exactly how that number was calculated, um, and I, I'm similarly I I didn't believe that there's any such number in the state building code that governs that type of area that we could uh, point to, which is why um, we did rely on the number that came from uh, Plain Ridge Park. Maybe there's is there anyone on the call who just might be able to. Um, explain where they came up with the number that might clear everything up. Mr. O'Toole, perhaps. So what what I think is difficult here is that um, there's it's it's an outdoor space, as you correctly yeah. point out, Chair. And so 
I think it's more around the notion of the congregation rather than than the capacity. I mean, um, there's a reason well, why there's not a, an occupancy number because it's not it, it's not an occupied building. Well, there I just, I've only been there the one time. Can you access the outdoor space directly from the outside, or do you have you have to go through the simulcasting area, right? Both. Right. So I do think there needs to be a discussion about how that flow through gets handled because I don't necessarily think it's going to be static like shifting I'm staying outside in the entire outdoor time that I'm here versus inside so I just think it bear, it merits a little further discussion yeah and perhaps I should just chime in first um, one thing that it may not be generally understood by um, the public and 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 all is it is clear that right now the outdoor space does not have any grandstand bleachers or seating is that we can all agree on that so it is a that's correct a, it's standing that's on. correct so you know that's an important that's fact true. that's an important fact then so then there would be space and i've been there a few times where it can be accessed from different different locations is it fair to say it's all any place that any spectator would stand um and, and I say stand because I'm not sure if even little tables and chairs would be provided in this instance, we can go to that scenario. That it's all on some kind of a paved area. Is it, is it an area that is des designated for spectating? Is that, would that be fair too? Alan? It is, yeah. it is, and my recollection is that they have, at least in the past, put in you know, a hot dog stand, a picnic table or two. I don't know mm -hmm. if they, they have the right. same. So then I think that maybe we could reverse engineer there's a certain square footage available to um, spectators. I also think there's another way. So there's a reverse engineering just in terms of what the square footage is and then some kind of what's in a reasonable amount in these times to think about the numbers. And what we might want to do is table this discussion while somebody does that work and come back to it. Um, then there's also another way of looking at it. What is our typical attendance? And, uh, you know what is the t the typical attendance and i think that was my question and if if your daughter wants to help us with this question we would love we would welcome it um, you 30 seconds i'm sure she'd say you're good but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, in terms of maybe what is the general attendance and if we knew what generally the attendance was given the square footage it would seem that maybe 200 is a logical number that could be spread out and maybe in fact if um one that reflects a reality. So I think it's a very fair question that Commissioner O'Brien is raising. Uh, you know, what's the basis for 200? Does it make sense if we can't get that right now to continue our review and have somebody look at that before we move on that particular issue, just so that we don't have to revisit that, it? That, that would be my preference so that they can go move forward with the opening. It's not gonna repeat anything now because it's not allowed to be used right now. But they may want to also explore, to your point, you know, are they going to be putting some sort of tables out there? Um, what are the, you know, what's allowed in simulcast area flow through? What so they can appropriately manage their capacity from an enforcement perspective? So I do think it merits a little bit further conversation, but I don't think we need to do it at this moment because I don't think it's going to affect their ability to start next week, assuming that it opens next week. Yeah, I would agree with that. I uh, we don't have the information, so it's hard to make a decision when we do not know where the number came from. So I I think that we can go ahead without that and then um, get back to it after we have. I think that the um, let's just see. Uh, okay. So do I hear? It's, it's, um, I would love to get that resolved today, guys. Is, is, there, is there a notion of just eliminating the number and then keeping the language that, that is... Maintaining um, social distancing? The social distancing. I yeah. think it's... Yeah. Because yeah. I, I will go along with that. I think it's as elusive as uh, trying to dictate occupancy in a park, for example. Right. What's more important is that people exercise the six feet, the masks, and... Right, right. So, My fear with the number, too, is, I don't know, there's some... I just think you're also getting at a risk of, again, people shifting yeah. between those two spaces and you might get into just capacity issues that then PPC and or IB are dealt with that, that just we can write it in a way that doesn't cause that problem. I would like that very much rather than have to revisit it um, if it's a, a, the number that's troubling us. I mean, the reality is, is that 
they can't have more than six people in a cluster and everybody has to be socially distanced. And, and that alone can be their guidance for occupancy as if spectators are permitted. Um, and then if we need to revisit this, all of these guidelines are dynamic. We could come back to it, but then we've given them some immediate guidance should spectators be allowed. Yeah, I feel more comfortable with that. I, okay. I agree with that. By the way, it's, it's only during the end of the race when there's that congregation. Uh, it's not you know, for obvious reasons, but, but I think let's, let's take out the number and keep it to the distancing guidelines. So commissioners, what I hear saying is that the second bullet point should read the occupancy level in the outdoor apron area adjacent to the main building shall ensure that proper dis social distancing practices can be achieved. Is that acceptable? It, yeah, as long as that also includes the idea that no more than six in a, in right. a group, you know, consistent with the guidance that we've been giving. I think that bullet's in there somewhere anyway. Yeah, it's yeah I know that. Yeah, it is. Okay. See, it's in it's in there so really there's a little bit of redundancy correct yeah and if we are if we need to be more specific we can revisit okay Should are there any on? other any other questions on the uh on that last section okay thank you You're going to make sure too, Karen, that we have um, the designations for the pandemic safety officers for both the gaming establishments and the uh, yep. horse racing. Thank you. Great work. It takes a village and more. So um, how would you like to proceed, Alex, at this time before we move on? to the simulcasting operation? Should we um, have the vote that you were seeking? Yes, or should I we, does that make best sense? Uh, I think that Karen? makes sense. To well, it's fresh in our mind. Karen, you're yeah, comfortable with that? Yes. All right, just to make sure, does anybody want to go back on any of these measures now that you've had a chance maybe to look at the red line version too? Um, all excellent, the red line that came in, I realized that they were just a few last night. It's just really helpful for me to go back and forth. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Alex, really helpful. All right, do I have a motion? Um, Bruce? Yeah, I got, uh, Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve the plan submitted by Plain Ridge Park Racecourse and is amended here today for use in reopening their racing and simulcasting operations when allowed subject to any applicable orders issued by the governor as part of the Commonwealth's phased reopening plan, including any applicable se sector specific workplace safety standards and subject to any necessary adjustments based on a change in circumstances. Second. Further comments? Thank you um, again to Mr. O'Toole and to all those who helped um, Alex in, in uh, finalizing these uh, standards for our review. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Thank you so much. Five zero, Shara. Thank you. Moving on then to our simulcasting operation, Alex. Okay, so the um, next plan that is up is the one that uh, Suffolk Downs presented. And um, there were just a few um, little changes on that um, to, again, to kind of um, bring things in line with some of the things that the commissioners asked for and as far as um, making it come in line with the um, casino language as well. Does that make sense to walk through just briefly any of the highlighted mm -hmm. changes? Yeah. Are you, if you're prepared for that, um, the, just the a few changes that would have been made, I think. Yeah, let's see here. I believe that the, um, the, the um, I had asked for increase, I think, uh, to make sure that the um, 
restrooms were going to be aligned with, with what we were providing. I, well, oh, maybe that was on PPC. That, that was. Manager. And then uh, this was uh, to make sure masks were mandated. I think they were encouraged before that change. I, I have a question. I, um, the email that included, that, that came in last night, uh, when it comes to Suffolk, doesn't have any redlining. Do I have the right version? Uh, I sent a clean version of each of the documents, and then I sent um, a red line version also. Oh, let me look for it. And um, I'm not seeing that yet. If I can send that. Um, do you do you have your red line no, version? No, don't worry, don't worry. The the fastest way is probably to have someone who does have the red line to just. Quickly walk through to, and tell us what it is. Yeah, yeah I just that would be helpful. To Enrique and I'll um, pull it up. So uh, let's see here. Um, part of it was in, in all the documents was just um, on uh, getting the wording about masks um, all uniform. So it talks about wearing masks that cover the nose and mouth. So that was you know one of the things on um, Suffolk. Um, one of the things on the first page that we changed was um, said guests would be served at tables spaced appropriately, and we changed that wording to be uh, spaced six feet apart or otherwise in accordance with the state guidelines. Um, so that if at some point things change, we didn't have to come back. Uh, we added in on the um, again, on the food and beverages in the dining areas that um, Suffolk would make reasonable efforts to ensure the customers don't violate that rule. Um, then on um, occupancy, uh, it had limit total occupancy to less than 50% and um, they added, uh, well, this might have been in the original document that you saw. Um, it's got the 600, inclu not including the apron, and says that it'll be limited to 250. Again, that's, um, Chip had mentioned that. Yes, um, he did. Back in 18. Then um, the um, language about having a pandemic safety advisor was added in. Um, they have, uh, they named who they designated, David Lanzilli, to act as it, and it has that, the pandemic safety advisor wording in there. And then I, I believe Commissioner Stebbins had asked um, for uh, more wording on um, communications and signage, so under that, um, they added in um, kind of the standard stuff about um, informing guests about the COVID-19 and um, uh, communication plan, website, et cetera. And I, I think that covers the, um, the main highlights. Questions, commissioners? Since, since we were talking about aprons, um, remind me the configuration uh, relative to uh, a similar space. I know just in terms of size, uh, Suffolk Downs is much larger uh, because of the larger track. But um, Alex or Chip, can can you tell us a little bit about how that how people congregate around that uh, there? Uh, certainly, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, so the uh, we're we're only going to be utilizing the clubhouse a apron, which is terraced. It's tiered down to the the racetrack surface. Um, but we are using that primarily as an outdoor dining area consistent with the state and the city of Boston's uh, guidelines for outdoor dining. Um, and that, uh, <clears throat> so that area will be open so people can go, go in and out. Um, we are uh, putting um, markers actually, you know, sort of uh, on the floor inside and outside the clubhouse um, so that when people are standing uh, looking up at, at television screens and things like that, they, they uh, are, are do so uh, at at least six feet apart. Um, and uh, we will only be offering food and beverage service 
uh, in that outdoor area. There will no, be no uh, inside food and beverage service. So um, we've got some tables uh, set up. We're in the process of doing that as well. Um, some outdoor picnic tables and, and things like that. Um, we are going to uh, limit people's uh, occupancy at those tables consistent with, uh, with the guidelines for restaurants. Thank you. And, and per the commissions, per our prior discussion with the commission and, and some additional follow up with, uh, with Dr. Lightbone, we have, um, <clears throat> we, we are making it clear to patrons that food and drink can be consumed uh, only at those tables and, and uh, we're gonna take uh, the measures to discourage them from uh, trying to sort of go mobile with anything. I think that this is a good time for me to just chime in on that. That's going to be probably our uh, a, a big challenge for our licensees and for you um, uh, who are running simulcasting. You know, it, it's already been mentioned. I think it was Mr. O'Toole who said it. It will take a, a lot of, um, it will take vigilance on the part of the licensees, but it will take really the good faith efforts of every patron to at this time just um, be really thoughtfully aware of complying with the rules so that we can have a sustained reopening. And it really will take empathy, uh, a collective empathy for each other and for our, you know, our larger community. So, you know, that's what we wish for. So uh, the, the, the intent, of course, Chip, is so that when they're not walking around with a drink, they're not taking their mask off to drink it because that's where the risk gets highest. So. No, it's all very, it's, it's not punitive. It's really meaning to be intentionally protective of one another so that we can still have a good time, but be safe. So, thank you. Any further questions on this one? Should we um, have a, a vote on this? Unless, it, unless there are further edits. Commissioners, any further edits, questions? I think that the, this really achieved the um, what we were looking for from last time and more. So thank you. Yeah. I have a motion. Yep, Chair. Mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I move that the commission approve the plan submitted by Suffolk Downs for use in reopening their simulcasting operation when allowed, subject to the applicable orders issued by the governor as part of the Commonwealth's phased reopening plan, including any applicable sector specific workplace safety standards and subject to any necessary adjustments based on a change in circumstances. Second. Thank you. Further edits? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes. Five zero, Shara. Thank you so much. Now we have our friends in Raynham. I don't know who's joining us, but thank you for joining us. But we'll have Alex go over the uh, um, the document and changes. And we okay. thank everybody involved. Okay, so um, again, we just um, we're trying to get the wording about masks to be uh, kind of standardized between everything. So uh, we put it um, mask covering the nose and mouth um, under um, the PPE section. Um, scroll down here. On the um, food and beverage service area, um, we made a couple of different changes to that. Um, just uh, once again, to um, have it be clear that um, when people are um, eating or drinking, they'll be seated um, and, and lower their masks only for eating and drinking and won't be carrying their beverages around the um, simulcast floor. So um, we did some different, um, made some different wording on that part. Um, let's see, then we added, um, fleshed out the communications plan a little bit more again, to reflect some of the wording that um, was in um, the other um, plans, talking about the communication plan, website, um, signs, and all that. 
And then the last item was adding the um, pandemic safety officer wording, again, to uh, have it come in line with um, the casinos and the other simulcast plans. Any questions for Alex on the brain him proposal, Mr. Carney's proposals? We thank, uh, we thank the team for joining us today. If you have any specific questions, uh, Alex, who's available? Uh, it should be Sue Rodriguez. Yeah. Okay. I don't see her. And oh, there George might be on with her, Mr. Carney. Good morning, Mr. Sue Rodriguez. I have Mr. Carney here with me representing Raiden Park. Any questions or comments? Just wish you well. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for um, the work on, on these guidelines. Any further edits or recommendations on the document? Okay. I see no, I see no, we're, we're all set, which is, which is uh, a good sign. Thank you so much. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the plan submitted by Raynham Park Simulcast Center for use in reopening their simulcasting operations when allowed, subject to any applicable orders issued by the Governor as part of the Commonwealth Space Reopening Plan, including any applicable sector-specific workplace safety standards and subject to any necessary adjustments based on the change in circumstance. Second. Thank you. Hearing no further comments or edits, I'll the roll call, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 5-0. And a big thank you to Alex and team and to all of those who are Guests today, we know um, all of these efforts were allowing us to move forward today. And we wish everyone well for reopening when it's permitted. Um, I do think if we did have a little bit of a late start. It is 12.15. Would people like a short break rather than a lunch break before um, we proceed? Or do people want a lunch break of sorts before we proceed? Or should we continue through the next let, item? Let, let me suggest just a, a five minute break um, because I, it appears that there's uh, a number of guests for the next item. Mm -hmm. um, and then just sort of see where that goes. We'd, but a five, the break at this time would be a helpful, a yes. helpful thing. Okay, yes, we'll please. have a, it is now um, 12, we'll reconvene at, uh, 12 uh, 25 does that make sense 12 16 we'll round sure. it up 12 25 thank you sounds good thank you appreciate everyone's patience thank you Sharon. we'll get started reconvening after a short break um public meeting number 311 with massachusetts gaming commission thank you uh while we were on break um i know the governor is having his press conference and he did uh uh, publicly announced that phase three will begin on, on Monday. Um, further guidance will be coming and to the extent that I can provide real time updates, I will. So but we'll, we'll stick with the matter at hand and uh, continue now with number 4B, Massachusetts Thoroughbred Breeders Association request to race outside Massachusetts. <clears throat> Todd, I think you're going to take the lead on this one. Good uh, afternoon, uh, Attorney Grossman. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, thank you um, for uh, turning your attention to this issue. There has been a, a question raised as to the Gaming Commission's specific role as it relates to uh, thoroughbred horse racing outside of the Commonwealth and specifically as to the use of breeders funds for those purposes. You may recall historically the Commission has reviewed this issue and has historically approved of the use of such funds. Um, 
And before we take too deep a dive, um, I, I just want to acknowledge that uh, attorney Kathleen Regan and Dr. Anthony Ziza from the Thoroughbred uh, Breeders Association are on the call with us to answer um, any specific questions uh, that may arise. And certainly Dr. Lightbound is uh, tremendously knowledgeable in this arena as well. And I'd be happy to um, run through uh, the legal elements if that would uh, be of use, but ultimately uh, the question is uh, whether the commission needs to uh, approve the use of the breeders funds in uh, out of state uh, races. And it's my understanding that there are a number of outside, uh, locations outside the Commonwealth that the breeders uh, would like to uh, race and make use of uh, these funds. One of them is at um, a location um, in Canada, and I'm sure they can get into a little more detail, but there is some detail in the packet relative to those plans as well that you may have had an opportunity uh, to look at. Um, I would just uh, mention, and I'm happy to, to go through this in, um, in detail if that would be helpful, but just by way of broad overview, the issue here is actually governed by chapter 128 of the general laws, section 2G. And that uh, chapter is of course in the section under the auspices of uh, the Department of Agricultural Resources. It's not under the auspices of the Gaming Commission. This section is, however, the only legal authority that I'm aware of that discusses the manner in which the breeders have to spend their funds. Under Chapter 23K, Section 60, which of course you're familiar with, the Racehorse Development Fund uh, says that, uh, that section says that 16% of the funds are directed to breeding purposes. But there's no language in Section 60 that talks about how the monies are supposed to be spent. Um, and so I should acknowledge as we move forward at the outset here that section 2G of chapter 20, uh, 128 is holistically something less than totally clear. Um, so we might want to start by taking a look at some of the areas where there is some clarity and navigate our way uh, from there. As uh, I mentioned, yes. Yeah, I think that would be great. Uh, maybe you were getting to that, but it's 128D. Did you say? No, it's just 128. So um, to, to be more precise, of course, the Gaming Commission has oversight of 128A and 128C. And those are some of the areas we just were really referencing. 128C uh, governs simulcasting in the Commonwealth. 128A governs live racing in the Commonwealth. But chapter 128 is not specific to racing at all. In fact, it, again, as I said, it's not even under the Gaming Commission's auspices. It's under uh, the Department of Agricultural Resources. And section two in particular lays out the powers and duties of the Department of Agricultural Resources. Most of the sections in section two have nothing to do with horse racing or gaming or anything like that. There are really just two sections within that, um, that section that do pertain to uh, areas that we are specifically interested in. And one pertains to thoroughbred uh, breeders and one pertains to standard bred breeders. And it's section 2G that pertains to the thoroughbred breeders and that's the section that's at issue right now. And just as a, a footnote, um, section G and I believe it's section J which governs the standard bred breeders are slightly different. They're similar, but they're, they're slightly different. Um, and part of the reasons for the differences, and there's actually a letter in the packet from attorney Kevin Considine on behalf of thoroughbred breeders that runs through some of the history of these statutes, which date back many, many years. There was one change in particular that is noteworthy, and I'll get into that momentarily, that talks about use of the funds for purposes of racing outside the Commonwealth. That language doesn't appear in the standard bread section. So it, it stands to reason as he uh, asserts that that was inserted when it became clear that thoroughbred racing in the Commonwealth would become uh, perhaps more sparse given the situation with Suffolk Downs. So the law was amended to allow for that. Um, and when was that? Uh, uh, when did that happen? Um, I, 
I, I want to say 2015. Is, is that right, Dr. Right. Lightbound? Yes, okay. that's correct. <clears throat> um, and it just, that so happens to be the first year that the Gaming Commission looked at this issue. Um, and I did go back and look at the, uh, the commission's review of this matter, and it, it doesn't appear that um, you ever really uh, specifically took a look at the statute with this level of detail. Um, so this is, is really the first time we're doing that. Um, and if it's helpful, we can go into a little bit about what the statute says uh, to help you navigate uh, this decision-making process. Um, of course, happy to field any questions as we go along. But um, as I said, paragraph G mostly pertains to just the, uh, I'm sorry, paragraph G pertains to the uh, Thoroughbred uh, Breeders Association and the promotion of uh, breeding in the Commonwealth. It specifically says that the Department of Agricultural Resources has the power to promote, develop, and encourage through the mass thoroughbred breeding program, the breeding of thoroughbred horses in the Commonwealth by offering cash prizes to the breeders of such horses. So that's what paragraph G says that the Department of Agricultural Resources has the power and duty to do. The statute then identifies the way that this should be accomplished. And it says specifically that the mass thoroughbred breeders quote, uh, shall from time to time in consultation with the chairman of the racing commission and the program manager for the, Depart uh, for the equine division of the Department of Agriculture set certain percentages and bonuses uh, related to purses. So that's what the statute says. And when we are trying to determine whether the commission uh, is required to approve of such expenditures, that is the focal point, at least initially, of our inquiry, is that piece of the law that says, essentially, just that they're supposed to consult with the chair of the racing commission. There, there's, so there's no place that explicitly requires commission approval at this, this point. There is language though, as I mentioned, that is most commonly pointed to as governing the use of the breeders funds at racetracks outside the Commonwealth. And that language provides that the breeders shall in consultation with the chair and the program manager, set the percentage for a cash prize for the purse monies won by said thoroughbred horse in any unrestricted or restricted paramutual running horse race held within or outside the Commonwealth uh, to the owner of a mass bred horse. Uh, there is no definition, direction, or limitation anywhere in the statute as to how that term outside the Commonwealth language should be construed. But it's our understanding that that is the language, the outside the Commonwealth language that was added in 2015 um, to coincide with um, essentially the Gaming Commission's decision to award the license in Region A as it did. So while to this point in section G, there's no requirement that the Gaming Commission approve explicitly the use of any funds, there is more to this section that needs to be looked at before um, any decisions can be made. And that's the first sentence of the second paragraph of 2G, which does have some interesting language uh, that's worthy of note. It says that the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Association is further authorized to pay cash purses for stakes races to be limited to Massachusetts bred thoroughbred racehorses from the Massachusetts Thoroughbred Breeding Program at licensed paramutual racetracks authorized by the State Racing Commission. So there's a couple of pieces of language in that last quote that should be looked at. And the first is the use of the word further. Uh, the second is that phrase at licensed paramutual race meetings authorized by the State uh, Racing Commission. And so as you're working through this, I would suggest that by the use of the word further, the statute indicates that the language should be read as being in addition to the previous language, meaning that it's in addition to the previous three ways that the statute says that the breeders can spend their money. And they're adding this fourth way. So that's the, the second uh, paragraph, the first sentence, adds a fourth way in which the breeders may spend their money. And that's where 
uh, that language relative to licensed paramutual race meetings authorized by the State Racing Commission comes in. But the question then becomes, and as I said, this is, is all something less than 100% clear, but as you're navigating it, of course, it's our obligation to try to read things in a harmonious kind of way to assign meaning to all of the respective uh, language included in the statute. But when you're considering what licensed meeting, a licensed meeting authorized by the commission really means, you can think about it in two ways. Uh, it could either mean that it's licensed, the meeting itself is licensed in another jurisdiction, but that the commission has to separately authorize it. Or you could read it to say that once the commission licenses the meeting, that it is authorized. So you read it all together. And I would su submit to you that that second approach um, it does in result in a harmonious read of the entire uh, section and would not in that event require uh, the commission to approve of the expenditure of funds for uh, racing outside of the Commonwealth. And there's a couple of reasons I think that are important to keep in mind as you're weighing um, the, the appropriate way to interpret this statute. The first thing is that there, there's really no clear standard that we can apply to determine um, whether you would authorize the expenditure of funds out of state. Pre presumably, we would apply the language at the beginning of this section that says that the intent is to promote, develop, and encourage the breeding of thoroughbreds in the Commonwealth. But that is somewhat detached from this second paragraph. So there is some language we could hang our hats on if we were to do that, but it's not directly aligned. Secondly, I think it's just noteworthy, and I, I welcome um, anyone to weigh in if, if I misspeak here, but I don't believe the Gaming Commission approves of any other use of breeders uh, expenditures in advance. So this would be the one area that is singled out uh, for that purpose. And finally, there are some checks on the expenditures of breeders uh, funds for these purposes. There are two checks um, in particular that are, are notable. The first is section G itself says that the state auditor shall audit the books of the Mass Thoroughbred Breeders Association to ensure compliance with this section um, as often as the state auditor determines necessary. And it's my understanding that the auditor has in the past, and I can't speak to how often that is, but has audited the books um, in the past. And secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, of course, is that the, the Gaming Commission <laughs> by way of the horse racing committee um, is in, in charge and oversees the split of the distribution of funds from the racehorse development fund. That 16% of the funds that go to breeders are, is looked at uh, periodically. It's actually looked at annually, though it's not required to be. And the commission does maintain ultimate control as to what the split of the funds uh, will be. And certainly the manner in which the funds are expended is something that will and, and, and should be taken into consideration when determining uh, how the funds are distributed and allocated. That is all just to say that there are certain checks on the expenditure of these funds. And so that's, that's the, the issue that's before the commission at the moment is how best to interpret uh, section 2G and I, it, again, just to reiterate, the commission has in the past uh, looked at these requests and has approved them under uh, this particular section. As I look at it now, though, um, it, it's not explicitly clear that the commission must approve the expenditure of these funds um, in advance of their, their use. Um, so that's... That's my overview of, of this issue. Uh, happy to uh, engage in, in any discussion now or answer any specific questions, if uh, that would be helpful. Yeah, um, Attorney Grossman, I had a clarification. You said that uh, the breeders were looking at um, uh, numerous 
tracks to hold these events. I don't, I think you used the word many. Um, the only one that I'm from, uh, familiar with is the one, um, is uh, the one potential plan to race out of the country in Canada. So I, I don't know that that's accurate, that there are multiple uh, tracks that may host, um, uh, may host uh, mass bred races. Uh, you know, uh, Commissioner Cameron, if I may, it looks like um, maybe either Attorney Reagan or, or Dr. Ziza would be in a better position to address that point. I may have misspoken, and I apologize if that. No, 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 no need to apologize. I just, I'm only, for, I'm making sure I have all the latest information, and my information is such that the only um, proposal is is to race in Canada. Can That's everyone? Not accurate. All right, I'll let Dr. Ziza speak. He worked it out. Okay. Um, so in the letter that we uh, wrote to you, and I, it should be in the packet, um, it states that we have the two uh, options at the moment, including um, Fort Erie, which is an hour and a half from Finger Lakes, just over the border, and then also um, Belterra Park, which is in Ohio, and has, um, unfortunately, it's an eight-hour ship. Uh, so there's some advantages and disadvantages of both, but Attorney Grossman is absolutely correct. We do have um, we do have two at the moment, um, and 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 are not limiting it to that. Uh, if there are but, other, that but Mr. Ziza, do you have any plans? Do you have a, a plan that we could look at as to what kinds of races, when they would be held, what uh, you know? We just don't seem to have any so we, information we do have a, about that. Well, we do have a plan. Um, I don't I don't think that we need to lay out a plan of specific races. I'm happy to share something that the board is um, working on, but um, the those races aren't going to be prepared months and months in advance, um, and we don't feel that that's the right approach for us at the moment, given, given the, uh, the sense of <clears throat> uncertainty. Um, so I'm happy to provide, or the board is happy to provide something for you um, to give you but Mr. Ziza, so this is a change because in the past um, you have submitted a plan uh, for the commission to approve uh, with races um, out of state. And we looked at that plan and we approved that plan, in particular the Finger Lakes um, opportunities. And we were happy to do that after kind of assuring ourselves that this was um, an appropriate use of the Commonwealth's um, um, monies. So I'm just, I'm asking the question, why are you deviating this year from um, your request in past year to have the commission uh, approve those? Yeah, plans? absolutely. That, that's a great question. So the reason that there's a deviation this year is because several different reasons, actually. So one is that situations on the ground um, are changing and uncertain. And by providing a list of races in years past, we did that out of courtesy. Um, we came to the Gaming Commission out of respect and courtesy because that was the request for us. Um, our legal counsel has stated clearly in a letter that he wrote has always felt um, that we did not need to do that, but we did it because we wanted to be good partners and we wanted to provide whatever information we could. In that time, since we've done that, there have been multiple things that have happened, including it allows, it, it prevents actually from some changes that may need to happen on the ground. Um, and we need to be nimble, particularly now, um, where we don't have a place to race in Massachusetts either. So with this question of the authority coming up, it certainly didn't make sense to present a list of races or possible races that you would approve or not approve because we're at this point um, wanting to discuss the issue of whether that approval is even, uh, even necessary. So I think the letter from, from our attorney, as well as our um, proposal to you, uh, says that we, we don't think that that's the case, but we're happy to um, work with Alex and, and all of the commission um, to keep you up to, uh, up to date and consult with you um, as needed and as often as needed um, to make sure that you're in the loop in whatever we do uh, and whatever races that we offer. Well, this, this has been an issue in the past, Mr. Zizer, because all of the horsemen are not in agreement that this is a, a good use of the Commonwealth money. So we're trying to balance all of those interests. As you know, you've been part of um, these discussions and these uh, approvals for years. 
so I, I think you're you're aware that that's those are the things we've been balancing over the years. Yeah, no, I absolutely am aware, and I'm sensitive to that. Um, I think that the information that we gathered recently showing that almost 90% of all of our money comes back to mass um, breeders and owners is, is unbelievably supportive of the fact that what we have done in the last four years has really served uh, Massachusetts in the best way that it can. And then in addition to that, I, I think that it's the board's response, I don't think, I know it's the board's, actually the breeders' board's responsibility to determine um, the direction that we go in. So I don't think we'll ever get 100% agreement in anything we do, but what I love is that when we went back and looked and present, presenting it to you as well, um, it really does show that we have, we basically have had over 300 payments each year to multiple different people. We have had over 90% of our money returned to Massachusetts. So, you know, I think that it, the, the facts speak for themselves, and this is the way that the board wants to proceed um, at this point. Can I? I okay, uh, go ahead, Commissioner Zuniga. I'm sorry. Can I? Can I? Um, I, I'd like to go back to the to the legal question, the one of authority. Uh, I right. thought I, I thought Todd, um, which is uh, what I think is at the core here. Um, I uh, a couple of questions, but let me start with a broader one. We are the trustees of the Racehorse Development Fund. Um, and as trustees, we are implicitly charged to make sure that the payments um, are done uh, to meet a lot of the intent of the, of the statute. Um, that was not part of the analysis that you, um, that you went through, uh, Todd. Can you speak a little bit about that? Because I, I think uh, authority may, may be, it, authority is at the core of also being the trustees of the fund. It's, it's complicated, and this, this has come up in other contexts as well. Um, certainly, to the extent um, the commission is the uh, trustee of the Racehorse Development Fund, um, you have a duty of, a fiduciary duty of care to ensure that monies are distributed from the fund in accordance with the statute. Um, and in this case, uh, I would submit, at least in the first instance, that you do that um, and that your duty stems from section 60 in chapter 23K, which talks about how the money uh, shall be distributed from the, the, um, from the fund itself and how it has to be based upon a recommendation of the horse racing committee, which of course you ensure, um, and, and what have you. So section 60 is really the core of where your fiduciary duty stems from. This is a little more complicated, I would submit, because the manner in which the expenditures have to be made fall in a body of law that is not under your direct auspices. And that's notable for me. And so that's why I, I wanted to make clear that it's not, in, entirely clear what the right answer to this question is. I don't, you wouldn't necessarily be, you wouldn't be wrong to uh, uh, assert a fiduciary duty, um, but it, it's, it's less than clear that that's connected to section 60. Whereas right. if section 60 kind of spelled all this out, I would say, absolutely, you know, that is something right. that you should and, consider. And by the way, and I appreciate that this is highly complex because there's cross-reference of multiple statutes as you correctly outlined, as well as history in terms of what was legacy and then what changed uh, because of circumstances like uh, the award of the license on region A. I, I just want a, cu a couple more, um, just sort of uh, going back to your, your initial remarks. So um, this um, uh, to section 2G of, of 128 um, does talk about the, the secretary of the Department of Agricultural Resources having the power to ultimately um, oversee issues like this. Um, is that the case? Is that a fair statement or uh, is it too general? Well, I, it, it says that 
the uh, thoroughbred breeders have to consult with the chair of the racing commission and the program manager for the equine division of the Department of Agriculture. Well, but in, I seem to uh, take away from from your outline that the secretary or the Department of Agricultural Resources has some kind of authority in all of these, some kind of say as to whether these breeding programs, uh, you know, or races out of state um, are, are okay. Is that fair or, or not accurate? Yes, I certainly think that they, they do have a role. And I think perhaps a little even clearer than ours in that this is under the section of duties and responsibilities of the uh, Department of Agricultural Resources. And one of the articulated uh, powers and duties is to promote, develop, and encourage uh, breeding of thoroughbred horses in the Commonwealth. Um, okay. So, yes, I, I think that that is a clearer um, uh, duty. Do you mean to just to add in, are you saying that they have a, um, a more than a consultation role? Do they need to sign off on this? No, that's, I mean, that's, that's not but what it says. That, that's either. what I just, I wanted to you clarify know? that. Thank so, you. Uh, you know, we're, we're navigating some very difficult language and I, I don't mean to keep repeating that, but um, there are no crystal clear answers to all of this, but that's why it's important that we just try to read everything holistically in, in harmony. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's what we're doing, of course. Okay, so I'll just maybe on layman's terms, it looks like the, secret, the Department of Agricultural Resources has some kind of role. Have they done anything in the past on this issue? And, and, and is there anything, um, any indication that of where they stand on this particular issue at the moment? I, I, don't, I don't, Dr. Leipon, do you know the answer to that? No, Maybe. no they, they haven't weighed in on this particular issue. But they're, they're consulted, um, are, they, are they notified? Are they being the consulted plans? or notified or? No, uh, they're part of the, um, the uh, program is to register the horses and, um, and then I, uh, they have certain um, requirements of when they have to be in Massachusetts and all that. So they verify that the horses have been in Massachusetts and do that. So their role has um, been more to um, verify what horses are considered mass bred horses. Okay, and fi finally, just um, on the legal uh, piece, part of the and I do appreciate that it's very complicated. I've, I've been through this and it's hard for me to keep, uh, keep all, the, all the moving pieces um, and all the history in my head. And uh, just to be clear, when you say you've been through this, Mr. Grossman did provide a, an extensive uh, legal memo in yeah, reduced, no, and reduced I, to I, writing I, that we all, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands, all of our team understands that Todd did provide a written analysis as well. So thank you. Yes, and I meant being through this since since 2013 or 2014 when this um, when these issues started to come about uh, because of again uh, the award of the license um, um, to a non-track um, operator. Um, there was um, in the original stat in the in 23 in, in the session laws there was a notion of modifying a, a directive of uh, modifying 128A and, and 128C um, by some date that is long past. Uh, we've submitted one to, uh, you know, the chapter that would, um, uh, would have replaced them because they, were, they had been uh, s scheduled to, to sunset um, in 128D. Um, would any of all of those um, um, principles established there would have would have touched on this particular issue um, when uh, when modifying 128 A and C. Well, I think uh, the answer to your question is no, and I only say that because I just looked at that specific thing when we were looking at the fact that the racing laws were just extended for a year and that language that bill uh, extends 
you know, 10 or 15 different areas of the law. And so one of them I looked at specifically was to see whether this was touched at all. And it hasn't been, uh, and it hasn't been included in that. Um, but to your point, the, the proposed legislation we've submitted, I think, um, I'd have to go back and look, but may give the Gaming Commission a little clearer authority over this, this specific uh, matter. Well, that, that's my recollection, and I haven't looked at it recently, but that, that 128D, the effort was, because there were so many moving pieces, notably what I re remember are all the different takeouts and the different percentages and the premiums, and all of that had a legacy of, you know, many, many years of modifications that there was an effort to, in recognition of all this need for modification, that there would be this broad authority, and this is where I was going, uh, to uh, come to the Gaming Commission by necessity, that we would then, you know, resolve it among the five of us uh, on, on, on instances like this, for everything that might occur at a later time. I think that's exactly right. It, it was an effort and is an effort to consolidate uh, the authority and clarify um, the Gaming Commission's role right. uh, to promote and enhance and oversee horse racing inside and as we now know outside of the Commonwealth as the case may be. Unfortunately, that um, it hasn't happened. You know, yet. Hasn't happened. So we're we're here um, and, with. And Todd, with, could you just reiterate what your um, your recommendation is for today's matter? Um, and I guess I'm I read your and and been briefed thoroughly on the request, um, and I don't have and don't bring to the table what was decided in 2013. Nor do I see that. Ex um, that broad authority extending on this analysis. So I would need further clarification on that to act on it, unless you're comfortable today advising with respect to the analysis you did for us on this matter in, in writing. Because I'm hearing Commissioner Zuniga, but I don't, I don't really, I haven't looked at that with that overview. Um, and, and so I don't want, what I'm very concerned about is I would never want a commission to act on something, thinking we have authorization to act on something that we really don't have legal authorization to do. And I know that there's past practice and I understand that, but I also understand, you know, I, I value precedent, but not to the extent that you continue to do something that might not be accurate. You know, that's that that's why you know cases and law get looked at all the time. So I want to be really careful here that we don't that we acknowledge past practice and if that's the right answer then we could go forward if you're suggesting that yes it was past practice but upon reconsideration you think that perhaps our voting on this would be outside of our authority I, i'd like to hear that um i don't i haven't heard yet from commissioner stebbins or commissioner o'brien on this and then we can circle back to commissioner cameron and commissioner zuniga but from my point of view that's really that's the critical decision from my perspective. And I do hear Commissioner Cameron saying that there's this, there's, you know, the idea of how we as public servants uh, spend the Commonwealth's funds. And, and when we have that authority to think about that, then I absolutely am in agreement. But if it's outside of our authority on this precise issue, then I'm not sure that that we can weigh in on it. And that's really where, where I stand. I just want to understand that precisely. Commissioner O'Brien or Commissioner Stebbins? Um, I think just to follow up on um, what Commissioner Zuniga pointed out and then his follow-up question in terms of our role as trustee of the Horse mm -hmm. Race Development that Fund. Mm -hmm. um, Todd, I just wanna, again, I do not have the racing experience that you mm -hmm. and, and Commissioner Cameron have and, and Dr. Leibon, but um, it would seem to me, we do have a fiduciary obligation under the common law um, as in terms of being trustees for the Racehorse Development Fund. When you look at 23K, section 60, C sub II, C2, and it talks about the commission determining the split, do you see that as part of us executing the fiduciary responsibilities as trustee in terms of the question of whether we um, are required to give specific approval prior to the expenditures of this fund is question one. 
I also want to try to understand if in reviewing the fact that they do have to show how they've submitted this, these monies, going forward, if there is a determination that part of the way we satisfy our fiduciary obligation is in determining the split, um, is that a way to reconcile Commissioner Zuziga's comment that we have a fiduciary responsibility, but maybe under your statutory analysis, there's no pre-requirement that we approve expenditures in advance? I think that's exactly right, uh, Commissioner O'Brien. It ultimately is, is my perspective, is that there doesn't seem to be ex clear authority to suggest that we need to uh, pre-approve these expenditures, but that there is oversight over the expenditures. It's not as though we turn a blind eye to this. We do look at it. We just look at it after typically and on a, a regular basis as well and you know when i was forming my opinion as to what this all meant one of the things and i, I think i mentioned that is notable to me is that we don't and when i say we i mean the commission of course uh, uh, pre-approve any other expenditures um, to determine whether they fit into the um, the category of promoting or developing thoroughbred horse racing. And so this one would be singled out. And while I, I do think there is a fiduciary duty, I'm, and I'm not suggesting that there isn't, I think there's a different way to ensure our fidelity to that. And that is by reviewing it as part of the distribution. Um, but Okay. But we, we do approve, we, we pre-approve the purses, the amount of purses that go to the thoroughbred and standardbred races, the 80%. That's, but that's a different, that's from the horsemen, this is from the breeders. But, but it's all connected, and if I can clarify something, uh, Mr. Grossman, the committee, and we're talking a lot about the work of the committee with the split, has never looked at, um, first of all, when the committee was formed, there, were no, there was no ability to race out of state, okay? So there was no issue there whatsoever. All the races were here in the Commonwealth. Secondly, when the law was changed, which we were fully aware of and supportive of because we wanted to provide these opportunities, um, it was with the understanding that we would make sure that the monies were spent um, you know, in, in, in a fashion that was in keeping with the intention. And when you say that we don't uh, look at We've looked at health and welfare. We have really looked at those numbers to make sure those dollars are being spent in, in the appropriate way. So I think there are um, examples where we do provide oversight to make sure that the monies are being expended in a way that the law intends. And I think what's different so here as well yeah. is, is the fact that this law was written so long ago and it's, it's not it's not consolidated, so it is very hard to understand. I don't think it was ever written with the intention of, you know, racing out of the country, for example. And, and just to be clear, uh, again, because it is so complicated, when you say committee, yes, that is a different body than the com racing correct. commission. That the commission. I, just want, I want, uh, uh, correct. Councilor correct. Grossman could clarify that. Commission, even though it wasn't corrected in the language, the racing commission, the chair of the racing commission is actually the, the racing commission is the gaming commission, correct? Correct. That's an example, one of many examples where the law is not up to date with, um, oh, right. with the and present, yeah, the 23K. Right. And, 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 and if you read it in its yes. totality, you'll, you will be able to discern that. Sure. Probably just some, you know, but, sometimes but all it, the general laws aren't precise. Sure. But under 23K, when the racing committee was formed, and the, and the commission has, can't, change that split by the way the commission could send it back and say look we're not we're not seeing uh where you got your numbers can you take a second look but it's not it's not accurate that the commission the uh the gaming commission has the uh, authority to um change that split right so that's on the top but that's a, a little bit of a different i just i'm trying to again get my head wrapped around exactly the precise issue before us that we have talked about that. I know we 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 actually were. I took no 
formal action on it uh, recently, correct, uh, Gail? But um, in terms of, or no, we know that we can't vote on it affirmatively. Correct. That so, we can only be so I guess now on this issue. Right. So I guess my point is, I don't, I'm not finding the logic in we we have oversight on the back end because I don't actually see it that way. I, I appreciate that. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. So now looking at the precise issue in front of us, is there when you did your analysis, you um, uh, with respect to is the do does the uh, commission need to take formal action and approve this precise request to be able to go out of state, out of country? You concluded that it didn't look as though that 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 requirement was made provided that there was consultation to the chair of the racing commission which i understand is the gaming commission but That's not a formal vote on it no. although past practice was that they, we did take formal vote now i'm just going back to commissioner o'brien and commissioner zuniga do we feel that do we still feel that while we have fiduciary obligations, do we actually need to vote affirmatively on this precise issue? And Commissioner Stebbins, I haven't forgotten you. So I, I don't know if you wanna chime in first, Commissioner Stebbins on overall, but it looks as though there's this, this idea about the fiduciary duty somehow as an overlay that would prompt an authorization. And I would like to be able to I'd like to be able to see that in statute somewhere, that it would actually require our affirmative approval. Not because I don't think we necessarily have a big dispute substantively here, but it does seem like we want to have clarification on process. Um, I, I suppose that it's not clear in statute, and that's what brings us here in the first place. Um, but, but I, it, I think but there's cross-purposes. But, but I think, from my perspective, when I read Attorney Grossman's analysis, I thought it was quite clear. Um, it's introducing history that is now in something broad that's making me think, am I missing something? So No, I, I, I don't think you are. I think it's, uh, let me put it this way. I think the technical analysis is solid and it does point out to the conclusion um, that yeah, maybe we never needed approval, even though it was sort of like nice to get when we, agreed with your approval and now that you might not we don't need it so that the, the legal analysis might be such to me and i know this is not a legal standard it just does not feel like the intent of the um of, of the of the program of what's in statute um and and this is this this goes back to history uh, one in which the intent has been slowly year by year, little by little, being eroded. And this is the last erosion, the last iteration to the erosion of the original intent, now taking races out, outside of country, uh, in which the benefits that were supposed to come down from monies on, you know, derived by the Commonwealth to Commonwealth citizens is ever more diluted. Um, so, I, you know, I think I think that's the what I what I'm struggling with. A little precedent, uh, a technical analysis that you know maybe points in the direction of once you overlay all of these different statutes, um, we have to be either recognize that we never had authority or 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 not. Even though I, I'm not quite sure of that conclusion, um, but but coming from the spirit and intent of the legislation. Uh, and multiple sections with this history uh, that is, again, one more time being eroded here. And if, if we to, did, I'm sorry, oh, just a lot, I'm sorry. Ahead, I I, yeah. Yeah. No, and we did have, um, this, this was brought before our legal team in the past, in 2015, in which there was a discussion, although not a formal written opinion, um, that we did in fact um, have the authority and it was probably wise to use it at, to make sure that what we're doing um, we're you know it, it's more than just the fiduciary responsibility I think I think the industry um, needs to be regulated as well and there's so many questions that in my mind cause me give me pause to just say 
you know, hands off now. Um, that's where I'm struggling is, yes, I've always been persuaded by the fiduciary responsibility, but secondly, um, the need to make sure they're fair, the races are fair, they're written in a way that doesn't exclude people. We've had all these issues we've had to deal with. And um, I do have pause in just saying, no, we have no role anymore in, in how these monies are spent. I see that um, we have, uh, um, Ms. Reagan is interested in chiming in. If you could just hold for a few more minutes, Ms. Reagan, um, I do wanna hear from the commissioners. It's essential for them to express their opinion in this public, um, this public context. Commissioner O'Brien, your sharp um, legal mind at work. Two, two points that maybe people who have more historical knowledge on this can, can talk about. Um, one, I just wanted to make in terms of looking at what was submitted in the packet. There was a, a representation or an implication in um, Attorney Considine's letter, I believe, um, implying that because there's a statutory reference to auditing the books and the part of the, MB and the, the association and the auditor, that somehow that is to the exclusion of anyone else. And I just wanted to make sure I, I reject that analysis. I don't think that's, in fact, the case. Now, there is an absence of direct implication of our authority in that section, but I don't think that is to the exclusion of any other basis for authority. Um, I do, I am curious, knowing the history and knowing uh, Commissioner Cameron's comments about the, the earlier analysis, am I mistaken that um, the position that was taken by the association in the first instance was they felt they did need to come and get approval. I know the representation today, um, I think by um, Mr. Ziza was that um, it's just been a courtesy all along. I'm just curious to get some clarification on that history. Did you want that from um, one of us? Yeah. No. If there's you, someone who has the, the historical knowledge, I'm just curious to know if that is in fact the case, why the change in statutory interpretation come now? From the breeder's perspective, that's not been the case. I don't know about the other parties. And, and to be fair, I would say that having you know, been a, a lawyer most of my career, I think you know, um, different guidance can come up. And even if they had said that, I'm not sure we would, I would hold them to not being able to bring forward a different analysis. I think that what the reality is, is we, is we do want to know not so much what they, everybody believed then. Or, but it's what not it, a what belief and maybe, and maybe I'm factually incorrect, but I thought it was same counsel at the time. Well, even if it wasn't the now, same. Alex is not in yet. Well, yes. respectfully, I've been a, an attorney too. And if I change a position going into court, it's usually because the facts changed where the law has changed. Right. I'm not seeing what's changed factually or legally between 15 and now that would okay. change. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, I, I um, will probably just disagree with that, but um, I did hear Mr. Z uh, Dr. Ziza, is that correct? Uh, say that they've yeah. interpreted this change. Um, to answer Commissioner O'Brien's question, was there um, a formal request? Uh, perhaps it wouldn't be Dr. Lightbound. I don't know if you have that history or not. Um, uh, Mr. Grossman, you were here. Your fellow colleague was advising the commission. Do you remember if there was affirmative request? I'm not sure if I place great weight on the precedent, but I'm, I, of course, want to hear from, um, you know, always a historical perspective. Well, here's, I'd be happy to try to, to address that. Um, a, it, it was clearly the same lawyer. It was Kevin Considine both times. Okay, thank you. Um, B, and I know that because in looking back at the packet from August of 2015, there's a letter in there from him. And I believe, and I apologize, I don't have it right in front of me, but I'm fairly certain it, it does request approval or authorization, what, I'm not sure exactly which language, to do this. Now, there's no analysis in there as to whether the statute requires it or doesn't require it or anything like that. It, but it, I think it's basically a one or two sentence request and it says, we request that you approve, you know, this, this proposal. And, so and if I heard Dr. Caesar correctly, he was suggesting that there is a consultation. I think we all acknowledge there's a consultation requirement. Um, and perhaps it was a courtesy to say request approval. Today, if I'm correct, they are saying, upon further reflection of their review of the statutory provisions that are applicable, they don't see that there's an affirmative requirement from um, that 
that's due from the commission today. And I think that that's our main question. And, um, and you know, I guess we could all say they should have asked, they should have done differently or whatever. I think that we need to put all of that aside because this commission is made up of a different body even. Um, you know, I wasn't there when that was, you know, I might have pointed out. It doesn't say that the approvals required it only as consultation because I am saying that right now. I, I would like to make sure that if we act today and we are authorizing something, um, it's either couched that it's unclear, but of course we give a blessing to it, um, or we, we come up with a decision based on a legal analysis. No, we reject what is before us and we deem ourselves you know, obligated and authorized to make a decision. And I think we need to do all of that because we are acting in this case on rights and they would have, I believe, Todd, an ability to appeal if in fact to, to the correct, um, to the correct steps and Commissioner O'Brien, I'm not sure if it would be a 30A or what it would be, but in other words, it's, there, this is our, uh, whether we act with proper authorization is a critical question. Uh, and so I can, I, can I, can I speak to that? Uh, yes. in very concrete terms. So um, there's disbursements that we make out of the Racehorse Development Fund, Community Mitigation Fund, of which we are trustees all the time. Um, and our CFO always looks to when was this authorized to make the actual disbursement by the heads of the agency, that would be the commission. Um, so we've done, we've done all of those um, you know, disbursements in the past under the auspices of being um, you know, the trustees of the funds. Um, now, I guess what, what, they're, what they're presenting here is a fundamental argument that is contrary to our past practice, which is all of those prior approvals worked sort of nice in the past, but we really didn't need them. Um, now that we are gonna be going uh, further out of the country, not just out of the state, um, which uh, again, I know this is, um, this is not a legal technical argument, uh, but it just feels to me that uh, you know the, the, the erosion of the intent of, uh, of the, and the spirit of, 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 of the whole thing to begin with. I, okay, I'm, I'm hearing that. I still haven't heard from our fellow Commissioner Stevens. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have any insights to help us with respect to history? And, and, uh, and then Commissioner O'Brien, Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Not, not much to offer different uh, than what Commissioner Zuniga or my colleague Commissioner Cameron has pointed out in terms of uh, precedent, um, but obviously uh, certainly subscribe to the, the position that it's, you know, it's trustees of this fund and making, you know, having some fiduciary responsibility and oversight of the fund is important. Um, I, I guess I'm still curious as to uh, this kind of pause or reflection that there needed to be some change in either the author authorizations that we'd given previously or uh, kind of the, the this moment in time where we're being prescribed to ask or being asked to prescribe a, a, a different set of rules. The different set of rules being um, because it's out of the country is that what we're getting at? Is that um, out, of, out of the country or at other tracks? You know, it, it, okay. yeah. All right. Come, um, uh, before we go on, uh, Attorney Grossman, this is I'm hearing, um, with all due respect to my, uh, my commissioner, fellow commissioner Zuniga, um, the words legal and technical um, being inserted back and forth. Um, I, I will, um, I would like to adhere to what's legal. Uh, so if uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for further insight before we, we take any action on this as to uh, an affirmative obligation on our part to, to um, act on it. And of course, um, I'm not in any way passing on the substantive request here. I'm just asking about the, the you know, not passing judgment on the fiduciary duties that we have. I'm not passing judgment on their request. I just am wondering about the authorization. 
Well, I think the one thing that is clear to me is that I think everyone ultimately wants the same thing, which is to ensure that these funds are uh, expended wisely um, and for the proper purpose. Uh, that is ultimately to promote and develop and encourage thoroughbred breeding in the Commonwealth. For that, there can be no dispute. The question is uh, that was posed to me was whether what the legal authority um, or how far it extends for the commission's review of the expenditure of these funds. And under paragraph G, which I, I do believe is the only section that really applies to this, I don't see any clear express authorization um, that is required by the breeders prior to making expenditures. Now, they are certainly required to make expenditures consistent with the language of the statute. They're not allowed to just expend it any way they want. Um, but um, there's, there's the, most of it seems clear to me that only a consultation of the chair of the Racing Commission, and now the Gaming Commission, is required. There is that one piece of the statute that opens the door to a potential approval, and that's where uh, the language says that the commission, uh, or that they have to be, uh, that the race has to be at a licensed pari mutual race meeting authorized by the state racing commission. And if, um, if that is construed to mean that the authorization has to be specific to an out of state track, um, that would be the one area that I think it would be um, certainly open under the statute for the commission to decide that it needs to uh, to express. And, and that clause was in the fourth paragraph where it's further. It's a little further down. It's the second but paragraph. It, says for, it starts with further. So you, you assumed that that meant additionally as a separate. Well, that, that's the way I read it. Um, you know, obviously, different uh, interpretations can be assigned and um, but that, that's how I would construe the word further and if that's the case um, and by the way I think that was presumably the interpretation though it somewhat went unsaid in the past that um, allowed the commission to weigh in on uh, these decisions um, which is why I've never in any way opined that past practice was in any way inappropriate or impermissible or anything like that. Um, but if the question is, does the commission have clear authority to approve, um, pre-approve of these expenditures, I believe the answer is no. There is no clear authority for that. You can make the case as commissioners Zuniga and O'Brien and others have pointed out through a fiduciary duty that may overlay this, um, or even a, an interpretation of parts of this statute. But um, just reading the plain language, it seems to me that there's no clear authority um, to pre-approve expenditures. Yeah, this is, this is the crossover again of multiple statutes and um, different modifications wherein um, on, on 23K, um, there, is, there is section 4N, I forget exactly which one, that unequivocally says uh, that uh, the broad and power of the commission will be interpreted as, as broad as necessary to carry out uh, the intent of the law. Um, you know, I, 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 there's, there's nothing like that on 128, I suppose, um, which, um, which then, has us in this um, in this place to begin with. Uh, Karen, I'm not sure if you're if you, I, I don't see your face, but I'm just wondering: um, Do you have a suggestion procedurally where we should con where we should proceed? Um, because it doesn't look as though we have necessarily a consensus yeah. on a legal interpretation. I think I um, commend uh, uh, Attorney Grossman. I thought he did a very nice job on his legal analysis, he's had also briefed me along the way on this matter. Um, I can't say that I um, understand all of the uh, 
fully. Uh, I'm not sure if any lawyer who even specializes in horse racing, and I'm looking at Ms. Reagan, would say everything is clear. I've dealt with a lot of those statutes in my time, and it would be dangerous to say anything is clear. Right. But um, I do appreciate what uh, the, the, the advice that we're hearing from um, our interim general counsel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, um, and given that, I, I would not recommend that we would be able to move ahead today um, without further legal guidance to say that we're authorized to move ahead. Um, and I, I see Commissioner O'Brien kind of nodding her head. Yeah. That doesn't mean that this can't be reviewed, but two, two suggestions for us to think about. We could ask um, you know, uh, our interim general counsel to go back and investigate the history further. Um, but I'm not sure what that leaves for our, our colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Ziza and, and, and uh, the, the horse racing community, because I suspect that they're that um, you know they are, are they sought they sought consultation with us and guidance with us today from us. Yes. So, uh, well, Madam Chair, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, let, let me suggest that you know no no action here is what I would argue is what what the MTBA uh, is asking for. Um, so the question becomes: the next time that uh, our CFO. Uh, is asked to transfer funds from the Racehorse Development Fund, X funds to to such account, the breeder's account. Um, are we going to do that just because they told us? Well, Commissioner Zuniga, nobody does anything just because they told us. So that's what well, we're struggling with. I mean, I understand okay. exactly what you're saying, and I and I understand that that would put um, uh, Mr. Lennon in, in a difficult situation. So we are trying to get at the heart. Just okay. because, but with that said, we don't want to ever, because we're in a position of power, to assume that we have that power unless it's clear. And so that's what I'm struggling with today. Well, clearly everybody is. And, um, well, I mean, that's what I'm just saying, I speak for myself, yeah. Right. Yep. So I, I'm inclined to agree with you, Madam Chair. I'd like, you know, my, my two questions as we're listening to this were the, uh, time frame do we have is there the opportunity to go back and I don't know if there's some further information or anything that can help guide that because that is the threshold question and even with the, the legal guidance and and Todd did a great job on that memo that there's still that that tension there on, on um, you know within the Commission trying to figure out what to do it's not as if the five of you are really coming to an easy conclusion so substantively if there is some time I just don't know what that next uh, piece of information would necessarily be that might change the outcome. But I, I'm uncomfortable with uh, the commission uh, not having a consensus on their authority there. That's, that's a tough position to be in, and it may be better to, uh, to take a break and, and get into another discussion with some additional information. Can we just see, uh, Dr. Leibel, how does that leave our, our fellow um, the, the folks here on the horse racing? And I understand, I appreciate fully Commissioner Zuniga saying that that's what they want, but I suspect that if they thought for an instant that it would be an interpretation from the commission that they weren't authorized to proceed because of that, because of course, Mr. Lennon would not release the funds, um, where does that leave them and how much time do we need to turn this around? You know, in the event that they, that they need, they do need affirmative action from us. Yeah. Um Obviously, they'd like to run as soon as they um, can, um, and but um, they still uh, don't have, um, you know, races written or um, you know um, ideas on how much money they'll be spending or anything like that. Um, so, um, if we, that's we do have, Alex. Um, you know, we we had we had some proposed plans to run three weeks ago, which we've postponed, um, and now in securing a second track. We also have uh, some proposed plans to run on the 16th and 17th of July. Um, but, you know, we can't, we can't uh, publicize any of these until we got this matter clear first. So to answer um, the, some of the other commissioners' questions, the reason we did this is because we wanted to come and go through the channels that was suggested 
um, and be able to address this point because we need flexibility um, with situations on the ground different. We do not have Suffolk Downs this year um, and we, we, need to, uh, we need to be a bit more nimble in the ability to run races given the stock that we have. So, you know, Alex and I have spoken uh, and Alex and multiple members of the board have had great conversations in the last three or four months in consulting and talking about ideas and whatnot. And, 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 and so that's, that's, that's the route we've chosen. And so what we're hoping today, uh, to be frank, is simply to say, um, looking at the, what you've done in the past, um, looking at where the money has come uh, and gone, and most of it is to, back to Massachusetts, um, just because the track is an, an hour away from the track that we have been running at for five years does not mean that we're getting away from the spirit of the law because the same yeah. back horses and, are, and breeders are running in those races. The money okay. is back. Okay. Can, I, can, I, can I offer a solution? Sure. Would we, could I offer a solution, Mr. Uh, Dr. Cesa, if from this perspective, I'm not sure where my fellow commissioners feel about um, authorizing, um, if, if uh, assuming that we were required to authorize um, the race in, in Canada, I'm not sure. If there might be a consensus that, um, that they would be okay with it, if we were to move on it and say, but that's not in any way um, acknowledging an affirmative uh, uh, authorization from us. Um, but if, if I, I, Gail, if you can help me, do you, are you, would, if no, you I, were required, would you be likely to support it? I, I would not at this okay. point because I get back to the point about we don't have enough information. For example, in Canada right now, there's a two week quarantine, which means none of our trainers from our country or jockeys would be allowed to go there and race. So those are the things we haven't even gotten into yet, which give, which give me pause. And by the way, Mr. Zizer, I, I, I checked that out from an official source yesterday that the two week quarantine is in place right now up through August. Um, you know, the prime minister just, just reauthorized that quarantine. So there's many, many issues talking about money coming to the Commonwealth. Well, there's jockeys and trainers. Um, just to clarify, yes. group of races would be in Ohio, and well, there is no, there is no. But, but we have there, a proposal in front of us from um, from Canada, correct? No, no. My pro our proposal states both racetracks. Yeah, but is doesn't there, have any information about when, <laughs> under what circumstances, who would who would write the race. We just don't right, have that information, Mr. Z. Because we're not asking you to approve the specifics of a program. So, that's so, well, so, so thank that's you, Dr. Zizer. So that's, that's exactly where we're left. Yes. So um, Karen, help me out in terms of process. Well, uh, I, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Zuniga, just if we could just hear from Karen and then we'll go back to all of us. Just I mean, I, I'm, I'm just hearing all of this and it's, it's very challenging. I mean, one brief suggestion, because I know we have other agenda items. If maybe you want to move on to the other agenda items, let me speak with Alex and Todd to see if we can have some kind of suggested solve for the commission might be an option. Um, the other option would be to, to uh, bump this for to another meeting and regroup in another meeting with the message that we are not uh, making a determination or any kind of authorization. Um, I, I like I like the first. Um, okay. And if you will allow me to, because I I do think it is now 1:36, and I know that that means that that we could be getting some of our fellow commissioners could be getting hungry. I'd like to pause this discussion. We have a um, a lunch break after a brief announcement that I'll make. Um, that we have a lunch break. We will return to our agenda. If there can be immediate resolution or recommendation on this topic, that will be helpful. If not, we will continue on our other items, allowing for further time for our team to um, regroup and see if we can take action on that. And to everybody, I appreciate your patience. How does that, I, want, I don't want everyone to go on lunch break yet because I have one announcement. Um, how does that seem? Does that, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, does that work? Yeah, well, just from a logistics point of view, Attorney Grossman, I believe, um, unless Carrie's on the line and can pitch hit for him, he has one of the agenda items that we'd be moving on to. And so if the point is to free him up 
to be able oh, to well participate. that's all right i i i understand that no oh. but we're going to we're going to pause for lunch and maybe they can get some reconciliation i understand that he will also be busy but... i just didn't know if you wanted to get through that item and then break because then he'd be free to oh. not be impeded at all with oh actually yeah um, i think uh ms teresa will covered? be covering that anyway okay. yes yeah okay. okay. oh, oh good good, good. Okay. Yeah. okay excellent so i don't know if this was part of your announcement but um one of the items for the that come later, uh, our CFO has a hard stop uh, that has advised us at two o'clock, and but it's I, a budget. I, I had I, not heard that he has a hard stop at two o'clock. I did. I did hear about it. I meant to uh, mention that earlier, uh, but it's something that I can take uh, myself. Uh, if there's any questions for that, because uh, it's one thirty-seven. Um, I actually think that um, a break will do us all good. I think everybody should. Um, have something to eat and something to drink. It's been already a long morning. With that, but I do have some excellent news. Um, before we break, um, I do want to point out that the governor, I've learned during the course of this meeting, that the governor has delegated the responsibility for standards on, on managing COVID-19 for casinos, racing, and simulcasting to the Massachusetts Gaming Commission. So this means that the standards that we have adopted um, over the course of our last several weeks of the hard work of all the team um, will be the standards for casino racing and simulcasting. That means that those industries won't expect any further specific industry um, related standards out of the um, Baker Polito administration. So that's good news that um, folks can proceed. And as we heard earlier, um, uh, phase three was announced right during our, our, our earlier break to begin on, on, on July um, uh, 6. Perhaps, Karen, you'll be able to learn what our licensees might be doing now um, over this lunch break, and, and maybe we could even get an update on that, how the, the formal announcement around July 6 will impact our licensees. Of course, what we are hearing is that that delegation has been made to to us, of course, that means we have all talked about this, that the standards are dynamic, that they will continue to be adjusted, hopefully to give you know, relief as public health um, uh, conditions trend in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right direction for all of us. And we will continue to meet and approve um, reforms to those guide, guidelines, including the ones that we passed today. So I think that that's good news. Um, I understand that the governor's order on this matter will be um, made public later this afternoon and, and, and posted accordingly. So we can look for that. It may in fact be posted by the time we reconvene from our lunch and our, our much needed break on a, on a difficult subject matter. You know, it's, it, is, um, it is a reflection of the fact that this is an, an older piece of legislation with lots of pieces. And so, um, you know, I, I am fully appreciative of how difficult this, um, this is. So are there any questions on that brief announcement? I don't have many more details. I just wanted to share that. Okay, we're all set then. Now, um, I, I always look for my timekeeper. Commissioner O'Brien, what do you think? It's 1.40. Um, for lunch, Oh, uh, two confessions. I kind of ate at the last break, so you might want to ask <laughs> for Zuniga. <laughs> I love that. So I think what he needs is what's going to what's going to matter. Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, Twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. Thirty. You know. It's sufficient. 30. Then okay, we reconvene at two. Okay. And and I'm sorry about um, Mr. Lennon. I did not hear that we might have considered bringing um, the agenda up in a different format. All right. Well, Thank you. well, I knew I knew we had a number of guests for this topic, and that, that they had been waiting. So, um, anyway, I, I think we're we're okay. Yeah, and I had sent that with my materials on Tuesday, the notification that I had a two o'clock hard stop. Yeah. Well, it, things are what they are. So we'll 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 manage, and I can take any topics on budget. I sent you my notes, Enrique. Yep. Thank you. Anything else anybody wants to add? All right, so we will reconvene at two o'clock. Thank you so much. Reconvening officially, meeting uh, number 311. Thank you everyone for your patience. It's um, been quite a um, productive morning with the adoption of our 
uh, horse racing and simulcasting uh, standards for COVID-19. We had a rigorous conversation about a matter before us um, with respect to the Thoroughbred Breeders Association. <clears throat> Karen, I'm, I'm not sure if, I, I know you were doing some homework on the matter where we left off. Would you um, advise that we uh, go forward now on the next matter? Uh, Commissioner O'Brien pointed out that it does involve Mr. Grossman, but perhaps Carrie is going to be covering it. Yes, they, can, can you hear me, Madam Chair? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I don't know if you can hear me or see me. I've, I've somehow minimized you, and you're about this big right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're probably, still working on it. For you. Yeah, and just uh, got uh, off of a call with uh, Todd and Alex. We're still trying to work some things out. There's a couple of ideas. What would okay. be helpful is if we could go forward with the agenda. When I can step out, I'll step out and see if I can uh, help with some kind of resolution there. Okay, and but in my right that if we proceed on to then just hold on five four B, excuse me, move to five. And even though Mr. Grossman's name is attached, we have our very own Carrie Troisi to help us. Right, and I, I'm I'm familiar with that as well. And I believe I, I can't see from my screen, but I think uh, Mr. Curtis might be on the the, the uh, meeting as well. He's been very he, helpful with this. He's here, um, Bill. Um, I know you'll wonderful. Him in. He's not showing his. His face, yeah, but I'm sure he'll join us. Okay. Okay. And there we go. You all read there your we meeting. go, Mr. Curtis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All righty, uh, Carrie, why don't you start? Sure. Uh, so good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, let me just move this screen. Uh, all right. Um, so in your packet, you have a draft amended regulation, uh, 205 CMR 134.03. Um, this existing regulation allows the gaming licensees to temporarily bring employees from sister properties to Massachusetts to assist with the uh, casino's pre-opening phase and for 30 days after the issuance of an operation certificate without, without requiring that those individuals be licensed or registered. Uh, it also allows those individuals to assist at the gaming establishment for up to 60 days and that time period, uh, that extension can be granted upon submission by a licensee of a written explanation as to the need and duration. So that's the existing regulation. Um, the amendment uh, that you have in your packet would add language to include the same allowance following a period of suspension of operations. So it would allow the licensees to temporarily bring um, their employees from sister properties to Massachusetts um, currently to assist with the reopening here without requiring that they be licensed. Uh, and that would be for a period of um, up to 60 days. Um, and again, it would allow for that extension if there's a submission uh, explaining the need. So it essentially acts as a temporary reciprocity. Um, there was some discussion, I know, early on about potentially creating a variance process. Um, but instead, uh, we've codified this here in a regulation to future proof the issue in the event that there's any future suspension of operations that we would need to use this same function. Um, I do want to note also, and I know you all talked about this a bit earlier, that there is currently an advisory in effect from the governor that individuals coming into Massachusetts from a number of other states are recommended to self-quarantine for 14 days. Um, that advisory was amended on Tuesday to exempt all of the New England states along with uh, New York and New Jersey. So um, we're looking to promulgate this regulation by emergency to get it into effect right away, and then we would begin the standard promulgation process um, to formalize that over the next few months. Uh, so are there any questions on this regulation? Commissioners? Commissioner Senator, are you leaning in? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Just uh, as a reminder, um, we had this provision when uh, initially, uh, when, uh, you know, anticipating the, the original opening of of casinos, um, just point me or, or, or speak in general terms to at the time we only envisioned one opening and not uh, reopening in like in this case, right? And hence the need to change the original regulation. Exactly, the regulation only speaks to the initial opening phase or the pre-opening phase or the period right after the issuance of the operation certificate. So it doesn't account for the situation that we're in right now. Yeah, no, I, I think it's very reasonable, you know, when we 
open the casinos. There was no expectation that they closed being a 24 seven operation. But of course, this is unprecedented set of circumstances. Other questions for Carrie? And Carrie, you may not be the person to answer this, but um, I think a question that may come into people's minds is because they've already opened once and they're simply reopening, why they bring people in from sister properties rather than bring mass employees back online. Um, I believe I've heard some um, explanation for why that is, but I think that might be worth mentioning. I don't know if that's something Bill can speak to. I can speak to it, Carrie. Um, Commissioner O'Ryan, um, they're looking for some of the folks that have a little bit more expertise in, in reopening. Um, some of the folks could be new, um, with a, a rehire in the last six months or initial hire in, in the last year, and they weren't involved in the initial um, opening. So um, with MGM, they're looking for between five and eight folks, a um, few people for the, the cage, um, a couple of people for food and beverage, um, and a few people in marketing as well. Um, Plain Ridge, um, it's a possibility that there will be um, slot people only. Um, they do have some folks that are going to um, be working with the IT department, but they're never gonna come on property. They're going to remote in. So um, I really don't have a concern with those folks um, because they're not actually gonna be on the property. They're only gonna be remoting in, but still they would need a license. So that's why we were looking for this, um, this adjustment on the reg because it would help them out tremendously. And they're pretty lean on their IT department. So to get where they need to be, they need some folks to help out. And I assume some part of this also has to do with reconfigurations potentially based on the COVID-19 procedures we've put in place? Correct, correct. Okay. So just to follow up in terms of <coughs> uh, Commissioner O'Brien's question, um, <coughs> you've indicated that they're providing specific expertise they are, would not in any way be replacing um, jobs that we would want Massachusetts residents to have, correct? Correct, you are correct. And they will supply us with a list of the individuals that they're going to be bringing on the property, um, where they're licensed, their license number, and then there has to be an, an attestation from a key employee. Um, most likely it will be from the compliance officer that will submit all that information to us and um, it will be recorded with that property. Mr. Cameron, do you have questions for uh, Carrie? Oh, did she freeze? I just, I just tried to unmute. Uh, I do not have questions. I think this was explained very well and uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And I did get a chance to ask Commissioner O'Brien's question um, in a briefing that, that um, you know, what about why are these folks coming in and are they displacing anyone? And I was assured of the same thing that Mr. Curtis just uh, responded to. Commissioner Stebbins, any questions for Carrie? Yeah, just a, just a quick question. I'm assuming from um, Director Curtis's response that uh, this likely won't apply to Encore Boston Harbor because of his uh, attorney, Therese, who pointed out there'd be the quarantine time since those folks would be coming in from outside of New England. Um, Commissioner Stebbins, um, I did touch base with the folks at um, Encore Boston Harbor and um, they had no desire to bring in uh, folks from another property, they said. They said that their folks could handle um, what they need to do to reopen. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So the states are New England, New York, and New Jersey, <clears throat> correct? Yes. Thank you. Any further questions, Commissioner uh, Stunica, you're all set? Okay. So um, we need to take action on this today for the emergency regulation process. Uh, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Commissioner. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the Small Business Impact Statement for 205 CMR 134.03 Gaming Service Employees as included in the Commissioner's Packet. Second that. For the questions? Okay. Commissioner Cameron. That was a silent eye, but I, I could read those lips. 
Sorry, aye. <laughs> Commissioner Bryan. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And Commissioner Kim. Uh, Stebbins, sorry. Aye. And I vote yes. Uh, Shara, thank you. Further? Uh, and Chair, I further move the Commission adopt the version of 205 CMR 134.03 Gaming Service Employees as included in the Commissioner's packet by emergency and authorize staff to take all steps necessary to begin the regulation promulgation process. Second. Any, thank you, Commissioner. Any further questions on the substance? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Going out of order. Thank you. <laughs> Making and sure I we're. Vote yes. <laughs> I vote yes. My order is always uh, how we sat and physically um, uh, when we're in our big room. Five zero. Thank you, Shara. And good work, Carrie, and, and, and thank uh, Todd. I, I know that he's being productive on the other end, but we thank you for that work, and Shara, too, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and Bill. Thanks, Bill, Beth. too. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Thanks so much. All righty. All right. Well, I feel bad. Um, that I didn't note um, a request to move around our agenda, but um, Commissioner Zuniga, if you're comfortable, um, we're moving on now to item number six, Finance and Accounting Division. I know the last we left, we were waiting for some, uh, any public comments that we would have, and I'll have you move forward. The team is typically um, Derek Lennon, CFAO. I see Agnes, uh, Doug, um, and, uh, and you, Commissioner Zuniga, if you want to lead this. I'd be happy to, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, as you mentioned, um, if there are questions that I cannot answer, um, uh, which is entirely possible, Doug O'Donnell or Agnes Polio might are available to um, uh, if, uh, if that's the case, if needed. Um, so we are essentially here to revisit the budget that we presented for fiscal year 21 back in June 18. Um, we had initially recommended a collective budget of uh, $39.7 million comprised of uh, the following um, items. Um, $32.25 million for the regulatory and statutorily required costs of the Gaming Control Fund. Uh, $2.68 million for the Racing and Oversight and Development Fund. Racing Oversight and Development Fund, I'm sorry. Um, we had recommended for the first time, and I'll speak to uh, a particular change in this area, $170,000 in funding coming from the Community Mitigation Fund. This was the first time we recommended this spending, administrative funds from this, from this fund. And $4.62 million for the Public Health Trust Funds for the Office of Research and Responsible Gaming. This, the overall recommendation funded 93 FTEs and six contract positions across all the different programs, gaming, racing, etc. cetera. Uh, at that meeting, the meeting in June, uh, we committed as we usually do to posting the budget for public comment, uh, having a meeting to discuss the merits of charging some administrative costs to the community mitigation fund, and identifying a proposal for the slot fee and the annual assessment for the gaming control fund given the current extraordinary circumstances of, uh, of the COVID-19. Um, the staff put, put up the, the budget for uh, public comment. They report that we received uh, no comments other than uh, the, the, the usual back and forth and consultation with licensees. Um, we also had a meeting uh, and that, that staff um, on the community mitigation fund um, based on, uh, on that uh, meeting, there was a lot of robust discussion and they are no longer recommending funding 170,000 from that fund uh, 
come to pay for administrative costs of the commission at this time. Instead, staff plans on taking the next uh, six to nine months to go through uh, developing and working with uh, the commission to adopt regulations for the community mitigation fund. Uh, we think, or they think this is a better process, one that would allow uh, more robust public input, input from the local community mitigation fund groups, as well as having a transparent process for the reasoning and explanation of how and why to charge off grants, uh, grant administration costs to this fund. Um, I should note that um, the administration of this fund is, um, is taking more and more of staff time and it's, it's a good discussion to have in this fashion. Uh, further, staff contacted licensees in the three gaming sites and asked for uh, their anticipated opening slot machine counts, given these um, the, the requirements in terms of guidance about social distancing, uh, as well as the gaming position counts for slots and table games. We have not yet voted to approve anything on this topic in terms of number of gaming positions. Um, we are still under um, guidance about uh, reopening uh, and occupancy and things like that. So we might need to, um, to make some adjustment in this, this topic relative to gaming positions because after all, that is how our total costs are then prorated among the three different licensees. However, we, de we do need funding to begin uh, the fiscal year in a proportional way. So we have asked, or staff has asked, uh, for the best estimates, uh, even count of gaming positions uh, with information that they have currently available. So we uh, plan on updating those figures as the facilities can, uh, um, begin to reopen. So, um, I, there's a table on page nine of the memorandum, including the packet that breaks out the counts by operator. Um, Appendix A uses the slot machine counts projected for opening and prorates the costs for 51 weeks, um, which is the currently projected opening date uh, for phase three. Again, we'll modify if necessary. Uh, staff is also recommending that we bill licenses, licensees rather, for the first quarter of the slot fee in the assessment right away and ask for payment to be expedited and then billed monthly beginning in August. This would allow us to have um, cash uh, to continue our meeting our commitments. We're recommending that the first quarterly installment uh, to work with also our partners at the Attorney General's office and the ABCC and allow for them to have funding or in other words a quarter of funding for their operations as well. Um, so just to summarize some of the staff uh, work, um, the, the, there was a, a two-week discussion that resulted in still the recommendation of 39.7 million as a collective budget the same funding of 93 FTEs plus six contract positions. Uh, the composition of uh, that, that is the 170,000 uh, that was proposed to be funded from the community mitigation fund is now shifted back to the gaming control fund. Uh, and that brings uh, the assessment figure from 32.25 million to 32.42 million. Uh, racing and the Public Health Trust Fund uh, funding remain the same. And the slot fees for facilities uh, being an approximate of 2 million and an assessment of 20, that leaves with an assessment of 29.67 million for the gaming control fund of the year. So, um, Given the updates and the additional time to review um, the, the 
budget recommendations. I can pause now and see if any commissioners have any questions or comments. Commissioner Stebbins, were you, yeah. were you leaning in? I was, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to speak to the point and I want to take an opportunity to thank uh, our legal staff as well as our finance team and our CFAO with respect to the community mitigation fund um, allocation toward this year's budget. Uh, we had a, as Commissioner Zuniga said, it was a very robust conversation and discussion. Um, you know, some of the concerns that I had were the fact that uh, there will be certainly less funds available next year for the community mitigation fund, knowing that it's based on the previous calendar year and we obviously missed out on some months as well as are likely going to reopen with uh, diminished capacity of our, our gaming licensees. Um, so it was helpful for me to get an update on the status of the fund. Um, we talked about how we can engage our stakeholders, the local community mitigation advisory committees, the subcommittee to get their in input. And, uh, you know, this recommendation of going through a regulatory process, I think will help uh, meet all of those goals of engaging everybody who's involved in the process. Um, we know the fund is, um, has lots of, several years of grants now out. Um, I agree with Commissioner Zuniga. I think it's a fine time to look at adequate staffing for the program and making sure that we're staying on top of awards that we've made and how those awards have been spent. Um, so I think it's a, it is a good time to have a conversation after going through this process as to adequate staffing to adequately monitor the program. Um, and I would, I would also add that, um, uh, you know, related to this, we have a good policy discussion heading into the fall and the guidelines for next year that we give some consideration to taking some previously uh, approved awards back if they have not been drawn down yet um, and having a chance to maybe set some guidelines for that as part of the regulations, um, as well as make some final determinations on uh, reserve grants that have been awarded. These were awarded several years ago to give hosts and surrounding communities a chance to kind of study some impacts. Some of those monies haven't been used yet. And again, as we look ahead to next year, which might be really tight, uh, I think it's worthy of us to have a policy discussion as to whether we give some of those communities one more time to use those funds or consider again, pulling them back to uh, to address and meet other needs. But uh, again, just to thank staff and uh, CFAO Lennon, who uh, I think drove the idea of coming up with a regulatory process so that we can uh, iron out all the details for, for using the CMF money for administrative costs. Other comments, questions? Um, <clears throat> substantive questions, I know that we are, we feel that you know, this is nearing an end of a discussion, but we have this a big decision and a big discussion. I have a one question that I'll, I'll add in now, but that doesn't mean it needs to be the last question. Um, I'm pleased with the um, resolution on the community mitigation fund. I too probably would have been uncomfortable, uh, given perhaps the impact it would have been on our, our communities to to go forward and I think the solution of the regulatory scheme is an excellent one so I'm really very pleased with that. I had raised a question for um, uh, Mr. Lennon um, about funding available to um, <clears throat> take care of some salary needs that are likely to have come um, about because we have had a couple of key interim positions. We also had a turnover. And I am wondering um, how that's being managed. I, I, I know that it says cut funding, the exposure of cut funding of backfills for 10 FTEs. And I'm wondering if we have reserved some flexibility to to address some of those needs. I just don't know what our balance is to address that. 
Well, we we retain the flexibility at any at any time. In the aggregate, uh, the the budget um, makes assumption as to how um, how long it's going to take us to uh, backfill some of those uh, positions. Um, if one slides further, you know, earlier and another one later, we may end up, you know, in a similar uh, situation. Um, and um, you know, remember that we come back quarterly, but of course, uh, more frequent, more frequently if necessary, to approve any kind of budget uh, reduction. Uh, sorry, revision, uh, if necessary. Um, I think this is, you know, uh, in, in the situation that we were and we are, um, this is a an overall good recommendation, uh, and we can we can make modifications as, as we need to, uh, as we as 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 the, as the year um, um, begins to come to fruition. Uh, one along those lines, by the way, um, there is the 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 one of the big. Um, uh, one of the most immediate things to relook at this might be just that proration of um, of, um, of costs across the three different licensees. They, this is only um, uh, based on, and this is the only thing that we can base it on, their best estimate at the time that they were consulted uh, on a week ago of gaming positions. Uh, you remember perhaps that we look at the proration of those gaming positions twice a year in practice before because there was not a lot of change in gaming positions. Uh, but it is possible that there will be a very different dynamic this year as they as the properties begin to reopen and those position numbers change. Um, you know, in a in a in a in a way that is not just rounding error. So we'll we'll likely come back and adjust those numbers, you know, among the and, and have a discussion in a, in a public meeting, if necessary. And that is what I was alluding to in, in my remarks about um, looking at page nine of that memorandum and breaking those counts by the different operator. This is a very this is a slightly different proration than before. Because you can see in that um, in that table um, the what they had before and what they are uh, in terms of gaming positions, and what they are now um, at least estimating will be um, at least initially. Actually, this table doesn't show the existing gaming positions, uh, but you might remember that uh, Penn is you know has the 1250 uh, cap um, Ancor um, you know has north of um, um, 2000 machines and and well over a hundred tables um, that are multiple positions that's not the case now of course um, and MGM has uh, a, a lot more machines than what they are now estimating to be operational at the beginning of the opening um, at least according to the state. I think that you answered my question, Commissioner Zuniga. <laughs> I think what I heard you say is, and I'm doing this in part for even, um, you know, interim executive director is in a little bit of a, a difficult position because she is interim. But if, um, as, as she does her work, there may be some needs that are operationally um, necessary and I just want to make sure that if that I want to I guess I want to make sure that I'm, I haven't misunderstood there isn't a hiring freeze per se that's not pre built into the um, the uh, overall budget correct in other words for instance we have a legal department that is we have an interim general counsel and then we have one down. There hasn't been a decision among all of us on a freeze, it, but um, would the executive director have some authority under the budget or would she have to come back to us is what I'm guessing is there's some operational um, budgeting for us either, you know, shifting in positions internally so therefore a salary might increase is there that kind of flexibility or are you saying 
we would come back and revisit? I'm suggesting we would come back. This is a tight budget in that regard. I, I don't know if um, Agnes can help me out on, on, on some of the assumptions, some of the specific assumptions with certain positions, but we're not assuming that we're backfilling right away. And okay, I think that's, that, and I just want to be clear because uh, you know that's just something we need to understand yes. maybe precisely. Thank you. That, yeah, no, and in, in the aggregate, and I'll, 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 I'll ask uh, Agnes to, to chime in in a minute, but um, in reality, there's going to be a ramp up like in every hiring. Um, you know, we have, we have, when, when this COVID 19 started, we, we paused all of those efforts. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and admittedly, they were at different stages. Um, so whatever ramp up uh, happens this is partly assumed here. The other thing is, you know, people have to go through background checks and whatnot, and that also uh, takes uh, a little bit of time. And, and um, we're effectively estimating that some of these positions come back, but not for the full year. Now in the aggregate, you know, we might be okay, depending on if we uh, end up um, we're hiring one person first, uh, then another position, and that may balance out, et cetera. Uh, but maybe I should just turn it over to Agnes and, 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 and see what she can tell us that may be more specific than this. Thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. One of the assumptions that we made was that it was gonna be on a six month um, basis where most of these backfills would not occur for six months. So that was a, a majority of the savings. Um, we will then, you know, as Commissioner Zuniga said, it would be an issue of timing, of going through the background checks and all of that, those savings, given how long this um, pandemic is going forward, whether or not various positions come back at all. Um, some of them may, but many of them will, some may not, and then um, that, that was what the savings were based on. Was and this would be six, six months from what date, Agnes, please? From July 1st. Oh, well, that's, that's, a, that's a long period. Right, but with many of the positions, it's, it's a matter of posting and timing and getting the applicants in, getting the, the, um, getting the interviews done, them going through the background checks and all of that. So it, it, it can take up to that period of time for many of these things. And, and that may be a long time for a couple of positions. It's not necessarily in the aggregate, and that's been my point for others, right. given that we are now, as Agnes says, um, you know, we should look at uh, some of those vacancies uh, altogether um, and, uh, and, and think about holding up for a period that is longer than six months. In the, in the, on the average, I think we come okay. And if, it do, if we don't, uh, we can come back and approve a budget adjustment. Also, at mid at mid year, you would also be reviewing the number of positions um, that are available to assess against, so that 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 may be an offset to any positions you filled prior to the six month period. The estimate on those on the savings. So if we wanted to build in some um, padding there, Commissioner Zuniga, so we wouldn't have to come back, is there any flexibility uh, that we have to say that, you know, six to assume six months from August, from July 1 through the end of the, of the calendar year is too long uh, um, to accommodate the needs of certain departments? Currently, and, right now, Chair, is that the um, licensees have at, have requested that we and they have done this in the past and it's not anything new this year. They have requested that we not um, go or on the higher side of things. They if we need to go back and at, and increase their assessments, they're more willing to do that as opposed to having that built in up front. And especially this year, where things were so tight with uh, with everyone. That was was the agreed upon um, strategy was that we would go back to them at a later date if we needed to to increase the assessment. 
Yeah, and, and and I think that's 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 a good um, that's a that's a reasonable practice to be responsive to. Again, we can always come back uh, at, a, at any meeting in the future and, and decide. That I'm wondering if we can do it right now. Um, I guess you're saying we have to go to the licensees first with a proposal about. Um, no, I meeting. think this, this, say, this, this, this is all balancing, uh, you know, the prior discussions that we've had about okay. recognizing that this is a difficult time in terms of cash flow for licensees. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and billing what is, what we believe is absolutely necessary uh, without having to make, uh, you know, um, cuts in existing, um, in existing costs. Um, Sort of like the, the the easiest in my view, and I, I don't I don't I shouldn't say this. Uh, put it in, the, in those terms. Uh, so can I ask also the question? One thing that we where we we did discuss this earlier, where we have an in, interims and we have um, needs that have been um, some you know all of us, and I don't say for the commissioners. I'm talking about all of us, the executive team, and all of the staff, and the whole team, not the commissioners. Um, have stepped up to the plate because there have been um, uh, either resignations or there's been interims. And so everybody has had to pull an, a, a, um, a lot of weight. And in addition to what all the complications that COVID-19 raised, I, I kind of liken it to you all have done your 100% of your job that we would do on a daily basis without missing a beat. And then on top of it, COVID-19 introduced a lot, a lot of more work, you know, particularly around reopening and also the safety of our own employees. So we had talked about how do you manage that um, in terms of salaries and positions, et cetera. And what I'm hearing, I just want to make sure I'm hearing accurately that right now there isn't any little slush fund or anywhere that addresses that issue has not been addressed in the current proposal. And we would have to go back to the licensees with something more specific. Um, and to to get their buy in and then we come back to a, a commission vote. Uh, let me <clears throat> let me clarify a couple of things. Um, um, we, we never have a contingency or a slush fund in, in the budgets. Okay. And um, we, we, we make the best assumptions that we think are reasonable okay. for, for the necessary costs and, and we build them and they are required to pay, to pay. Okay. We, do, do, we do the consultation process once a year uh, in anticipation and, and we've done it uh, this year as well uh, and in anticipation of the, of the fiscal year, um, we go through this process, you know, and we have done that for, for, for several years. In which right, we, and I presume all the directors have been informed of this and all uh, the, and, uh, absolutely, and Karen, absolutely. and Karen, and um, all right. Absolutely, and uh, yeah. you know. No, I just I think, wanted everybody to understand the implications of this, what it means for us in terms of staffing. Yeah, no, the, tra the, the trade-off is uh, that we continue to, um, to operate, um, without making um, you know painful cuts to existing. Uh, existing oh, I know. I, I you you yeah. I know we don't want any painful cuts. I just am trying um, to also make sure that um, you know we have a, a legal staff that's down to lawyers. And so yes. what I'm hearing is right now there's no there's not an opportunity to perhaps um, address that need if Todd were to go forward with respect to a third. I want everybody to understand that. Um, and so. Um, and I'm sure there are other needs in that, but this, so in fact, it really is kind of a freeze for at least the next six months. On average, but not, not across the board, okay. but yes. Can, can I just ask one question just for my own edification, Enrique? Um, but does that assume that everything stays status quo? So just as far as uh, the executive director's discretion, there could be some other staff changes if someone resigns, or should there, there, there are always changes, not just in staffing, but in projects or costs with the vendor, Correct. things like that. So yeah. I think uh, my, my experience is, uh, to Kathy's point, there, there may be some flexibility depending on what happens over the course of the next six months. So as well, long I, as 
and within the parameters of the budget mm -hmm. and the FTE count, mm -hmm. my understanding is there is some flexibility there, and I would, uh, but it just depends on where the money, the pot, where the pockets of money are. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Uh, absolutely, uh, okay. absolutely, and 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 those uh, zero budget revisions, if you will, don't right. necessarily come to the commission for approval. Okay. Uh, you know, not even uh, you know only the big ones for the treasurer. I, I can speak about history here. Uh, so on average, you know, we can we can certainly prioritize the first uh, backfill, and 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 I agree. Uh, maybe the, the the legal department should be there because they're down two people in important positions. Uh, but on average, we'll be able to manage not just on positions but other other costs. Um, right. You know. So hypothetically, if there was, say, a savings with a vendor or something like that, could we translate that to a position if there was that flexibility or are we, because I remember there's a whole issue of the FTE count. I just want to make sure I'm clear in right. my direction that if there's, a, if there's an opportunity, would I have the authority to do that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think you've, okay. it's always it's always been there. And, and, and I don't think, and this is a good topic for discussion, there is there is not a directive of a hiring freeze that has that carries has quite a bit of a right. okay. that carries a little of a connotation in other right. state agencies, um, which there's 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 nothing here. We're making assumptions to make the first assessment, which is where we find ourselves. Uh, we're making those assumptions a little tight to be reasonable and not create unnecessary cash that's just going to be sitting uh, on the mm -hmm. commission. Okay. Uh, whereas we know that that you know the, the, the licensees are also managing their cash flow at this time, uh, you know, very uh, very closely. Now, having said that, uh, uh, you know, in, in a thirty-two million dollar budget, in thirty-nine once we put it all together, um, there's a lot of costs that you know that fluctuate as right. a matter of this. And, and Perhaps that, that's really the slush fund I was referring to. Right, exactly. Because I wanted to make sure that you don't have like line, you're treating it like line exactly. items. Where exactly. No, 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 no. They can't, that funds can't go over to funding an FTE. I want to make sure we have that flexibility where you do achieve Absolutely. a savings. If in fact we're going to have no extra fund that would accommodate this kind of, these kind of um, employment needs. I just want to make sure that we're not tied to a line item analysis. Yeah, no, no, it's 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 fair. Uh, I don't I don't I don't believe we ever were were tied like that, and I don't know we are by 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 doing this. Uh, we are we are just coming up, and this is perhaps diminishing it to to a very um, you know very concrete term incrementally today, but we are just coming up with the best estimate for the first assessment, which which has to happen at the beginning of July. As I mentioned earlier, with the slot fee and the balance of it to the to the to the licensees, we'll continue to make. By the way, another another important part of this discussion is that when COVID nineteen um, first uh, forced the casino closures, one of the things that uh, licensees requested and and we agreed and we came to a commission meeting to ask for that and agreed uh, at a commission level that we would begin assessing on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this was purely uh, as a way to uh, to help them manage uh, cash flow, um, which we're, we were happy to do. We, we it's, it's not a big change. It's not a big lift for us to send three bills in three months rather than one a quarter. And so, um, but that allowed them to again continue to make these um, uh, these kinds of um, again needing cash flow um, uh, cash flow constraints. Um, that hopefully, and, and given the announcement that you just read before we went, we, we, uh, we went to lunch break, uh, uh, Chair, um, changes uh, perhaps very soon once the casinos begin to reopen. And, and it's again something that we can continue, to come, we can come back and, and uh, discuss if we think it's necessary or just give um, uh, Karen the flexibility to operate like we have done in the past with the flexibility of moving um, line items across yeah, I just yeah I'm just hoping we don't put Karen in a position of, of making some cost cuts that she wouldn't normally have uh, made in order to achieve some really vital you know operational function and so you know I know it's a lean budget and I appreciate that I appreciate the, you know the, where we are in terms of um, 
the, the, the licensees needs and I understand that we you know are, it's very difficult to project what their revenues are but I also just didn't want to put us in a position where um, we can't operate in a you know the, the way that we need to operate in order to ensure our mission mm -hmm. uh, because we've kind of made ourselves too tight no. so that's well Yes, that's that's critical, and I, I don't think we're there. I, I uh, we're at that uh, juncture. Um, I think a little bit of that is going to be a judgment call on a case by case basis. Um, yeah. I, I think so far so good, but uh, you know, we now have to gear up to reopen the casinos. How they're going to look like is going to be different from before, mm -hmm. and what Absolutely. that means in terms of demands for. Um, all kinds of things, gaming agents, state police, overtime, you know, we, we make some assumptions, but a lot of that is going to sort of manifest itself as we, as we go along and we'll continue to be flexible and ask for the necessary budget adjustments if we need to. Yeah. Well, thank you. We don't need to belabor my point. You've answered it. Um, others have any questions on the budget? Extensive process. Appreciate the entire finance team's work and Commissioner Zunica's leadership? Well, thank you. Uh, as usual, the balance is, is, um, is a difficult part. Uh, I think we strike it here, at least for the time being. We can come back and revise it. And big thanks to, um, to the staff, Derek and Agnes and, and Doug and everybody in finance uh, and the directors who, who spent quite a bit of time on Karen thinking about what is, what is really necessary, how can we make the best assumptions for the future short term of the, the first part of the fiscal year and, and hence um, and licensees who are always very thoughtful in um, their feedback of all of these costs. Are there any more questions or comments on this topic? I think we want to take formal action today. Yes, we'd be seeking a vote to uh, approve the budget as presented. And as well as the recommendations for the billing. I'm sorry, as well as the recommendations for the... For, for billing, uh, you know, the slot fee and the proration um, as I articulated in those, in those remarks and in the memo, as, as he's articulated in the memo in the packet. Madam Chair, I'd move the Commission approve the Finance and Accounting Division's proposed budget for FY 2021 and related recommendations as included in the Commissioner's packet and as discussed here today. Second. second. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. You seconded it. Seeing you presented it, Commissioner Zimigal, I'll yield to, to the Colonel, oh. Lieutenant Colonel. All righty. Thank you. No further questions? Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. Commissioner Stebbins? Aye. I vote yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Now we get to go back to our Thank earlier. You. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Zuniga. Great work. Um, We have to um, we have to go back to our um, earlier topic. I don't know if you've had a chance to enlighten us, Mr. Grossman. You want to return to our horse racing matter? Well, I'm hoping that what I'm going to say will be enlightening, but um, and just for sure. people to follow, it's back to four B item four B. Sorry. So we have uh, obviously had a chance to step back and think about. Um, how to advance the matter forward today. Um, one of the ways we've come up with um, would be, and to remain squarely within the confines of the statute, would be to review the breeders' proposal to fund racing outside the Commonwealth substantively today, but do so in a consultative capacity. Um, as the statute talks about. Um, and as a reminder, the statute says that the breeders shall from time to time in consultation with the chair of the racing commission um, and the manager of the equine division set a number of uh, 
percentages for the payment of uh, purchases and what have you. So there can be no dispute that the commission by the chair has the ability to consult on this matter. And if you were to do so in a substantive uh, capacity, uh, the commission could, in theory, make its position to the breeders very clear one way or the other as to its views on this particular proposal. If you were to pursue that avenue, the, the, any directive that came out would not be binding. It's a, it would be a consultative uh, opinion. In that event, we could then go back um, the staff and have an even closer look at the legal authority and the historical, um, uh, you know, uh, positioning of this particular matter and see if there's anything else to be said about it. Um, but that's certainly one approach um, to handling this matter, if that makes uh, sense at the moment. Uh, Mr. Grossman, I, I guess I get back to my original point, which is we don't have a lot of information to go on. The, right. Um, you have certainly the information that's been provided and, you know, I, I haven't spoken to Ms. Reagan or Mr. Or Dr. Ziza, but I'm sorry, my son is making snow cones in the background, but um, Hold on. I think that's the first time you've ever referenced the noises on the background, and I applaud you for that, Todd. Jeez. I think uh, Commissioner O'Brien and I've always noticed how you you know just go right through it. Snow cone. outside all day playing so nicely, and then all of a sudden, but a snow um, cone. That's I don't know if great. we can hear that. I apologize, but that's uh, great. <laughs> uh, we can talk about that some other time. It's a great <laughs> little machine for the summer. But anyway, yeah. so that's. Um, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked, um, and I lost my train of thought. Uh, and I and I and I didn't help. My apologies. Uh, well, I, I was actually going to respond. Perhaps you were getting to this um, to Commissioner Camera, Commissioner Cameron's um, uh, point. I th I think um, you know if we came out of this um, discussion saying something to the effect of you know we've been consulted and here's where we stand even if it's in a divided manner, uh, Commissioner uh, Cameron, that, that we have not seen details to our satisfaction, that that's the feedback in terms of consultation. However unanimous or, 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 um, or divided we are. Um, I, I did wanna bring up uh, something that we also touched on um, and, and, and before he had to go, uh, uh, Derek and I were, had a chance to discuss over the break and that is, um, when we make these kinds, of, but really any any payment out of the funds that we are trustees of, and the Racehorse Development Fund is one of them, the the the, the finance division always looks to what, who authorized, what was the particular authorization, and that is not necessarily something that is before us now, but whatever we make in terms of this determination. Um, the the finance team will will look for the same thing, the same authorization when it came time time to pay those purses, and they'd have to also we we just have to decide collectively. I don't I I I, I suppose I'm I'm suggesting we, they shouldn't be the ones to decide. Uh, they only need to uh, to document the authorization, and if if it is that we are authorizing that payment uh, once, maybe not prospectively, but once, you know, it's requested or, or whatever, um, then that would have to be uh, decided, or that would, that, would, that would have to be documented. Um, because what they present in my mind is so fundamental relative to the issue of having authorization or not, um, relative to plans prospectively, I think we're still left with the disbursement or the authorization of the payment, um, which, which to me is why I've been advocating for the notion of being the trustees, um, that would be having a hook when it came to, uh, to these disbursements. So we would have to make a, 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 a document either way, um, whenever it came to actually making the payment. 
In that case, uh, Commissioner Zunigan, it's an excellent point. I think at least temporarily, the finding would essentially have to be that the statute itself, 128 section 2G authorizes those payments. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that may be, that may be the finding. That's if we agree with your legal analysis, Mr. Grossman. Correct? Absolutely. Everything is always contingent on, on that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so one way, there's a number of ways to do it. One way to just be to act in your consultative capacity today. Um, another would be to discuss your fiduciary capacity and take action uh, pursuant uh, to that, uh, that uh, authority. Um, or we could step back altogether and, and, and have a closer look at the whole thing. Uh, well, I do. I think um, in terms of, let's just talk about the adequacy of consultation. Um, we have, um, Todd, why don't you help, um, and I see Ms. Reagan is here. We have um, Dr. Lightbound, who we rely on all the time to convey for the, the um, interests of the uh, different horse associations. Um, Dr. Lightbound, I'll start with you. What, what um, forgetting, putting aside, never forgetting, putting aside the issue of authorization, uh, the uh, thoroughbred breeders have come to you and they have said that they had a plan. Have they mentioned um, to you what they were seeking? I know there was an, uh, today, both the, um, the Ohio was mentioned um, and the um, um, uh, Canada was mentioned. Now, from my perspective, when the statute says consultation, I really do see it as consultation and I don't see it being that there'd be some kind of uh, a weight on terms of, um, you know, of agreement. But I do think that they could today tell us what their plan is, but I don't think that consultation means that we would have to uh, agree. Um, and then, of course, there's the question around the ultimate authority, which is what, you know, we're circling around, notwithstanding Todd's um, opinion. So did they give you any guidance on the Ohio proposal? Um, they just sent me um, some races for Ohio. So I can share those for you, with you. I just, you know, received them um, during the break. Uh, Commissioner Dr. Cameron, can I ask um, if this were the Finger Lakes? Let's just pretend it was still at the Finger Lakes. Yeah. And they came and, and asked for consultation. Would you be all right with that as we've done well, in the be, past? Be, because we had so much information. We knew when they intended to race. We knew the um, who was going to write the races, what the um, what the plan was as far as monies being dispersed. I mean, we had so much more information that gave me comfort. I was very in favor of, by the way, and have been every single year of allowing the thoroughbred to find a place to race and, and do yes. it safely. I right. think there- and So I'm, I'm glad to hear that the, because I'm wondering if there's a shift on that position. Well, it's just this lack of information. We don't know where. We don't know. It looks like Ohio may have just lifted their, their quarantine, but they strongly advise that those coming so, in to Ohio. So there's so many so, things in light so, of COVID that so even can, gives can, us more uh, ability to take can, a look at a plan and make sure we're comfortable. So can we presume that the plan um, that, you know, if they were consulting with us, we would say to the Thoroughbred Association, we of course would you know, highly recommend that you comply with all of the applicable COVID-19 guidelines and obligations and rules. Um, because in some way that might impact, you know, the proper use of the funds because you're doing something outside of the law. Uh, you know, not our authorization, but in any way, the, what I don't see right now in front of us is something that says we get to tell them they can't do this. I don't see that. And that's what, if we leave today saying, you know, I, I just, I'm not sure where, we can say to them, you can't proceed. And I hear Commissioner Zuniga say, well, then Derek will be put in a position of not having a proper authorization. I mean, we can get an A and K opinion, 
I mean, we can ask for a legal opinion from A and K if we're not going, you know, and that's, and Todd, that is not in any way, you know, I've been there where you go to an outside counsel to support your opinion. Would we want to engage in that activity? But it doesn't seem to be very helpful in terms of timing. So we are in a place where I don't, I, I am trying to weigh the impact of, of telling another group of citizens that they can't do something when I'm not sure we even have a say in it. I understand we have an interest in it. And I understand there's been a past precedent that we believe we had authorization. And today it's being raised whether or not we actually ever had it. Right, and I, and I think there's a different sort of opinion among the five of us on that. Right, and I understand that. But so does that mean that you would um, want to vote that they um, would want to take action saying they may not? Or do you want to take action saying you would advise not? Well, I, uh, since 2015, when we first started this, I believed we had the authorization. It was never an issue. They, they requested us to approve. They gave us all the information we need to be comfortable, and we, and we um, wholeheartedly supported it and approved it. So I, I guess I am just struggling with the changes now. I understand there's a differing uh, legal opinion, but I don't think it's all that clear that we don't have the authority. Can, can, I, can I touch on um, what Commissioner Cameron is saying relative to some of those details? Um, they're not just for our benefit and our comfort level. Uh, they are meant to also give assurances to the whole membership, which is part of the big purpose here, to be able to compete and access for those purposes. Um, if there's people that, you know, and that, Commissioner, I, I, where, but I guess I'm wondering where is that written? Where, where is it that this particular ask is tied to that? And, that, and, I, and I, I really am looking for anything precise to help us out on this decision. Well, I, I don't think you're going to find any sentence in the confluence of all these statutes that, that, that clearly does that. Uh, right. I think everything that we've been arguing here is, maybe arguing is not the right word. What we've been discussing is different interpretations of, no, I, re I, I, I no, really I think- No, I agree, I agree with you on that. I, I didn't even hear, I didn't even hear the word, but I appreciate your correction. No, no, it's, um, you know, um, it, it gets it gets a little, um, what's the word? It gets complicated with, you know, de departing from, uh, from precedents. Um, and I understand why there is. There's the most of unusual circumstances here um, to try to take advantage of existing uh, money for some purpose, um, and you know that helps uh, that helps some people. But there's also um, fundamental questions being raised that I think we shouldn't just. Um, well, I'm not comfortable just saying, okay, well maybe we never had it, and now we're just gonna. Um, rely on the the, 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 the the statute by itself okay. um, which is by the way it's not it's not uh, uncommon um, let me let me mention one more one, one more thing um, before he he had to leave um, Derek did mention one thing on on, uh, on the topic general topic of, of, of you know authorization for these kinds of payments compared perhaps to other uh, statutes um, if we here are basically determining that the um, the Racehorse Development Fund payment for, for breeders is a subsidy, uh, then it is perhaps that the case that we don't have oversight. Um, but if this is a payment now and since before that is under a contract or a grant, and granted, this also is not necessarily fit exactly with these, those confines, uh, then we have a requirement of oversight um, of the money and approval of the conditions that they're missing, they're, they're meeting the conditions as as, uh, as the statute um, directed. And so perhaps we're a little bit in the middle, in, in my view, because there there's a directive as to the purpose, uh, it, it tends to be a little bit more in, on, on the side of this being a bit of some, something akin to a grant in which it requires some oversight, uh, um, you know, from our uh, from our side. Um. I think um, Mr. Grossman did also advise, and I think this is something where 
um, legal would have to work with finance that he did advise that the authorization for the payment would be under the precise statute that he's interpreted. So that would give the, that should be sufficient for Mr. Lennon, I would think, but I might be missing something in terms of it being now a subsidy versus a payment. I, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure if I follow all that. It's very complicated to understand without further um, detail, but I do think that, um, you know, the, and of course I'm hearing, you know, Commissioner Cameron say that she doesn't necessarily agree with the interpretation, but the statute alone can be sufficient authorization. I know we're hearing different interpretations of the statute. Judge, may I, may I interject, please? I, I think you just called me judge. Um, just I think you think you got a promotion, man. <laughs> oh, I don't know if it's a Sorry. promotion. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> madam, madam, madam Chair, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, thank, thank you, and and uh, um, and and I just chuckle because um, I um, uh, there would be a, a a good panel of judges here right now. There'd be all five of us and some appellate lawyer. Thank you so much. No, no problem. Um, I what I what I do want to clarify is that you know, the breeders don't want to do anything that you all don't know about, that you're not involved in, that we don't. Sh we, we we would come to you every day, and say, hey, this is what we're thinking, um, and it, and so I just want to make sure that you all understand that we have a proposed agenda, we have a proposed list. I can give that to you tonight. Um, and you guys can review it and we can consult and we can say this is the plan. It's absolutely not a problem. And the other thing that I want to make sure that everyone understands is what we're trying to do is to avoid this pre-approval sort of process that delays so much. We could have had our horses running three or four weeks ago. Um, you know, we've already delayed it initially. Now we have a plan to start in a couple of weeks. That could potentially be delayed again. And if we have to come back with each tweak and change in the program, it really, in an official meeting, it really is detrimental um, to, the, to the breeders and our ability to get the purses and the money out to those participating in the program. So, and as far, the other last point I wanted to make was um, Commissioner Cameron brought up some really valid points with COVID and with the border. And we've worked all of that out we already have a plan in place so that the funds can, will not go to Canada. They'll be able to be paid directly to the breeders. We've shared all this with Alex and she has the information. We've been able to get um, Fort Erie as well as Ohio to agree to have a team of people waiting for our horses. We've been able to arrange transportation. We have everything set up, but that's not, that's something that it's our responsibility to do that. But I, and I'm happy to share all of the details with everybody, um, but it's just, there has to be some trust. And, I, and, and there's a sense here that for some reason that we've operated for 30 years without, without really doing anything that is inappropriate, but I feel like this, there's some cloud hanging over us. And I wanna make sure that we're as transparent, as open as, as we can be with all of you. And, and I'm happy to, the whole board is happy to work with you in any way, but we have 40 horses, 35 to 40 horses ready to run and they need a place to run and they need to run and their breeders need to, and their owners and their stallion owners, they, they, they need, we need to get this help to them. And, and that's the issue right now. And, and Mr. Ziza, I thank you for those comments. Um, other than, if we had had this plan, you know, um, a long time ago, we could have dealt with it a long time ago. We didn't have a plan. We had heard bits and pieces of information about um, where you wanted to run, but we didn't have an actual document explaining to us. I think this could have gone much easier if, in fact, we had had that and we'd have some comfort. It's not about trust. Um, these are whole new circumstances. I mean, this is nerve-wracking opening racing in the Commonwealth, never mind going elsewhere to do it. So it's really not about trust, it's about new circumstances. And um, like I say, every year you've come to us with a plan, it's been, uh, it's been very thorough, very well thought out, and gave us comfort in, in approving such a plan. So I think several things have changed, and it really isn't a matter of trust. 
Well, we're happy to provide that plan to you uh, in, in as much detail as, as you'd like. In the letter that we proposed, we laid out the foundation, which was about 500,000 in purses, races combined with two different tracks um, with multiple conditions. It's, it's laid out there, but just not as detailed with the dates and other things because it depends on horses are obviously living, breathing animals, and it depends on who's available, who's ready, what the tra racing secretaries at the track want to do, what's beneficial to them. There are so many things that need to be at play, and that's the key. Um, and, and that's what we tried to do in that letter is really set out a foundation of sort of the history, why we are where we are, and then give you a basic sort of basic figures and numbers of what our plan is, and then happy to provide details as they come about. Um, every time a, a, a particular race is um, planned by the racing secretary along with the breeders board, we would send that to you. Absolutely. Not to approve, but simply to say, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is the plan. I mean, it's certainly happy to have you be as involved as you'd like from that perspective. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner O'Brien? Um, not to throw a wrench in any of this, um, but I'm wondering if a solution may not have presented itself in, um, in the governor's order this afternoon in terms of um, saying that he was sort of saying we had control over racing, et cetera, et cetera. Does that in any way provide sort of a No, that's over just discussion? our minimum standards on horse racing here. So that's just on our minimum standards. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that's, that's probably right. more on, on opening rather on, than either. right and, and overseeing on just what yeah no no further that that those are just to say that there will be no further industry standards um, other than the guidelines minimum okay. standards that we adopted for the gaming establishment and then of course today on uh, the PPC standards this right. um, isn't even it's not relevant because thoroughbreds don't race at PPC. Right. Okay. No, I, know. I should know what the exact wording no, was. I no, no, that's, but thank you. Thank you. Um, you're always thinking creatively and I appreciate that. I'm just wondering if you have any other thoughts. And no, I mean, I really, I come down on, you know, if, if the question, and I also look at what our agenda is, which is the agenda was really, you know, I believe, did we have the authority um, expressly allowed that would mandate them coming to get approval from us? Um, so in terms of that, I don't feel like there is explicit statutory authority that would mandate them coming to us. Doesn't mean I still don't have concerns about past practice, why there seemed to be a consensus early on that they nonetheless should come. I do think Commissioner Zuniga's comments about our fiduciary obligations as trustee um, bear further discussion internally in terms of what that means prospectively. I, I do think that there is some level of reporting to us in terms of communicating with us in a way that allows us to prospectively make decisions about the split and things like that that would you know, help us comply with our fiduciary obligations. Um, but I don't think, and, and I, I concur with Commissioner Cameron's frustrations that I, I wish there had been more detail on what was provided. I know that in part that may have been the agenda topic, that because it wasn't up here for that vote, it was simply a question of law. Um, but that's sort of where I am coming down on the pure legal question today in front of us. Um, that that would be if the vote were to go forward on that matter. That's that's where I'm coming down. And 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 if the vote were to go forward on the the legal matter around our authorization, then you would say. I would say there's no clear legal obligation on their part to come to us to seek. The, the money or to seek the approval in advance of what they're doing. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have concerns about right. reporting, what, what consultation means, how we execute our fiduciary responsibility going forward in terms of past conduct, then dictating the split, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think on that narrow question, um, again, I'm still concerned that for years there was what appeared to be a consensus that they needed to. But when you peel back the statutes, I do think that there is um, there are some holes when it was piecemealed and amended over the years. So I don't see the mandate on the statute as I sit here today. So I want to be respectful. We have Commissioner Reagan and I want, I mean, um, uh, Councillor Reagan, and I'd like to have, um, you know, you give your input. Again, this is a, um, this is not the court. So uh, we don't need the full 
um, every argument, but if you have want to give some insight, I think that that's fair. Uh, but you are mute, Kathleen. Okay. Am I unmuted? Yes, now you're good. We can okay. hear you. Thank you. Um, just uh, some historical perspective and also maybe an answer to some of Gail Cameron's, Commissioner Cameron's concerns and Commissioner Zuniga's concerns that I've witnessed personally and an answer as to why this issue has come up now hard and fast, I guess is a good way of putting it. Um, in times past where with the board raced at Suffolk and where um, there was a Finger Lakes program that was um, that there was some certainty and finality that we could dictate, it was easier to put together a program. And as you all recall, George Brown was the president and that gentleman would only ever have operated on an approval basis. He just, that's just the way he was. And so it wasn't a legal thing. It was just the way uh, George operated. Um, and, uh, why the issue has come now to the fore is because the pre-approval process um, is an inflexibility that is not a part of the actual industry. And so the pre-approval is defeating the goals of the program. So uh, Attorney Grossman listed the, the goals of the program. Um, the racing secretaries of the uh, external tracks have to write the card. They have to base it on their client populations, which include mass breeders. So they will write the races that suit the population that's available at that time. If half go down from a virus, they're going to write it for um, the other half. And so by only allowing the races that have been pre-approved, it was it was chilling it was it was it was really chilling the uh, program and uh, Commissioner Cameron you caught some of that it, you referenced it earlier how people were unhappy and you know so I know for a fact that some of that was due to the fact that the, the racing secretary on the ground had to change the card at the last minute to accommodate the population so We've now sort of painted ourselves in a corner, which is unfortunate, and, and I, uh, I'm sorry that everybody's, it, it really is a, a weighty legal issue, and I'm glad you guys put the, everyone put the legal and effort and thought into really looking at this issue, because everybody has the same goal in mind, which is to allow the program to grow and to support the program. So from that point alone, operating it in the manner suggested by Attorney Grossman, I think fulfills both the statutory obligations and also the fiduciary obligations. Thank you, um, Kathleen. Any questions for Kathleen, Ms. Reagan, Attorney Reagan? Thank you. So, um, Karen, I look yeah, to you yeah. for guidance. I just, I just wanted to uh, assure the commission that, um, you know, that Todd had, had my support as far as his uh, legal analysis because he had gone through this in a very, very detailed manner and drafted it and been reviewed. Um, and, and it is a sound judgment on his part. A lot of work and effort was put into that. So I just want to make sure that um, you know, the commissioners though, this was not some kind of offhanded, oh, I think you maybe should do this, that she really uh, did a good job in putting this together and with some really uh, sound legal reasoning. So I'm gonna make sure that um, that's communicated that the process in coming to that uh, recommendation to the commission was, uh, was substantiated with a lot of uh, support and legal analysis there. So I just wanted to make sure that was, uh, out there for your consideration when you're figuring this issue, uh, because it, it ultimately does come down to right now, do you 
do you have to make this decision? Is there, is there a mandate for you to do that? And your general counsel did give you an opinion on that. You, you know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm persuaded by the last set of comments, uh, especially from Commissioner O'Brien, to, to look at this narrow, uh, and that is only on the notion of the authorization of the pre-approval. Um, I see, uh, for the reasons that I've talked about already, uh, relative to the, the tr being the trustees of the funds, that we do have authority over making sure that the funds go to the purposes that, um, that the statute intended. And, uh, and that it is unclear enough that that authority needs to be exercised with anticipation or in a pre-approval basis to move on from today. But I, I still believe that we, as simply, as for, for, uh, for reasons of past practice, but, but also um, being the, the trustees of the fund uh, and, and a lot of other authority that I see in very relevant adjoining chapters, that we do have the obligation, not just the authority, to ensure that we that that the funds are being spent the way the statute intended. And by the way, Ms. Reagan and Mr. Caesar, um, I don't I don't suggest by any of these that 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 it was going to be misspent or that there was some kind of um, dubious uh, uh, um, mo mo motives here. Um, I was just rejecting. Fundamental, the fundamental notion that we have no authority. Uh, if it is just very narrow relative to the pre-approval, uh, there's enough question as has been articulated here today for me to go along with that. Uh, well, Commissioner uh, Zuniga, if Thanks. I suggested- Thank you, you, sir. Yeah, thank you. I just want to interrupt in terms of the um, authority. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying because I think from the start, I talked about just the authority on the narrow grounds and so are, you, are we saying that what Commissioner O'Brien said in terms of this, the statute as, as Mr. Grossman interpreted it, you're now saying that you're convinced that, that, that we, we don't have the authority with respect to the narrow question before us? That there was, uh, yeah, I, and, and I want to make sure I'm clear. I yeah, because I want to make sure I'm clear. I was confounding the notion that we have no authority. I believe we do have authority. When it comes to the pre-approval um, of, of their plan, um, there's enough um, um, question, enough uh, uh, um, undetermined notion for all the reasons that, that, that have been articulated here for me to go along with that. I did not, I do not relinquish the notion that we have authority at all. Of course not. The oversight no, I, of this. I, I, I'm wondering if it's a question of semantics in terms of phrasing the question. So mm -hmm. rather than a question of do we have authority, it is, does the Breeders Association, uh, are they statutorily obligated to come get pre-approval? And I think when we phrase it that way, I, I don't know that there's unanimity, but I do think there might be a majority conclusion based on the discussion we've had today. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, are you suggesting um, that we implement this regulatory oversight at other other junctures in the process? Yes. Meaning if we find there's something, whatever that may be, I don't want to use a hypothetical because I don't want to presume that um, the breeders would in fact um, attempt to do anything that we didn't think was was proper because I don't, I don't believe that's the case. Right. Um, but I just, so you're saying we should monitor the, pro first of all, we should look at a plan and um, make sure, I mean, Dr. Lightbaum is the expert. She's been doing this for longer than any of us, obviously. I guess I'd like to hear from Dr. Lightbaum what she thinks um, she would need in order to feel comfortable um, moving forward in this direction. Well, um, I wanna let you all know that we did ask them, the breeders group, um, for a request, it was brought up at our meeting with Kevin Considine and Anthony Ziza and um, <clears throat> Todd and I. Um, and and it was, the idea was that it would probably be a, a meeting where there would be a question of two items. One, um, sort of the authority question, and then two, um, what they were actually asking for. 
And um, as you know, as you know, we got um, kind of a, a broad um, description of what they're asking for. Um, and uh, getting back to what some of the um, frustration with some of the horsemen in the past has been is that they didn't know what the races were going to be. And um, so, you know, you can't have it both ways that we need to race tomorrow, but we can't tell you what our races are going to be. Yeah, you know, so um, in the past, they were able to, um, as, as um, the commissioners were here before, no, they would actually um, give us, you know, three or four races with, uh, and it wasn't always an exact um, purse. Sometimes it was given as a, you know, um, a range um, of what the purses might be. And um, again, we just asked for the races that were going to be in the spring. Obviously, they raced at Suffolk in the summer and then what was in the fall. So we weren't asking for um, something for the entire year because obviously something might change in six months, you know. Um, there were some changes made along the way, um, depending on, you know, what the horse populations were and all, and that was never really an issue. Um, right now, um, I have the document that they sent during the break about um, Belterra, but I have not looked into that racetrack at all. So I don't have any, um, information about, you know, safety records or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the Canada thing, you know, it's in the packet that uh, a letter from their um, racing that even though they aren't part of the um, NTRA approval, they do have a, a good safety record. Um, I was just concerned uh, that at the time they were talking about Canada, that was the only place they were talking about. Um, and also it um, raised um, some questions in my mind that if the only place the mass spreads could find to race was out of the country, um, what, how that reflected on the program. So I had some concerns about that. Um, and again, um, as Commissioner Cameron knows, we met with the mass breeders way back in January and um, expressed our support. We said we want the program to be successful um, and we want to, um, you know, kind of put our thinking caps on and think of ways that might encourage breeding. Right now, there's not a lot of breeding going on. And we had talked about, um, you know, maybe putting some of the money aside and saying that that was going to guarantee that that purse money would be available next year and maybe the next year. Um, because as the breeders have expressed to us the, with the uncertainty, um, and having to wait several years before you actually get that horse um, that you're breeding, get their foal to the races, um, there is uncertainty. So we're trying to figure out ways around that too, um, to help the program. Great, that's really a good reminder. In fact, um, it reminded me that that actually, it was at that point that Todd started to look carefully at the, the underlying law and the statute. With that said, you have the background. That was a reminder. Of course, in January, we're in a very different world right now. Commissioner O'Brien started to reframe um, the issue and what I thought was very helpful. Perhaps we could go back to that, um, you know, because maybe uh, Commissioner Zuniga, when you heard me say our, you know, our authority or authorization, maybe you heard it meant Broadly, I never meant it, that question to be broadly. It was really with respect to the question before us that Mr. Grossman addressed. But maybe it needs to be reframed in a way that that um, like the next question would be after if you, Eileen, if you could say what you thought initially, and then I just would like to interject one other question to keep us moving forward. I'm just I'm trying to pull up the agenda. Um, yeah, it was the agenda says um it says it all says it's massachusetts thoroughbreeders association request to race outside of massachusetts and then it got into our discussion about authority in terms of that that was the potential vote listed if the vote is um whether we are determining or ruling as a, as a body right now where, where are we going to vote on whether we think the Massachusetts Third Bed Readers Association is statutorily obligated to seek pre-approval before racing outside Massachusetts. Is that, a, is that an accurate summary of what the vote is really about today? Right. Does it have to seek pre-approval? And then I heard Commissioner Cameron say, well, then, you know, they'll present a plan. I think 
the threshold question is, do they, uh, maybe we say, do they have to present a, a plan and get approval? I mean, I, I guess I'm wondering, I think I'm hearing from the, the association that they don't feel that they have an obligation to come to us other than consultation um, and, uh, and get approval. And so I think I'm hearing from Gail say, well, the consultation hasn't been take addressed because they didn't come with a plan today. Um, am I getting close? Are we getting well, close? <laughs> I, I, I would argue that there's a lot of consultation that has already happened. Yes, I would too. Here. Uh, I, I think, yeah. uh, you know, perhaps Mr. Z, more than before. Than our commissioners, everybody, thank you. I'm sorry, Commissioner Zuniga. Yeah, no, there's quite a bit of consultation. I mean, uh, what what uh, Commissioner Cameron says about the details, uh, what Alex says about, you know, the balance between being nimble in this set of circumstances and, and, and you know, giving people, as many people as possible, even enough notice so that they can make plans and have a shot at, at those persons is, is critical and is what, what is being conveyed at this point. So again, Commissioner O'Brien, if, um, if you just want to reframe what you said, I'm wondering if we can take action if we're not in a place to take action. Um, if, if this were a motion, the language would be maybe reframed to say, and I'll write it down this time. It would be as a matter of statutory interpretation. And I'm doing this as a question, not a motion. Right. Uh, no, this is just that. Uh, yeah. Just uh, as a matter of statutory interpretation, does the commission find that the Massachusetts Red Readers Association must seek approval from the commission before anything outside Massachusetts? Oh, I just lost your, um, your audio a bit. Um, must seek commission approval prior to racing outside the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Does that help frame the, the question? And then I, if, um, the, if we frame it as a question, if everyone's comfortable, um, Todd, your answer to that question, if I'm guessing right, would be? No. 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 Um, and, and I think that's important. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the, the way the motion is framed. I have never meant to suggest, and I tried to be very careful not to suggest that the commission has no authority over this subject matter. Uh, it was solely whether there is a requirement that the breeders come for approval prior to expanding these funds outside the Commonwealth. And that's what the motion is, as I understand. Okay. And that's not to say that our definition, maybe an un a mutual understanding of consultation is probably, it sounds like a work in progress. Well, do, don't we want to come away? Yeah, I just I just want to make sure we're coming away with something that makes sense to all of us and we're comfortable with from the standpoint that we regulate racing. And I'm not sure I'm hearing that yet. I know I, if we answer that one narrow question, I understand. Fine. But then what what are we talking about as far as um, as moving forward, um, I, I do believe, uh, you know, Dr. Ziza, when he says that he's happy to um, give us as much information as we like, I guess the fact that we didn't have that, and I heard why to some extent, but not really, um, why we haven't received more. For example, it would have been nice to see something from Ohio, a letter from their, um, uh, from their race secretary or, or someone in charge of the track. Um, you know, time to really make sure, uh, you know, uh, what Ohio does is in keeping with how we want um, horses to be treated and it, it just a little comfort level here that we don't have because um, we didn't have a thorough uh, package to take a look at. So Alex just gave me a little bit more about what she'd be comfortable with. So I just want to have an understanding of what we're talking about here moving forward. Okay. 
Well, well maybe no, no. In, in my mind, and I believe this addresses your concern. Uh, I gotta, if we if, if if we all agree that 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 the thoroughbred breeders did not need pre-approval for uh, for the con conducting uh, races outside of the Commonwealth, that in my mind, what follows, uh, which would be predicated on, on getting that comfort level that you speak about, Commissioner, would be the authorization of the actual disbursement whenever it comes down to that. To, to, to that. Uh, there's enough time between now and whenever we need to disburse those, those, those monies for us to get updates or the, the more specific plans or whatever it may be uh, for us to effectuate that, uh, that, that payment, which uh, I would argue we do have uh, authority over the disbursement of the payments. So before a payment is made, uh, Dr. Lightbaum would have to assure us that everything has been followed according to the right procedures. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, that there would be, you know, the details that we normally get prior to, to, the, to the season. That, 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 that we get some comfort level that uh, people were advised with enough time, you know, as, as possible, because again, these are the most of unusual circumstances. And, um, you know, and, and that the program reached as many breeders as possible. Uh, Dr. Lightbaum, are you comfortable with moving ahead in that fashion? No, oh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that there would be, um, something that I wouldn't disagree with, but I'm wondering if the way this is set up is that they may have already, um, if we're not doing any pre-approval, then um, the races would have already been raced and um, people would have gotten their purse money. And then we're going to say, I guess I'm not sure how that works. So Commissioner Zuniga, if you could explain, I think but the, the purse money would already be available. <clears throat> they would have gotten it, um, correct? So, but I think, um, so in other words, do we, are there gonna be additional steps that need to be taken um, in order for them to actually obtain the purse money in timely fashion so they could rent a race? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I don't know the exact details of the timing, the precise timing. I, I know that, because I sign off on, on these payments, that we make a number of disbursements on a regular basis to, to the horse racing industry, the thoroughbreds, the, you know, so if we whether, had, whether okay. they actually float the money first and then they get reimbursed or whether they submit their request and we front the money so that they can pay the purses. I, I'm not, maybe Agnes can help me on this, but um, I'm not entirely sure just, of that. Just a second. So can I just reframe the question? If we, in the past, we approved of the Finger Lakes because we assumed that our approval was, was needed. Today that has come up in question. <clears throat> now, do you remember, did we then say to them, but that approval requires you to prove A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then the disbursement, it did not require no. that? You don't no, 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 no. No, oh, Commissioner Zuniga, I just was running on payment. There were no, um, additional requirements to, to release the money and then it'll go to Commissioner Cameron. He was shaking his head no. Now he's, okay. Well, there, there's always, you know, the, the, both the consultation with finance and Dr. Lightbaum that, you know, we got the pre-approval, that's great. How is it going? Uh, it's functioning as planned, make the payment. I see, thank you, very helpful. Commissioner Cameron? You know, just the fact that we did have all the information, we had the comfort level that yes, this is something we should approve because, um, uh, you know, of the following reasons. And they, you know, we really, uh, Dr. Lightbaum advised the commission, yes, this is, you know, uh, a track that has a, you know, a safety record, whether it be accredited, um, all, all of the things that we used, to, it was a pretty detailed plan, as I remember, for the last several years. And, and it wasn't about the dates, by the way. We didn't care if you ran on a Thursday or a Friday, if you ran on the 17th or the 21st. It was really about the plan that we um, got to look at and had a comfort level that we are, 
we are utilizing the state's monies in a way that makes sense and and promotes um, the aspects of the legislation. It, 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 it's trying to do the things uh, in accomplishment and in a fair way that protected the, the horses, that protected the, uh, the employees. So we saw all that. Dr. Lightbum, you may want to just add. Your no, I also want to honor, I, I know this is out of order, but I do want to let um, Ms. Reardon know that I see her hand is raised. I want to go to Commissioner Lightbaum. Normally in our public meetings, we don't have, you know, the public just be able to participate um, because of the, the nature of the rules of the open meeting law. Um, I want to make sure everyone is heard today. So Ms. Reardon, I do see you. I'm going to have Dr. Lightbound speak. I'm going to have my fellow commissioners chime in to her remarks, and then I'll have you speak. Thank you very much. Okay. Alex. So I, I guess I'm wondering if, if this means that we would be, um, there would be some type of approval process after the races had already been raised. That, that's my concern. And, and I guess I would wonder the follow-up question would be, and where is the authority for that process, pre, you know, of approval of what the races are to look from, except from, I guess, what I'm hearing, can say, well, we're the regulator, so therefore, but, you know, typically we do look to something. We don't just say, well, we regulate everything and we have our regulations, we have our guidelines, we have statutory authority. And I'm just looking to see what would be the process that would follow. Because again, you know, Derek would also have to have that. Um, we, can't, we can't impose conditions unfairly. And so we never have. No, 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 I don't mean, I'm not a judgment on us, Commissioner Cameron, that's not a judgment on us. Unfairly meaning, without authority you know it's just and i guess i'm i, I want to make sure the construct that we're imagining now as you know as alex says is where would we be what would be the genesis of that uh, you know um our ability the legal ability for us to impose conditions or authorizations so i'm just well maybe maybe i'm just stating the obvious here but you know to get a comfort level that the monies are going or went for the purposes of the program, and that, I know that's too broad. No, no, uh, that might be. It's sufficient. it's it's really you know that this is where the the fiduciary notion of being the trustees would, would lie. So, you for know, instance, if they didn't, for instance, if they went ahead to Ohio and they ran their races, and we didn't hear that they used the funds abusively for something else. I mean, but they had to have had the funds to begin with. That's the thing, right? Alex, that's the, they'll already have gotten the funds. But of course, if they, we found out that they abused it, there would be repercussions because then we would have released them. Under uh, this well, I would be, I would be more comfortable if we, um, you know, I'm, I'm believing Miss uh, Attorney uh, Reardon and uh, I'm sorry, um, Regan and um, Dr. Ziza that they, that they don't have any problem um consulting with alex about their plans um so i would love to see that work done in advance of any racing um and for dr lightbomb to come back to us and say um the plans look sound and you know they're going to race here i, I would just love to see that um which we've always had by the way since we took over racing we've always had those um conversations and come to a consensus. Uh, now we're getting into this strict authority, and I think that's taking us away from where we want to be here, which is um, uh, just, a, just a comfort level that in, in these unique circumstances, we want to be helpful as the regulator, but we want to make sure things are being done properly. That's all. That's why if, if there's an agreement that, um, that the breeders don't have a problem and doing that ahead of time, I, I would I would have a level of comfort moving in this direction. May I answer that? We would be happy to do that. Um, we've been talking with Alex for the last four months on multiple plans, not details on races specifically. That's the one piece we did not get into. Um, but we got all of the safety data. We got all of the requests that, that Alex wanted and we will get it for about, that was for Fort Erie, we'll get it for Belterra as well. But we've been in communicating for the past four months sure. actually very very in, intently um so 
be happy to circle back with Alex as ASAP as soon as she's available. We'll get all of the information that we need as well from Belterra um, and our plan moving forward and get that to you ASAP. Yeah. Thank you, because that really was us, the, the, my, uh, my see, pleasure. There would be no reason for us to have to reconvene for any kind of a vote. Correct? Well, I forgive me to be overly precise here, but at some point in the future, whenever it comes time to making the disbursement, whether that's happening right before or right after the race, the races, I would suggest that we, whether it's Alex or Derek, come before the commission to seek that authorization. Because I think that's an, author an authority that we do have as trustees. It could be as, 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 as early as the next meeting of the commission. And I, I would even add to that, I, I, I think to the point Dr. Ziza raises about providing us information in a timely fashion, I think this commission can be as, just as nimble. We can post a meeting in 48 hours and, and take the necessary steps so not to, to hold them back. I just want to make sure that uh, both the MTBA and, and us, you know, we have each other's backs through this process. And that, uh, um, I appreciate, I appreciate that. We want to be responsible for the money. Absolutely. Much appreciated. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have any comments? Um, just a little flummoxed because I feel like there may have been sort of a, a practical consensus agreement, but in terms of what we actually were on for the agenda and the question before us, um, I, I like the fact that there's consensus and that there's cooperation. I just don't know that it answers a question that was on the agenda. Um, mm -hmm. Other than I think a lot of what's being asked for that I want as well seems to fall into possibly the definition of consultation with the chair um, and or that the consequences. Could you just repeat because I couldn't quite hear that part. Whether some of this, the, the consultation with us is really statutorily obligated in terms of consultation with you as chair and your role the racing commission that's statutory obligated you know they have an obligation to do and is the consequence to failing to comply prospective in terms of they don't need to come seek pre-approval but of course the more they do it the clearer they do it the more definitively they do it and cooperate the less likely there is to be a consensus in the future in terms of the decision of the split and the disbursement of monies that's kind of where i was thinking of it um and i think it gets everybody's goal the same now the conundrum here is there seems to be a level of disappointment being expressed by Commissioner Cameron and Dr. Lightbound in terms of the level of detail, which to me sits more in terms of consultation perhaps and, and sharing information with us to do our due diligence in a fiduciary capacity. Um, it doesn't answer the question, the legal question. And so if we can, if we're pulling that off the agenda, it sounds like we have reached a solution in the short term. <clears throat> I'm, yeah, I, I um, am, am with Commissioner O'Brien on that assessment. I, what I don't want is this solution to be a precedent. This is not, this is not, from my perspective, does not resolve the legal question that came to us in good faith from the requesting parties. And I think we always must really think about, are we operating according to the law? And just because we're a regulator doesn't mean that we can regulate outside of the of our, um, our powers. We, we have an obligation to be fair and operate within the, the construct of the law and the statute. And today I heard from our general counsel that said, you know, very clear analysis, not everybody agreed. And I think what we had is, you know, there was very communications going on. And I see that, you know, very, very practically there was a solution from the uh, the thoroughbred association because they want to race. I don't want it to be a precedent that we always have done this. I don't. I don't agree with the process today. I felt that they they came, they consulted, they met the burden of you know of the statute, and and I and I agreed with our our general counsel's analysis. Um, and and I know that I didn't necessarily have everybody's support um, on that analysis, but I do. Todd, you have my support on it, and I know it's an agreement with the you know, legal analysis out of the other side. But it did not resolve the matter that was before us, and 
when it comes to the next time that they um, want to race outside of Massachusetts, I don't, I, I really would hope that we have resolved this so that it's not like, well, they all, they've always come and given us the guidance because I don't think they have an affirmative obligation to do that. And again, unless somebody can point out to me something outside of the statutory analysis before it's because it is complicated law. And if there was something that was out there that says, other than, of course, I'm hearing Commissioner Zuniga, our, we do have fiduciary duties on how we dispense with it. We don't have discretion, though. It's not like how we judge it, it's by law. So even, um, you know, I, I just think we have to be careful how we assert our authority. And that's my opinion, and my vote would have been today to, to let them go forward if we had um, if we had been asked, but it looks like there's a practical solution. Um, and and um, I just don't want it to be a, a binding, I don't want it, this is not binding practice. Uh, well, it, it clearly hasn't. I mean, we, we, we've authorized them before, and if we no, don't no, no, now, no. it's not, the precedent doesn't carry over. No, I mean that this is no. not the practice of, of us having to review their plans and that's becoming um, an interpretation of what consultation is and approve the plans. I don't, I know that I have others on, the, on my, my fellow commissioners who don't agree with me on that or may, may agree and may not, I don't know. But I just know that I don't interpret the guidance that we've been given, that um, Mr. Grossman's given and also my own reading of the statute, my, the, the consultation that Todd gave me. Um, I just don't see, I wouldn't, I just don't, it's not my nature to impose authority unfairly. And I think if we say, well, you have to, that consultation means we have to approve the plan. I think that is outside of what the statute demands of that. That's all. And I, I think there's a clear, there's an emerging consensus of that. I'm right. still, I'm, I'm still a little hung up on who approves the payment. No, 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 I'm not hung up. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we would, could have a vote that they could proceed right now and they could be assured of the purse money. I don't, you know, I'm not hung up on the purse money. I didn't have any problems with it because I think the statute would make it a completely valid, um, a, a valid disbursement. Uh, yeah. So then why would we have a vote then? If the, if the, well, that was you know. my point. We're not going to come back and, um, you know, Mr. Stebbins, Commissioner Stebbins just said, well, we'll come back, we're nimble, we can come back in 48 hours. And I just don't think we, we need to do a, take any further action. I think it's, I'm suggesting that Alex is going to hear from them. I, I, but what if Alex doesn't like what she hears, in other words? So I, I, I do like the idea of... We, that's where we're disagreeing. Uh, yes, we are. Mm -hmm. We are. That's exactly and, the and to be honest, I, that, that's why we're here in the first place is is because this is the first time that I didn't necessarily agree with what they had brought forward. Right. You you so, would express concern about Canada right. and then I that's how we get in. That's right. how the question about whether or not we actually could Right. And, and there are still many unanswered questions about, about Canada. So I Listen, I would be, again, I'll say it again, um, I'm not, I think it's important that we have a consensus on how to move forward. And if it's not an exact approval, then it is, um, it is a consultation with Director Lightbaum. She's comfortable that we're, um, you know, we are providing monies for something that, that is safe and we do. We still have those regulatory responsibilities, even though they're out of state, to make sure that um, the money is is being spent in in accordance with um, with the law. So I, you know, I am not comfortable just saying, okay, we don't have the authority. Go do what you want. I'm just not. It's not exactly what we're saying, though. It's more like you don't need to come get pre-approval. But the reality is, if it is not compliant, there is a consequence on the other end in the terms of our fiduciary review as trustee. Now, we may have to rethink what that means and how that gets effectuated, but I do think that um, them understanding that, and I think they do, means that there is a compliance. It's just that it's probably going to look a little different than it's looked up to this point. Um, I, I think this is a is sort of a time sensitive and heated topic because of the manner in which it arrived and its change in practice. And I share the concerns. 
because I don't know how you, you know, send your horse up to Canada and, and just remotely hire someone to be a trainer and a jockey and, and <laughs> hope, you know, cross your fingers and hope for the best. I don't, I don't personally feel comfortable with that, but I'm also looking at the statutory framework and I think it needs to be cleaned up because we do have this obligation and yet restrictions on our authority that don't exist in the other areas of our statutory authority. Well. So I think we're all in agreement that we want to make sure it's done safely and expended consistent with the statute. But when you parse out how we do that, I think there was, you know, a gentle person's agreement up to this point to do it in a certain way that when we get to a point, uh, like, it looks like you just said, where no, we're not really in agreement, the devil's in the details. And so now it's where do you go from here to make sure everyone is going forward safely and in compliance with the statute. Great. And I guess I guess I I would hope that that happens before there are races. There's a uh, yeah. there's a consensus rather than after the fact. Right, right. In an ideal world, yes, I agree with you. Oh, I see no problem. I see no problem with that. We, we will work diligently to get all of that information to you. Um, I, I we would like to let our members know what the plan is, particularly for those first two races. So because everyone is very. Um, they have horses that are ready, and we want them to know that they'll have the opportunity. Um, but we'll get all that information to you before then. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, if, if the You're question welcome. is narrowed even further um, to the extent that, and, and Alex, maybe you and Commissioner Cameron aren't ready to, to vote affirmatively on this, but if the question in terms of that request that was just raised is narrowly phrased in such a way that the commission feels that they have complied with their statutory obligations in front of the commission. Uh, any prerequisites that may exist, then they could go forward with those two races. It does not vote on expending funds. It does not speak to the statutory authority. It simply confirms that we are agreeing they've complied with what they need to, to this point. Uh. You're talking about approving that today. Is that right? That they've complied with what they need I'm to? I'm talking about what the vote is on today, because the vote's either going to be, is there statutory authority or no? And if the answer is no by a majority, then there is you know, this agreement that they will continue to talk with you and Alex in terms of what this looks like. But consequences really would come in sort of the next wave of review in terms of the split, the split, the dispersion that would come in the future. So in other words, to give them assurance to move forward without having to come back, but I understand in good faith they're going to consult um, further with, with Alex on guide, and guidelines. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. fine with that. Hmm. Yeah, I know that Alex doesn't, to this point, does not have any information on um, Ohio. There is some limited information with Canada, but nothing with Ohio. So. That would be important to me to receive that information and for, for Dr. Lipom to be able to take a look at that and um, and come to a consensus that that's, that's appropriate. You have our word, we will do it. Uh, did, it, it looked like you wanted to say something else, Gail. No, I'm fine. I think I, I it just froze for a second. The screen. Oh, okay. Commissioner O'Brien, do you want to make a motion? And we'll or, see. Do you want did to we want to hear from Ms. Reardon or no? Um, Ms. Reardon. Um, are, no, it's Ms. Oh, Reardon. Sorry. Ms. Reardon. Sorry. How do I get the? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you now, Ms. Reardon. Yes. Um, I'd like to just make a comment as uh, an owner of a mass spread. Uh, for, first of all, they've known about going to Canada for months and months. I even sent a temporary book, condition book, into the Gaming Commission when they were uh, scheduling two races. And then the permanent book I sent in, and that was done, um, I think the temporary was figured over two months ago, and the permanent was a month ago. Uh, so they've known about these a long time ago, even though the board a long time ago said, do not schedule any races without the sanction of the Gaming Commission. Uh, also, I will not hand my horse over to anybody on the Canadian border. 
Um, I have a two-year-old, which they have not had two-year-old races for years now. And I want to see it come back to an area where there's more people that can race in these. Two-thirds of the mass breads are owned by board members. The, the other third are, have other horses, as I do, from other states. And we don't have, we aren't going to go further and further away to race these horses. Even though Delaware last year said they'd have races and they didn't, they wouldn't let them show up. Mountaineers expressed uh, interest in having a mass bred races this year. And I, I think the board needs to look into that also. I'm also concerned about giving up any oversight by this board. They've been very, very astute and cautious about what goes on with this money. And it needs to remain that way. Uh, they do not need to come under any criticism from the legislature saying that they just handed money out and it was up to them to somebody else to manage it. When this board has not even put one article out on their Facebook or their webpage about the intentions. Uh, they've known for months and months that uh, Finger Lakes do not want them to race there anymore. And no consensus has been made with the membership. Nobody has talked to the membership. And there aren't many of us left. So I think we need to do is have this board, this commission, maintain as they always have a fairness. And if you give the, the money out or give it right to them, they talk about giving Alex details. Well, what is the, going to be the consequences if they go ahead and do anything that they want to do, whether it's ship horses over uh, Canadian border or, or not. Uh, why have the races further and further away from one third of the people that own mass spreads? It, the, it needs to be evaluated. Plus this, this position you're taking right now and want to vote on, that was not on the agenda. It was racing outside of Massachusetts. There was nothing mentioned about who should be controlling the money. Uh, that needs to be posted and comments must be put in. Uh, we, I can tell you from the people I know that are mass bred owners that aren't on the board that we don't want to relinquish the oversight of the, of the Mass Gaming Commission. We're very happy with things that they've done. A lot of things have not been resolved and the commissioners know that, but at least it's been brought to the attention. So now I would like to not have this vote taken at all. It needs to be discussed and comments made. And as far as the a rock and a hard place getting races going, that was not the commission's fault. They should not be put in a position that they assume responsibility if they don't take that vote today. It's something that they've the get the mass breeders have known for months and i don't know why i i would as like this commission to put on a, a group to call the different race tracks on the eastern seaboard to see if any of them are interested into it or where's the letters of rejection from all these other tracks and if they're going to ohio why do they need to go to canada there's a lot of unanswered questions here, and to rush this would be a travesty. We're, we're on very, very, as all the commissioners know, fragile ground with the breeding program because uh, the way it's been run. We cannot afford to have anything go through the cracks right now. And as I've talked to my legislators, they're waiting to see what this happens with the Canadian thing. They're not, they're, they're not for this at all. So let's take some time and see exactly what's going on there because there's been months this could have been brought out, discussed, and moved forward. And that's what I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Reardon. I appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Okay, further, further comments on, um, on this matter. Um, <clears throat> question before us. Um, let's make sure Ms. Reardon didn't make a point that's different. I want to make sure that I understood uh, the matter on the agenda. Todd? It says, Thoroughbred Breeders Association request to race outside of Massachusetts. That's it. That's right. And so um, the question was, then the question rose as to whether or not 
we have an affirmative obligation to vote on it. Right. I think it's related. I mean, I think was, was there any question? Is there any question around the finance piece there? Well, no. only uh, you know, Ms. Reardon brought it up, but and and, and this is what I've been saying. Um, you know, I, I I think our our position of being the trustees of the fund give us the the authority and oversight over the funds. Um, I think what we are reaching, um, where I thought we were reaching some kind of consensus was whether the question of pre-approval was narrow enough to allow us to okay. essentially straddle both. No, you 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 um, you comply with whatever whatever consultation is required prior to. Um, which is the last uh, that Commissioner O'Brien was mentioning, but we still have the authority and obligation to make sure that the funds are expended in the manner that the statute intended. We're not abdicating that role. We're not, we, the I don't think we've ever abdi abdicated okay, that, and, have, and, right. uh, you know, and what, or what's on the table. And I thank Ms. Reardon's uh, um, uh, comments. Um, she, she said that uh, she said she suggested that we were doing that with this with this motion, but I don't think that's what what we're doing. No. Okay. Um, she met, her comments um, may have also come to um, answer some of the questions as to why historically it's functioned the way that it has. Um, if the board, Thoroughbred Association board, made an internal procedural determination to come to us first before they then went and raced. That may explain some of the historic nature of why they were before us, but it doesn't bear on the legal statutory question of whether they were obligated as a matter of law to do that. So there's two options, I think. We could not take formal, uh, a formal vote because we could say they may proceed um, without any formal vote, but they, I believe it might warrant some clarity um, with respect to the, whether or not we, whether or not they have an uh, affirmative obligation for pre-approval. So um, I, given the amount of time that was invested in this discussion, it might warrant some clarity through a, um, a motion we understand that, I don't know what the vote will be, but we understand that the um, association is going to be working in consultation with Dr. Lightbound, which I fully appreciate. Um, would we like to memorialize this through a proper vote? Well, let, let me suggest that, again, because there of so much uh, discussion that we do memorialize it with a, with a vote. Uh, because it may appear that there's not a 100% uh, consensus. Um, I think that uh, there's, there's enough um, discussion around the agenda, the topic on the agenda that, that I think we're complying with, with, the, with the notice, uh, especially if we take the narrow question that has been brought up as of late. Well, I think it's fair then. We move, if somebody would like to make a motion, we can entertain it and, and go forward with the process of, of additional comments. If there's no motion made, that will answer that question. No motion? All right, then we, uh, we said, Commissioner? As best I can summarize it, and it may be that we don't we'll abstain, I don't know, but um, based on the agenda item, um, Chair, I move that the Commission find that under General Law Chapter 128, Section 2D, the Massachusetts Thoroughbred Breeders Association is not statutorily required to seek pre approval related to scheduling racing outside the Commonwealth. I second that. I don't know, Todd, if you want to think about that and tell me whether I've erred at all in summarizing that. 
No, well, I think um, just to be clear that if we're talking about just scheduling that leaves open the idea that the payment um, is not directly um, being authorized, but I, I certainly think it's consistent with the public meeting notice if there's any question about that. Um, but I think that, you know, the motion captures the discussion. So, uh, and, and your, your um, opinion, correct, Todd? I think that's what really she was um, addressing. Can, can I make a friendly, and I, I know I don't normally move, but this is a, a comment. Somebody may want to make a friendly amendment. Would we like to add a comma and say, um, subject to the statutory consultation, you know, and include that, and an encouragement, encourage um, um, guidance from the racing director something like that um, prior would we like to do that even if it's not statutorily mandated encourage it would you like something to add the comfort level particularly I'm thinking of commissioners mm -hmm. Cameron and Commissioner Stebbins you could say um, find that general law chapter 128 section 2d G G, G. The Massachusetts Third Road Breeders Association is not statutorily obligated to seek pre-approval from the MGC um, subject to compliance with other statutory obligations. And the common and the commission encourages further consultation with the director of racing for the MGC. So long as the original part of the motion about racing outside of the of Massachusetts uh, remains, because right. that was what. Yep, that's, that's that one part. of the pieces that makes it narrow. Right. That's the narrow piece. So, what that motion says is. Um, you don't necessarily you don't not that you don't necessarily you don't have to um uh, have have our approval but we encourage um consultation with the racing director is that what we're saying well the statute requires consultation with the chair of the racing commission so i think that that's taken care of in the middle clause yeah and, but the, there's no statutory requirement around consultation with the racing director but given today's discussion i think that i'm hearing from a practical level and a desire to be cooperative that we we all acknowledge that we would love that to encourage that kind of interaction i guess i'm still well it's okay i, I i'm still struggling with the because i don't see that statutorily required gail but i you know know it's i so hear you mm -hmm. i hear you i just thank you So with that, um, those amendments, do we have a, a second? Yeah, I'll second as amended. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. I'm gonna vote no. Mm -hmm. Commissioner uh, O'Brien. Oh, excuse me. Aye. Unmuted. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. So that's 4-1. Thank you. All right, that was a, a, a very um, enlightening uh, exercise for me because I don't know the history. Um, I also don't know all of the members of the community. I'm very appreciative of everyone chiming in and hanging in there today. It's now 4-15 and, and I know the meeting's been extraordinarily long. So uh, to those who came from outside, thank you so much for your participation. And for those who didn't participate, thank you for, for listening. Um, that does conclude um, all the um, business of the, the meeting. I do have a commissioner's update, but I also wonder if any of my fellow commissioners have any updates. Commissioner Cameron, did I see? No, no updates, thanks. Okay, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, not an update so much as a scheduling and agenda matter. Um, given the governor's ruling on phase three, 
it would seem that we still have an order that says that they casinos um, the suspension will continue through at least June 1st subject to any further discussion now that we have finalized the rules that we wanted to put in place and the governor has in fact indicated a start date for that potentially um, it would seem that we should be scheduling a meeting to formally amend that order from the end of May they're planning on some or do we have word that any are opening on on Monday I have not heard that. I did check with the licensees as far as anything that we could publicly say. I believe that uh, Wynn Resorts, uh, their Encore Boston Harbor facility is scheduled to open on the 12th. And I don't know if anything else is public. I see Bruce banned. I just want to confirm because I haven't gotten any word of anything that's public. So Bruce, just be clear. Wednesday, that's, could we uh, today when, as a Wednesday the 10th is the first one for PPC. Okay. Wednesday the tenth. The okay. other two two would be Friday. So not nothing on Monday, correct? Nothing on Monday. No. Wednesday is the eighth, though. Yes, Wednesday the eighth, and the other two would be Friday. The tenth. Okay. And and uh, Commissioner O'Brien, to your point, how about horse racing? Are they going to be doing a qualifying race on Monday? Yes. Um, yes. Planner yes, they are racing uh, qualifiers on Monday. So we do need we to, need to move, move on that then. We need to move on that. It's a, um, Mr. Grossman, um, <laughs> um, on number eight, number eight, as this served for matters, the chair did not reasonably anticipate the time at the time of posting. Uh, the, um, the date certain, um, we've always been very careful never to assume anything with respect to the um, governor's office and their decision around public health metrics. Um, there was a possibility that it would be Monday. It turned out it, it, it was real. Um, last week, we thought it might be the 29th. On horse racing, because we did confirm today that with the, our guidelines in place that we had, we adopted today, they can proceed. The track will be ready and people will be properly trained to proceed with a qualifying race on Monday. Is it fair that I can say, it's not how I, it's not ideal to do our business this way um, because we always try to post in advance, but can I proceed under number eight with that or have us otherwise we would have to reconvene over the weekend which we could do we've done that before um, and we would probably we could notice it in less than 24 hours and convene to you know do a 24 hour um, notice maybe that's proper or 48 hour for a Sunday night well tomorrow's Friday so we'd have we, we could get in a 48 hour posting uh, and do it on Sunday in advance and then we'd be giving full notice. I just don't want to be not practical with respect to number eight. Yeah, I would say, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, if ever there was a matter that the chair could not reasonably anticipate, uh, this would fall into that category. Um, there was really no way to know precisely what the order would be or, or when it would it would come out. So if, if the commissioners are, are comfortable with it, I, I certainly think this, is the exact type of situation that uh, you could make use of that provision of the open meeting law and the public notice provisions. Um, the one thing I don't specifically recall, which uh, everyone else makes, exactly what the order was that we would be amending um, or addressing. I, I know Commissioner O'Brien. I've been trying to. I've been trying to find it. Uh, I know it was the last meeting. I think it prior to June first, um, and the language was. Um, so I don't know if somebody can do a quick search. I think there was a press release with a specific verbiage on it that said um, that we were suspending it through at least June 1st, consistent with the governor's um, executive order related to the COVID-19 shutdowns. Um, and, and so we would be we, what we'd we be doing today was putting up for a vote, officially vacating our order that tracked the governor's um, timing. So it really is consistent with our order because it would be consistent with his. And now our order says um, at least June 1st. We are well past that. And now 
really, we don't even, I mean, consistent with, we could probably have gotten away without even a formal, um, a formal vote, but I don't, I'm not comfortable with that because it would be aligned with Governor Baker's order, which is now July 6th. Uh, I do think we need to vote because our order preceded anything he did. And so oh, I think that's him. not fair. Mm -hmm. And so we had an independent authority and basis to do it. We have been tracking him out of deference to obviously their expertise and their calling the shots in terms of timing. But I do think we need to, to vacate ours as well. I agree with that. How, um, commissioners, I'll just do a, a quick roll call and get everybody's um, gut check on this. Commissioner Cameron, procedurally, would you prefer to have a, do you think that it falls uh, comfortably under the authority of, of uh, Agenda 8? Again, we're nimble, we can reconvene as a I think it squarely falls under number 8 that this is, we couldn't have anticipated this. Okay, excellent. Um, I just uh, am echoing exactly what Commissioner Stebbins pointed out earlier. Commissioner Zunica? Yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. That falls under eight. I also would argue that it falls at least partially under the topic of racing, uh, which we discussed earlier, uh, relative to the measures and the reasons for the closures and the social distancing. So it is at least also part of that topic, one that we already approved and noted. noted uh, and this is a corollary to that. Consistent with that. Um, Bruce? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm comfortable with taking it up on the number eight. And just looking back, I think our meeting on May 14th might have been when we took yeah. action on that. Yeah. Do you see the language, Bruce, by chance? I'm just finding the agenda at this point. I'm looking for that too. What was the date, Bruce? 14th. I think it's our May, May 14th. 14th meeting. May 14th. Okay, I'm looking it up right now. Commissioner Bryan, I really appreciate that catch. Thank you so much. And I believe there was a question. I believe Elaine Driscoll did do a short, either it was a blog entry or a press release that, that captured the language also. I'm sure that Austin and Sarah are looking for it. When we're in our real room, we don't look at each other. We're side by side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all just sort of looking, waiting for um, some information. So here we are. Alex, good timing on getting our standards all done. Yeah, we do have, um, we'll have to do the Pine Ridge one also because we delayed their June 1 opening until further notice. Which one was that? Right. The Pine Ridge live racing? Yes, we do need to, that's yes. right, yeah. Because of the qualifying races, yeah. Looks, looks like Austin. Yeah, Austin's got the language, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, my uh, oh, here it is. Yeah, it's too many screens. Unanimously to extend the temporary closure of the state's three casino properties until at least June 1st, given the current circumstances and pending forthcoming guidance from Governor Baker and the state's restarting advisory board. I was just uh, increasing my volume, Commissioner. Kathy. Austin forwarded in the chat. It's it's in the chat um, function. Oh, thank you so much. The actual language, if you want to. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there it is, Commissioner. Um, yep. From Austin. Yep. Extending thank the temporary. You. Yeah, go right ahead, uh, uh, Eileen. Do you want to just repeat it one more time? Um, certainly. So this is the casinos only. As to Alex's point, there was a separate vote, I, think, yeah. I believe, on the, as to the racetrack. So um, that on the May 14th, the commission voted unanimously to extend the temporary closure of the state's three casino properties until at least June 1, given the current circumstances and pending any further guidance from Governor Baker and the state's restart advisory board. So we would be moving to vacate or amend that. And, and this is relevant. Um, we had a later uh, discussion and vote that it, 
for racing that essentially mirrored the, the yeah. starts and closures of the casino. So, it, we, 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 but it wasn't in May, on May 14. We came at a later meeting, maybe the next one. Yeah, oh, here it is. Yeah, here. Yeah, May 7th, yeah, we voted right before on the racing. Yeah. Yeah, until further notice. Until, remember, it was the until further notice. So, right. So, thank you, Alex, for reminding us of that. So, can we um, move in one, or should we probably address them separately? I think probably it would be cleanest to do it separately. Yeah. yeah. You agree, um, Bruce? Yes. Okay. Sure. Thank you. So that's assuming everyone is comfortable moving to vacate as opposed to amend anything. I think that works. Yes. I am. Um, do we have to affirmative or do we? No, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't any. So there's been a suspension. So we're lifting the suspension rather than. I, I was going to phrase it as vacating the order, suspending the activities. Okay, okay perfect. Yeah. Do you, do you we can start, if you want me to start with racing, um, yes, please, Madam Chair. Um, I move that the commission vacate the order from May seventh, twenty twenty, that postponed the June one, twenty twenty start date until further notice, given the finalization and adoption of the horse racing protocols today and the governor's announcement of the phase three reopening effective July sixth. Second. Second. I'll turn to our council. Any any questions or concerns on that first, um, Mr. Grossman? No, no concerns. If we're confident that that is the order, um, then that's that's an excellent motion. We may we may consider including just or any other outstanding order bearing on the issue is hereby rescinded. Okay. And I guess we should probably also say. Um, and subject subject to um, the COVID protocols for the racetrack that were approved today. That's right. I'm confident about that. That was the motion, don't you? Yes. So yeah, I, that was that was part of the motion. Yeah, yeah. So I rather because I'm afraid of always some unforeseen consequence because you know that we've done other orders, for instance, the adoption of today's um, rules. So. Could we repeat? I'm sorry. Um, um, certainly, Madam Chair, I move that the commission vacate the order of May 7th, 2020, postponing um, horse racing at Plain Ridge um, until, um, uh, from June 1, 2020, until further notice, um, subject to the COVID-19 protocols that were passed this date by the Gaming Commission. Effective July 6th, 2020. Right, effective July 6th. Yes, I second that. Any further questions or comments on that? Okay, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Oh, you're mute, Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, sorry. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 5 0. Uh, and now we'll move again for our, our, our motion with respect to our gaming establishments. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission vacate the order um, of May 14th. 2020, in which uh, the commission unanimously voted um, lost the language, to temporarily suspend the operations at the state's three gaming facilities, um, subject to the protocols enacted uh, previously by this commission for the COVID-19 protocols and effective July 6, 2020. Second. Any further comments or questions on that? All right. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. No Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes, 5 0. 
Well, it's a good thing this meeting lasted this late. We might have had to have a weekend uh, <laughs> meeting, so that worked out well. Now, if we could just go back to Commissioner's update. Um, anything further? Thank you so much, Commissioner O'Brien. Anything further? So I just have um, a, a, a couple of, of items. First, just a, again, a reminder for anyone who didn't hear earlier that I you know the governor has uh, delegated the responsibility for the standards to the Gaming Commission. Thank you to the good work and the thorough work of this team <clears throat> for casino, racing, and simulcasting. Um, <clears throat> That means that our licensees may open with confidence that they need to only comply with our standards. There will be no further industry specific standards coming from the governor's office. And I believe that, that if it hasn't been posted, it is going to be posted today publicly. I believe the governor may have already done so. So we um, are very appreciative of all the work the team did. And I suspect that our colleagues out of the governor's office and public department of public health appreciate the thoroughness of the guidelines that this this team put together and all the work of my fellow commissioners so thank you um second thing i wanted to know it's late in the day i'm sure the media folks are long um, gone if they were joining us today at all but we do have a member of the team who is um here um, now that Elaine Driscoll has left to uh, pursue her degree at Harvard, as announced last week, we have our new colleague, um, Sarah Magazine. She's already been working away. There was a two week overlap, as you know, and today is now her fourth day with working directly um, and solely with um, Austin. She is, of course, already recognizes how fortunate she is to have Austin as her colleague and we appreciate all the work of that new team. I want to just mention that Sarah Magazine comes with an incredible amount of, of um, experience. We're very fortunate that it worked out that she could take this position in an interim status. Most recently, for 13 years, she was, uh, she was with um, Mentor Network, uh, a very uh, large um, uh, private organization and her most recent title was Vice President of External Affairs. After before that, she was the Director of Communication for Barbara Lee's Family Foundation. And I had the good fortune of working with Sarah when she was the Deputy Press Secretary for Governor Swift. Um, a lot has happened since that role. Um, you all have gotten a little older and she has had a couple of children and it's very exciting to have her be part of this team. We welcome her, and I know uh, many of you have already had the chance to meet her virtually, and uh, I appreciate um, uh, the um, everyone continuing to do that despite the fact that we have to do this from our homes. And of course, the media will um, know that they can reach uh, Sarah at, and Austin. Um, the, all the contact information is on the media page of our website. So welcome aboard, Sarah. And then uh, finally, today is a big day, and I want my fellow commissioners to comment too. Um, if, um, you know, horse racing is going to start on Monday, and that means there's going to be a lot of people who we are now fully regulating in this context of COVID 19. <clears throat> it is a huge responsibility and <clears throat> an enormous risk. And then the uh, three casinos will be opening. <clears throat> And I just ask that you know all of our employees take all the measures. Excuse me. <clears throat> take all the measures that we've really pressed on, so they stay safe. And then I really wish all the luck for our licensees to resume their business, and if their employees are able to get back to work and really accomplish the intent of the legislature when they allowed for expanded gaming. And then I hope that the patrons are able to have a really fulfilling re-engagement at the casinos. But I really am asking, and I know my fellow commissioners would chime in with me, um, 
let everybody just take full responsibility to um, abide by the guidelines that we adopted, wear their masks, be good to each other, be empathetic, be good to each other. The, uh, the security teams and the staff there will be helpful. And we just ask that you exercise the empathy that we need so badly to make sure that this is successful and safe. So um, I wish Alex well as uh, she starts off on, on Monday and the entire team. And I wish uh, the racers, the drivers well, and uh, everybody at the um, qualifying races to be safe and the horses too. My fellow commissioners, excuse me, would you like to chime in? Yeah, I, I, I will. I think that's, uh, that's well put, um, Chair. I, I think uh, this has been one of the most unusual periods in my life, let alone <laughs> the life at, um, at the Gaming Commission regulating this. Um, but I think it's, it's good, it's incumbent to look back at the arc of all of these, uh, and that is one of recognizing an important milestone in moving forward with a lot of care and a lot of um, deliberation, which I believe we have done uh, with the help of everybody and with the help of the public. Um, you know, we will continue in that, in that direction. I think there's a real consensus um, in states like Massachusetts that uh, taking the most basic of, uh, of precautions and overlaying them um, can allow us to return to what, what is feeling a little bit like normal, even if it's not really normal, um, and continue to do our jobs and try to meet all the other obligations and goals of the, of the Gaming Act. Uh, I know that everybody's very thoughtful that uh, uh, who we deal with, not just our employees, but the licensees, and we'll continue to have uh, the conversations because we have the systems in place in terms of uh, the ability to conduct these meetings, the staff to carry on the work. Uh, that and I'm confident that we will do it with care and, and be successful in doing that. So. The only other thing that I would say is welcome to Sarah and a happy fourth to everybody. Commissioner Cameron. Yep, uh, happy fourth as well. Sarah, look forward to working with you. Good points, uh, Commissioner Zuniga. And, and please stay safe. I agree, the chair made a good point there. Please stay safe. And if there's anything we can do to um, ease those uh, reopening, um, the anticipation, the you know, whatever whatever emotions come with that, we have a lot of faith in all of you, very thoughtful plans. And um, if they're followed, we're all hoping for a, um, for a successful opening. So good luck, everybody. Commissioner O'Brien? Hi, yeah, sorry, I've got a little ginger background noise right now. Um, I, I do, I, I want to echo what has been said, particularly about the work that went into uh, the standards and the protocols that we put in place for horse racing for the gaming floors. I think that the expertise on our staff was incredible um, and we relied on it heavily. We relied on the expertise of the governor's office and the reopening board in terms of looking at their broader guidance. Um, I am cautiously optimistic in terms of moving into something even more close to normal, even though it's not, um, but it I have every confidence in the licensees and our employees that they will do exactly what they want and then and more to make sure that this is as safe as it can be as a reopening. But it is not without risk and there is a huge part of it that is contingent on the patron compliance and mutual empathy and respect and compliance. And I um, hope that everyone does keep that in mind in terms of attending uh, and enjoying themselves at the casinos. Um, we will of course be ever vigilant if there is a need for us to come back and amend but i think that this body the people that work here and the licensees have done a tremendous amount of work to um, put us in a position when the governor's made the decision that it's safe to enter this phase that we're in the best position we can be in and i wish everyone a good long fourth of july weekend commissioner stevens um not much more to add, but a big thanks to our team and to my colleagues. Um, this has uh, certainly been a unique experience, as Commissioner Zuniga pointed out, and one we don't want to go through again. But um, a special thanks to our MGC team. And, you know, I would say we've had a great deal of 
cooperation and collaboration with our licensees. And we can't thank them enough. We know the, the work they have ahead of them. Um, as Commissioner O'Brien just touched on, this isn't going to lead to a safe reopening uh, if we don't have the collaboration and cooperation of the patrons as well. Um, all three of us need to be cooperating, abiding by guidelines, enjoying the experience, but um, now we need their collaboration to make this reopening safe and successful. I think we did our work. Um, and when I say our, I'm looking at all the, the names of the team, the standards are um, that have been adopted by this body are <clears throat> as strong as guidance that can be given in this very difficult circumstance. And uh, I just wish Monday uh, that all goes smoothly and then the, the following um, reopenings will we'll, um, we'll stay tuned. Karen, uh, I believe we have a agenda setting meeting then on next week, correct? Correct. Correct, and Marianne has already sent the notes around for that. That's right. So we'll be looking uh, forward to seeing how each we'll have some time to watch the uh, reopenings and and monitor um, uh, progress. As I pointed out, the guidelines. You know, we are really hopeful that the public health conditions and the the virus uh, metrics trend in the right direction, and that when we revisit these conditions, we're revisiting to give some leniency and as opposed to having to in any way reverse so let's let's cross our fingers knock on wood <clears throat> and again thank everyone the licensees um, all of our employees and of course the patrons for their full cooperation and with that um i guess i probably need a motion i move to adjourn thank you commissioner second thank you commissioner any further comments or questions? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner um, uh, O'Brien. Aye. You shifted, you know, um, and that's why I'm struggling with you. Uh, oh. Commissioner Zunaga, yeah, in my spot. Commissioner Zunaga. Aye, thank you, everybody. And Commissioner Stevens. Happy 4th of July, everybody, and aye. And I say the same. Enjoy the long weekend to all my fellow employees and um, Let's all uh, reflect on what the 4th of July means. So happy 4th. I vote yes. Thank you. Five zero.